100th Day Worries by Marjorie Kyler, illustrated by Arthur Howard. Jessica was a worrier. She worried about everything. She worried about losing her first tooth and remembering her lunch money and missing the school bus and getting her math right. But on the 95th day of first grade, Jessica's teacher gave her something new to worry about. Next Friday will be the 100th day of school, Mr. Martin said. So I want each of you to bring in a collection of 100 things. They can be anything you want, but they should be small, like rubber bands or marbles. We'll display our collections out in the hall. Immediately, Jessica began to worry. Oh no, she groaned to herself. What will I bring? All weekend long, Jessica thought and thought, but each new idea brought new worries with it. 100 ice cubes, too melty. 100 marshmallows, too sticky. 100 toothpicks, too pointy. That Sunday night at dinner, Jessica asked her family for ideas. How about 100 yo-yos, suggested Tom. That's dumb, said Jessica. Where would I get 100 yo-yos? Maybe 100 lipsticks would work, said Laura. Jessica rolled her eyes. Laura might have that many tubes of lipstick, but Jessica sure didn't. We know you'll think of something, said Mom and Dad. You have until Friday. On Monday, the 96th day of school, Jessica watched as Bobby gave Mr. Martin five bags of peanuts. There are 20 peanuts in each bag, Bobby explained. Great, said Mr. Martin. Why didn't I think of peanuts, Jessica wondered. On the 97th day of school, Jessica watched as Sharon piled paper clips into 10 neat stacks on Mr. Martin's desk. 100 paper clips in all, Sharon announced. Wonderful, said Mr. Martin. How did she find so many, wondered Jessica. On the 98th day of school, Jessica watched as Ashley brought in 100 peppermints. I ate a few, she admitted, so I really only have 95. She promised to bring in five more peppermints the next day. Fantastic, said Mr. Martin. Jessica's stomach felt queasy. By the time Jessica went to bed on the 99th day of school, she still hadn't thought of anything to bring. On Friday morning, she sat at the breakfast table and stared at her cereal. Jessica, asked mom, what's wrong? Today is the last day to bring in 100 things for the 100th day of school, and I still haven't thought of the right thing, she said. I've only come up with stuff that's too melty or too sticky or too pointy. I'll be the only kid without anything to show, and everyone will make fun of me. Jessica began to cry. Don't worry, said Dad. I have an idea. He pulled open one of the kitchen drawers. Here are some ribbons, he said, giving Jessica a handful of scraps. Jessica counted. Three red, two green, two yellow, two purple, and one striped. Mom ran down to the cellar and brought back a jar. Here are some screws, she said, dumping a pile on the table. Jessica counted. Four big, four small, one giant, and one tiny. 
Here are some rocket-shaped erasers from my collection, said Tom. Four pink, three green, two white, and one yellow. Here are some beads from my necklace that I broke, said Laura. Three round, four oval, two square, and one shaped like a smiling cat. I'll get some buttons from my shirt drawer, said Dad. He found five black, three brown, and two white. Here's some loose change from my purse, said Mom. Ten pennies and ten nickels. Here are ten barrettes. I don't need any more, said Laura. Here are some rocks from Iggy's Aquarium, said Tom. Six brown, three green, and one sparkly. How much stuff do we have so far? asked Mom. Jessica looked at the stuff on the table. It wasn't 100 of anything, but at least she had something to show. Something was better than nothing. There's the bus, said Mom. Here's a bag for your things. Don't forget your lunch. Jessica shoved everything into the bag and ran to catch the bus. All morning, Jessica thought about the stuff in the bag. She tried to remember the things her family had given her. Ten ribbons, ten screws, ten erasers, ten beads, ten buttons, ten pennies, ten nickels, ten barrettes, ten rocks. That came to ninety. She needed ten more. Where could she get ten more things? Oh, no. Here came her worries again. At lunch, Jessica found a note in her lunchbox. Sweetie, we'll help you find more stuff this weekend. I'm sure Mr. Martin will understand if your collection is late. Don't worry, love, mom. X, 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 X. Suddenly, Jessica had a great idea. She smiled to herself as she waited for lunch to be over. After story hour, Mr. Martin said it was time to put their 100 things out in the hall. What did you bring, Jessica? He asked. Here are 10 ribbons from my dad, she said. 10? asked Mr. Martin. And ten screws from my mom, said Jessica. The other kids came over to look. And ten erasers from my brother, and ten beads from my sister, said Jessica. Pretty, said Anita. And here are ten buttons from my father, and ten pennies, and ten nickels from my mother, and ten barrettes from my sister, and ten rocks from my brother's iguana's aquarium, said Jessica. Cool, said Leslie. And what's this? asked Mr. Martin. It's ten kisses from my mom, said Jessica. See? I brought in one hundred things my family gave me, said Jessica. Is that okay? Wow, said Mr. Martin. I've seen a lot of great collections for the 100th day of school, but this one, Jessica swallowed. This one is really special, said Mr. Martin. You've brought in 100 bits of love. I took my ball by Mo Willems. A big guy took my ball. Gerald. I found a big ball and it was so fun.
And then a big guy came and 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 he took my ball. I am so upset. That is not good. That is not right. Big guys have all the fun. What about the little guys? What makes those big guys think they are so big? Their size? Well, I am big too. I will get your big ball from that big guy. My hero. Here I go. Let's see how big this big guy is. Did you get my ball back? That is a big guy. You did not say how big he was. He is very big. He is bigger than I am. Much bigger. I am smaller than he is. Much smaller. He is so biggy, big, big. Gerald, you did not get my big ball back, did you? Mm, I did not. Excuse me. Thank you for finding my little ball. That is your ball? And you think it is little? Well, I am big. So big that no one will play with me. Little guys have all the fun. Um, big guy? Would you like to play whale ball with us? What is whale ball? We do not know. We have not made it up yet. With a little help. We can all have big fun. The Buddy Bench, written by Patty Brozo, illustrated by Mike Dees. Class dismissed, called Miss Mellon when the recess bell rang. Her students ran out, one loud, happy gang. They didn't waste time. Recess was too short. They started right in with their games and their sport. Some boys climbed a mound, playing king of the hill. But though he stood near, not one noticed Will. Molly said to Brianne, let's play follow the leader. They walked right by Emma, but just didn't see her. As Cooper watched hide and seek from a tree, he thought to himself, why does no one seek me? Three kids played soldier with a make-believe fort as Sloan looked on from the basketball court. 
Seven kids were clowns and they acted quite silly. They paraded right past, but no one saw Lily. Jerome watched four kids playing blind man's bluff. Why can't they see me? Aren't I big enough? Three boys played with kites that flew high in the air while Gabe sat and wondered, doesn't anyone care? Then one dancing kite dropped out of the sky and when Jake went to find it, Gabe held it up high. Want to join us? Jake asked before recess is done. How come you're just watching? That can't be much fun. It's my leg, said Gabe. I can't run in a cast, so I never get picked, not even last. Come play with us anyway. There's time to spare. Wait a minute, said Gabe. I'll be right there. Gabe hobbled to Will and tap-tapped his shoulder. Come and join us, he said, before recess is over. I'm new here, said Will, and today's my first day. No one but you has asked me to play. Well, help us keep this kite in the air. Okay, said Will, I'll be right there. Then Will went to Emma and Emma to Sloan, each asking the next why she was alone. There are holes in my pants and my shoes. Emma said, I don't fit in, and her face turned bright red. It's hard, said Sloan, to know what to say. I'm too scared to ask, but I do want to play. Come join us, said Will. There's no time to spare. Wait, said the girls. We'll be right there. They ran over to Cooper and said, what about you? We're gonna have fun. Can't you play too? When I to talk, explained Cooper, my words get to tangled. What I want to say ends up all mangled. So what? Come and play, the two girls said. I'll come in a minute. You go on ahead. Then Cooper asked Lily, and Lily asked Jerome, how come each of them was alone? Lily told Cooper, it's always the same. I'm used to just watching. I'm no good at games. When you're small, said Jerome, and the game is all tied, nobody wants you to be on their side. Come and p play, Cooper said. D don't hang back and wait. Let's make some new friends. It's n never too late. But recess was over. The bell rang once more and Miss Mellon's students ran for the door. Miss Mellon, Will asked, how could we say without using words that we all want to play. Sometimes we're too shy, too sad, or too proud. How can we ask without asking out loud? Miss Mellon said, what you need is a seat to wait for a friend or a buddy to meet. A buddy bench, Miss Mellon's class all agreed, and we'll m make it ourselves. Cooper decreed. So they borrowed a hammer, a saw, and a wrench and started to work on their own special bench. When it was finished, they were all filled with pride. Each child wore a smile that was nine inches wide. We think it's just perfect, the students all said with hands that are colored blue, yellow, and red. They put their new bench in the very best place, under the climbing tree, right at its base.
Now everyone knows when they're feeling left out where to find friends without any doubt. And the words on the bench that they made on their own say buddy bench equals nobody alone. A Little Spot of Sadness, a story about empathy and compassion, written and illustrated by Diane Alber. Hi, I'm a peaceful spot, and this blue spot is a sadness spot. What is a sadness spot? It looks like it needs a hug. A sadness spot can show up when someone is feeling upset, disappointed, or if they experience loss. Sadness is one of the many emotions we can experience every day. Other emotions are anxiety and anger too. We all have these emotions inside of us, but we feel the best when we are able to calm them down into a peaceful spot. Sadness, anger, anxiety. You will see both small and large spots of sadness. Having your sadness spot around is okay, but when it stays too long or becomes too big, it doesn't make you feel very good. That's why I'm here to show you how to recognize when someone's sad spot shows up and how to help them find a peaceful spot. I'll also show you how to manage your own sadness spot too. A sadness spot is unique because it is one of the few emotions that other people can help you with. That's why I want to show you how to spot it. Crying is one of the ways a sadness spot releases energy, which can help you feel better. It can also show you when a person is feeling down, so you can go and help them find their peaceful spot. It's also important to know that a sadness spot may be there even if someone is not crying, you can look at their body language too. If you see someone frowning or moping, their sadness spot is definitely nearby. This person could use a friend. Loneliness can cause your sadness spot to get bigger too. If you see someone who could use a friend, Ask them if they are okay and be there to listen. If you have experienced what they are going through, let them know they are not alone and you are there for them. You are calming their sadness spot with empathy. It can be common to see an anxiety spot with a sadness spot. When a new kid arrives to class, they may be worried and sad at the same time. You can help them feel more welcome by saying hello and introducing them to your friends. You are calming their sadness spot with compassion. I miss my friends. What if I don't fit in? Hello, you can hang out with me. A sadness spot can be a little sneaky, like when it shows up before you decide how to react to the problem. Sometimes it takes the help of others to see it's only a tiny problem that can easily be fixed. You are calming their sadness spot with teamwork. I lost my unicorn. I can help you find it. 
Is this it? You might also see a sadness spot appear when someone has lost a pet, friend, or family member. Being there to give them a hug and talk about the happy times they shared with that person or pet can help them feel the love that will always be in their heart. You are calming their sadness spot with love. Sometimes you might see a sadness spot show up when someone misses a loved one who is far away. Having a friend to have fun with can really help. You are calming their sadness spot with friendship. This is fun. Why don't you try? There are ways to calm your own sadness spot too. Some days you just feel sad and you aren't really sure why. When you feel like being alone or no one is there to comfort you, music, drawing, and writing can help relax your mind. You are calming your sadness spot with creativity. If your sadness spot won't go away, I have a trick you can try. Look at your hand. Now imagine one blue spot and one green spot on your palm, just like this. Repeat after me. Circle the spots in the middle of your palm. Count the swirls down to calm. Around and around and around twice more. One, then two, then three, then four. Each time you trace around the spots, take a deep breath to calm your thoughts. I'm so glad to see that you have learned how to calm down sadness spots. Always remember our little trick. Circle the spots in the middle of your palm. Count the swirls down to calm. Around and around and around twice more. One, then two, then three, then four. Each time you trace around the spots, take a deep breath to calm your thoughts. You can imagine your own spots or cut them out of construction paper and place them on your palm. You can also get real spot stickers in bulk on Diane Albers website www.dianealber.com A Little Thankful Spot, written and illustrated by Diane Alber. Hi, my name is Spot, and I'm not just any ordinary spot, I'm a little thankful spot. Did you know that writing down all the things you are thankful for can actually make you happier? We have been making this thankful list for a while now. Wow, that is a long list. When you are thankful, you are happy with what you have and experience. You don't compare yourself to others. When you write down all that you are thankful for, it helps you focus on the positive things in your life. I'm going to share my list and maybe it will inspire you to create your own list. So here it goes. I am thankful for playing in the park and sliding down the slide, nature and the cool shade of a tree. 
I am thankful for cozy slippers, hats to keep my head warm, sandals to keep my feet cool, rain boots so I can splash in puddles, umbrellas so I can enjoy the rain without getting wet, snowmen in winter, flowers in spring. I am thankful for the nice warm sun, yummy ice pops and ice cream, the refreshing pool on a hot summer day. I am thankful for being able to show sadness so people know when to help, having confidence to try new things, feeling anger so I can become passionate about a cause or stand up for what's right, feeling anxiety to warn me if I am about to do something dangerous. I am thankful for being able to love, being able to find my peaceful spot, beautiful rainbows, the earth, planets, the moon, and stars. I am thankful for my amazing friends, parties to celebrate something special, delicious cake, colorful balloons, my big happy family. I'm a little respectful spot. I'm a little spot of kindness. I'm a little spot of responsibility. I'm a little spot of courage. I'm a little spot of patience. I'm a little spot of honesty. I am thankful for schools for providing a place to learn, play, and have fun teachers who show kids they can learn anything, community helpers who keep us safe and well. I am thankful for libraries for providing a quiet place to read, books to give people a chance to go on an adventure in their mind, school supplies, reading, because it's great to hear stories. I am thankful for paper airplanes because I want to see how far they can fly. Music, because I enjoy playing and listening to it. My pet fish, Tommy. Dressing up, because it's fun to pretend. Courage, to stand up and perform on stage. I am thankful for time and the ability to be patient, a cardboard box, and all the creative things I can do with it, clean water, lights so I can see when it's dark. I am thankful for crayons to scribble, paint to splatter, art and the ability to create. Scribble stones because they spread happiness when you paint them. Rocks because it's fun to stack them in a pile. I am thankful for toothbrushes so my teeth can get cleaned. Nutritious food, paper to make thankful lists, tissues to help my nose when it has sniffles, signs to help us stay safe, sleep. Phew, are you inspired yet? Now it's your turn. What are you thankful for? Do you think you can write something you are thankful for every day and make a bigger list than me? I created this list of questions to help you too. I can't wait to see your thankful list. What are you thankful for that is red? What are you thankful for that makes you smile? What are you thankful for that is soft? What are you thankful for that is very big? 
What are you thankful for that is very small? What person are you thankful for? What animal are you thankful for? What toy are you thankful for? What do you think dogs are thankful for? What book are you thankful for? This thankful worksheet is free for download at www.dianealber.com so children can be inspired to write what they are thankful for. A Tiger Tale, or What Happened to Anya at Her First Day of School, by Mike Bolt. Anya woke one day, only to discover that overnight she had grown a tiger tail. Yes, a tiger tail, not like a ponytail or pigtails, a tiger tail. A tiger tail was a disaster. She absolutely could not be seen. Unfortunately, that wasn't an option as it was Anya's first day of school. Are girls with tiger tails even allowed to go to school? What would the other kids say? Her mom said, It goes so nicely with your hair. It brings out your fun, wild side. That may be, Anya thought, but this was a problem on her backside. Her dad said, I remember feeling the same way when I got glasses. Don't fret. You're exactly the same wonderful Anya you've always been. He obviously needed new glasses. She would have to take care of this herself. She tugged. She pulled. She squished. She stopped. The tail was firmly attached. Maybe she could hide it. Anya tried on all the clothes in her closet. At the same time, it would have worked if she didn't have to tinkle. Anya started to panic. Calm down, said her mom. You'll make yourself sick. That was a good idea. You are so funny, Anya. The kids are going to love your sense of humor. Now hurry or you'll miss the bus. That was another good idea. What a special treat said her dad. Now I get to drive you to school on your first day. Anya realized there was only one choice for a girl with a tiger tail. She would have to run away and join the circus. Would it be so bad? Popcorn for dinner, swinging on the trapeze, feeding peanuts to the elephants. Too late. Anya was doomed. Crash! Hi, my name is Ben. I'm Anya. Come on, Anya. We don't want to be late on the first day. Maybe a tiger tail wasn't so bad. After all, it did go well with her hair. A 
Very Big Fall by Emmy Kastner. All the leaves had ever known was the sway and stretch and green of the trees. Then one day, the wind blew colder. And the leaves knew something different was in the air. I'm loving these crisp breezes, Birch said. Is this what flying feels like? Everything is perfect and I don't want anything to change, said Oak. No fair, said Maple. Those trees have apples. I want apples. This is just the beginning, you know, a squirrel chirped. Birch was curious. The beginning of what? Fall, said another squirrel. Fall? The leaves agreed that was a silly name for colder weather. It happens every year, the first squirrel explained. You'll start changing colors soon and then... We change colors, Birch said, ready for adventure. But green is a very nice color to be, said Oak. Oh, squirrels think they know everything, Maple rolled her eyes. Although the squirrels had been right about rain and cats and tree houses, maybe they were right about this too. Turned out, Oak loved being yellow, and Birch was quite impressed with her bold new hue. But change wasn't quick for everyone. Maple thought Birch looked nice in orange, but was jealous of Oak's yellow, her favorite color. She was certain that at any moment, she too would turn a sunny shade of... Nope, still green. She had to keep waiting her turn. Amidst the changes, the leaves were still leaves. They couldn't help but listen to conversations below. Ooh, squealed Birch. Look, pie! What's pie? Oak asked. I don't know, but I want some, Maple sighed. You'll be able to hear better once you're on the ground, said one of the squirrels. The ground? The treetops erupted. What? How fast will I go? We fall? Um, that's too far down. What about the trees? Down there? I'm nervous and excited. No, thank you. Will it hurt? What if a friend isn't ready to fall? Can I go first? The wind blew harder yet, and then it started to happen. For Birch, it was a joyous leap through the windy sky. Oak had more of a hesitant trip downward. Am I close? Not really. Keep going, said Birch. Maple was still high in the branches, alone. She was not yellow. She was not falling. Impatient to join her friends, Maple yanked and pulled. I'm not sure I'd be in such a rush to get down there, said one of the squirrels. There are bottoms of boots and gutters. Oh, and dogs and rivers and rakes. Maple stopped tugging. But it was too late. Down, down, down she went. Somehow the world seemed bigger on the ground. Maple was telling her friends about the boots and the rakes when there was a sudden gust 
then a whoosh. And the leaves were swept into a topsy-turvy swirl. Is that a gutter? Maple shouted. That must be a rake, said Oak. Do I smell pie? said Birch. That's when they heard a whisper. There you are and met a someone. She held Oak, Birch, and Maple close to her chest because that's when you do with very special things. The girl listened closely. See that? I'm a pirate, said Birch. Can you draw me bravely carrying ten leaves down the tree? Oak asked. You know, I always knew I'd be red, said Maple. And fall was new all over again. Go, Abuela and Me by Meg Medina, illustrated by Angela Dominguez. She comes to us in winter, leaving behind her sunny house that rested between two snaking rivers. Her old place was too much for just one, Mommy tells me, as we make room in my dresser for her clothes and too far away for us to help, Poppy adds. Abuela belongs with us now, Mia, but I still feel shy when I meet this far away grandmother. Ping pong poon. Poppy unfolds Abuela's bed and slides it right next to mine. You will get to know each other, he says, but when I show Abuela my new book, she can't unlock the English words. We can only look at the pictures and watch Edmund race on his wheel. Then, just before we turn out the light, she pulls out two things tucked inside the satin pocket of her suitcase. A feather, una pluma, from a wild parrot that roosted in her mango trees and a snapshot, uno fotografia, of a young man with Poppy's smile. To abuelo, she says, climbing into bed. Snuggled in my pajamas, I smell flowers in her hair, sugar and cinnamon baked into her skin. That night, I dream of a red bird circling in the sky. The rest of the winter, while Mommy and Poppy are at work, Abuela waits for me to get home from school. Then we bundle up in thick socks and handmade sweaters to walk to the park and toss bread to the sparrows. My Espanol is not good enough to tell her the things an Abuela should know, like how I am the very best in art and how I can run as fast as the boys. And her English is too poquito to tell me all the stories I want to know about Abuelo and the rivers that run right outside their door. With our mouths as empty as our bread baskets, we walk back home and watch TV. Abuela and I can't understand each other, I whisper to Mommy. Things will get better, Mommy says. Remember how it was with Kim? Kim is my best friend at school. When she was new, our whole class helped teach her English words. Now, Miss Wilson sometimes has to say, please be quiet, girls, 
Others are working. After school the next day, while Abuela and I are making meat pies for our snack, I pretend I am Miss Wilson. Dough, I say, pointing to the ball. Abuela says, dough, masa, and rolls it flat. Masa, I say. She drops a spoonful of meat in place. Carne, carne, I say, meat. Pasas, raisins, aceite, oil. Then I remember the word cards we taped in our classroom to help Kim. So while Abuela fries our empanadas, I put up word cards too, until everything is covered, even Edmund. Soon we are playing Oye E D, hear and say, all around the house. But that night, she still calls my pillow a palo, and she says Edmund is a gangster. We'll keep practicing, I whisper. But the next day, I cannot practice with Abuela after all. Edmund has run out of his favorite seeds. So Mommy and I have to ride the bus downtown to buy more. Sometimes there are kittens sleeping in the pet shop window. But when we arrive this time, something even better is behind the glass. Look! I say, the window has become a jungle filled with birds. And right in the middle is a parrot staring at us with black bean eyes. I press my nose to the glass, thinking of the red feather Abuela gave me. Let's buy him, I tell Mommy. But Mia, you already have Edmund, Mommy says. Oh, not for me, I say, for Abuela, like the parrot that lived in her mango trees. He can keep her company when I'm at school. When we bring him home to Abuela, she says, Un loro, a parrot. We name him Mango because his wings are green, orange, and gold like the fruit. During the day, Abuela teaches him how to give beaky kisses and to bob his head when she sings Los Politos to him. Buenos tardes, Mango, Abuela says, opening his cage door when I get home from school. Good afternoon, I say, and give him a seed. Soon, Mango calls to me, even before we open his cage. Buenas tardes, he says when I open the door. Good afternoon. Abuela, Mango, and I practice new words every day. Mi Espanol gets faster, and Abuela and Mango learn the days of the week, all the months of the year, and the names of coins. How did he learn all that? Poppy asks when we show him all that Mango can do. Abuela winks at me and gives Mango a piece of banana, peel and all. Practice, she says. Before long, Abuela asks me how to say harder things too so she can talk with the neighbors who stop by. Has the mailman come? It is chilly today. Can I get you some cookies and lemonade? Soon, when friends stop by to see Mango's latest tricks, they can understand everything Abuela says. But best of all, now, when Abuela and I are lying next to each other in our beds, our mouths are full of things to say. I tell her about my buen dia 
and show her my best pintura of mango. Abuela reads my favorite book with only a little help, and she tells me new stories about Abuelo, who could dive for river stones with a single breath, and weave a roof out of palms. I draw pictures for her. She still misses their old house, she says, but now only a little bit. Mango listens to us from his perch until my eyes grow heavy. Hasta mañana, abuela, I say. Abuela kisses me. Good night, Mia. Hasta mañana. Good night, Mango calls. And soon we all fall asleep. And Magnolia by Laura Gill and Patricia Matola. Britta's two favorite trees, Apple and Magnolia, were best friends. Britta couldn't explain how she was so sure about the friendship or how the trees had become best friends in the first place, but deep down in her heart, she knew it was true. Britta visited the trees every day. She watched Apple give Magnolia gifts and saw Magnolia wave at Apple. Britta danced along as the two trees swayed together under the stars. Dad said nicely that he didn't think trees could be friends. Bronwyn said not as nicely that trees absolutely positively could not be friends. But Nana said unusual friendships can be the most powerful of all. Then one day, Magnolia's branches started to droop. Her bark grew patchy and gray. Her leaves turned brown instead of yellow. Dad said nicely that he didn't think Magnolia would survive the winter. Bronwyn said not as nicely that Magnolia absolutely, positively would not survive the winter. But Nana asked if Britta had a plan to help Magnolia. Britta did. She tied a string with two cups so that Apple could hear Magnolia's sighs and Magnolia could hear Apple's sweet whistling songs. And Britta wrapped a long scarf between the two trees so that they could feel each other's warmth through the cold winter months. She hung a strand of lights between Magnolia and Apple so that they could see each other, even on moonless nights. One morning, Britta looked at the limp string, the sagging scarf, and the drooping lights. Was it her imagination? Or were the two trees closer together than they had been before? Britta measured the distance between Magnolia and Apple. Each morning, she measured again. Dad said nicely that he didn't think the trees were growing toward each other. Bronwyn said not as nicely that the trees absolutely positively were not growing toward each other. But Nana helped Britta make a chart. 
the measurements were definitely getting smaller. And deep down in her heart, Britta felt a seed of hope start to grow. In the spring, Apple's small pink flowers arrived right on time. Magnolia's didn't. But every day, Britta's measurements grew smaller and smaller, and her hope grew stronger and stronger. When Magnolia's first blossom appeared, Britta's hopes blossomed too. And when hundreds of pink magnolia flowers burst into bloom at last, Britta made pink necklaces for both trees to celebrate. Dad said nicely that he didn't think Apple had helped Magnolia survive the winter. Bronwyn said not as nicely that Apple absolutely positively had not helped Magnolia survive the winter. But Nana said, unusual friendships can be the most powerful of all. And deep down in her heart, Britta knew it was true. Picking Time by Michelle Benoit Slauson, illustrated by Deborah Cogan Ray. Sometime after the summer is spent, but before the jack-o'-lanterns are lit, it's apple picking time. All over the valley, up and down the hillsides, the branches are heavy with red apples. Tomorrow we will go to work. When it's apple picking time, everyone has to help. The whole town knows we have only three weeks to get the fruit off the trees before it spoils. Papa takes time off from the market. Mama leaves the housework. And I don't have to go to school. Even the sisters from the convent help at harvest time. When you go apple picking, you have to get up before the sun. The moon is still high in the sky, and the rooster hasn't crowed yet. The birds are asleep. Everything is asleep, except Mama, Papa, and me, and all the other apple pickers. We meet outside the town in cars and pickups. Papa finds a place behind Grandma and Grandpa's truck. Then our families follow the narrow dirt road to the orchards. We travel past fallen corn stalks, fields of hay, and mailboxes with their flags up. If we hit a bump, the lights bounce from the road and we are in darkness again. Mama and Papa talk in low voices and I draw faces on the frosted window. We climb up the hillside and into the apples. We don't stop until we see the sign, Pickers Wanted. All of us kids jump out of the cars and pickups at once. The Hoffman twins are the first to swing from the low branches and we play hide and seek in the empty bins. It's easy to find each other because breath clouds tell your hiding place. Dave is our foreman and he arrives in a big truck that doesn't have a door. He hands each of us a purple ticket. Then Papa lifts up the lunch chest and we head down to our trees. Grandma and Grandpa are on the same row. I'm going to pick a whole bin, I say. That's a lot of apples, Papa answers. I'm bigger this year. No doubt about that, he says. 
While Papa sets up the ladders, Mama fastens the canvas bag around my back. It's not as heavy as last year, I say. There are no apples in it, Mama replies. But it's not loose either. No, it's not. I don't need to go over as many loops. You've grown. Even before Papa turns his radio on, I'm up the ladder. Twist, snap, twist, snap. The apples fall in the bag and rub against my stomach. I remember to lean into the ladder for balance so both hands are free for picking. That's what Grandpa taught me. We work fast in the morning because after lunch we will be hot and tired. Now we wear woolen shirts and gloves with fingers cut out. Mama says when you go apple picking, you need to keep your hands warm, but have a good grip. That's what Grandma taught her. Every few minutes, someone yells, fall. We hear Dave's tractor in the distance. First, he stops for Sister Dolores, then Grandpa. Papa is next. Dave must have known Papa's bin was ready because he drives over while Papa is still up on the ladder. Before he takes the apples away, he punches a half moon on Papa's ticket. The tractor comes again and again, again and again. By lunchtime, Mama has two and Papa has three half moons on their tickets. Mine has none. I help Papa spread out a worn quilt under a tree and we make cushions with our heavy shirts. Mama unpacks the food and pours coffee for everyone but me. I have hot chocolate. Grandma always says that food tastes better when you eat outdoors. I think so too. Later, Papa fiddles with the radio buttons and the music changes. Ready, he asks. Mama takes Papa's hands and he brings her to him, almost in a hug but more graceful. Then he twirls her around under the branches. Mama can spin good even in tennis shoes. Round and round they go. When the music gets soft, Mama loosens her red scarf and brown curls fall down her back. Without stopping, they reach for me and we are three dancing. The music quickens and Papa carries me so I won't miss steps. We whirl faster and faster in a circle. As we spin, the trees do too, and I'm sure they must be dizzy from watching us. The music slows and Papa sways back and forth, with one arm around Mama and the other around me. I want the radio to play forever and our friends to keep clapping, but the work whistle blows and Grandpa calls to us. Even before Papa can turn the music low, I'm up the ladder. Twist, snap, twist, snap. That bin is almost full. We pick all afternoon and still the tractor doesn't come for me. Now the harness straps dig into my shoulders and the sun is too bright. Papa tries to move the ladder as the sun moves but the sun always tricks him. Only the little kids napping under the trees have shade. Near quitting time, our row starts to empty. First, Grandma and Grandpa pack up. Our friends follow soon after. When they go, their radios do too. And except for Dave's tractor in the distance, the orchard is suddenly silent. In the quiet, a girl's voice calls out, full, and her echo answers right back, Mama, Papa, it's mine. But they are both already beside me. Congratulations, hooray for Anna. Mighty fine job, says Dave, as he punches a half moon on my ticket. I guess you'll know what to do with this, he laughs. I don't take off my canvas bag 
and I don't wait for Mama and Papa. I run all the way to the orchard office to cash my ticket in. When Grandpa sees me, I get a big hug, and all the other kids want to see the ticket too. Soon, Mama and Papa join us, and everyone loads up their cars and pickups and says goodbye. Then the procession moves slowly down the hillside away from the apples. We travel past fallen corn stalks, fields of hay, and mailboxes with their flags down. And if we hit a bump, no one mentions it. Mama and Papa talk in low voices, and I dream about apples and dancing and two half moons on a purple ticket. by Gail Gibbons. An apple is a fruit. It grows on an apple tree. Apple trees grow in more parts of the world than any other fruit tree. They have been in existence for about two million years. The first American colonists brought apple seeds and seedlings with them from England. A seedling is a very young, small tree. As the colonists moved westward, they brought apple seeds and seedlings with them. Some settlers found that Native American Indians had already brought apple seeds west and had apple trees growing near their villages. Many times during the early 1800s, John Chapman traveled throughout the wilderness of Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Indiana planting apple seeds. Also, he gave seeds and seedlings to the settlers there. He became known as Johnny Appleseed. Some apples are grown at home but most are grown commercially. Each year, about 250 million bushels of apples are grown in the United States, and about 28 million bushels are grown in Canada. A group of apple trees is called an orchard. An apple is a firm, crisp, fleshy fruit with a hard center called a core. The core has five seed chambers. This apple is a Macintosh. Stem, skin, seed chambers called carpels, seeds, fleshy part, core. In the springtime, flowers called apple blossoms begin to bloom on the apple trees. Each blossom has to be pollinated in order for an apple to grow. The blossoms are usually pollinated by insects or by the wind. Pollination happens when a grain of pollen from a stamen lands on the stigma of another blossom. Pollen, stamen, stigma. After a while, the blossoms begin to die and apples start to grow. Throughout the warm summer, the little apples grow bigger and bigger. During the late summer, or early fall, the apples ripen. This is a golden delicious. When the trees are loaded with ripe apples, it is harvest time. 
Workers pick the apples by hand. Some are shipped to stores. Some are used to make apple juice, apple cider, apple jelly, apple sauce, and lots of other apple products. Some are sold in baskets at roadside stands. During the fall, it is fun to go apple picking. Also, there are country fairs. Awards are given to the best looking apples, the best tasting apple pies, and the most delicious applesauce. There is apple cider too. During Halloween, there are caramel apples and candy apples. Some people bob for apples. When winter arrives, the apple tree branches become bare. The trees will become dormant until the next spring when the trees will produce a new crop of apples. Dormant means alive but not actively growing. Apples have many tastes, ranging from sweet to tart. All apples are different shades of yellow, green, and red, or a mix of those colors. Some common apples grown in North America. Rome Beauty, Macintosh, Jonathan, Stamen, Red Delicious, Golden Delicious, York, Granny Smith. Which one is your favorite? Can you guess mine? If you guessed Macintosh, you are right. An apple tree will not grow apples until it is about five to eight years old. Each spring, the tree branches are trimmed. This is called pruning. Most apple trees grow to be about 20 feet or six meters tall. The soil around the trees should be fertilized. The pruning and fertilizing helps produce lots of good apples. How to plant and care for an apple tree. Step one. It is best to plant seedlings in the fall. Step two. Dig a hole that is big enough to give the seedlings roots room to grow. Step three. After placing the seedling into the hole, add topsoil. Step four. Pack down the soil to give the seedling support. Step five, water the seedling. It will need about 10 gallons of water each week during the first few months after planting. An apple a day. Make your own apple pie with the help of an adult. Step one. Place dough for the bottom crust into a pie pan and trim off the edges. Step two, peel and slice six to eight apples. Granny Smith's and Jonathan's are good to use for apple pies because they are tart and stay firm when they are baked. Remove the cores, put the slices into the pie pan. Step three, mix one half cup brown sugar, one quarter teaspoon salt, half a teaspoon cinnamon, and one quarter teaspoon nutmeg. Sprinkle mixture over the apples. Step four, put a layer of dough on top. Pinch down the edges and remove any extra dough. Poke little holes in the top. Step five, Bake for 50 minutes at 425 degrees Fahrenheit. They are good for you.
Here's how an apple cider press works. Step one, the apples are dropped into the hopper where they are cut up. Step two, the apple pieces drop into the tub until it is three quarters full. Step three, the press handle is turned and the apple pieces are squeezed, forcing cider through a cloth filter. Step four, apple cider flows into the tray and then runs into a container. Press screw handle, blades, hopper, tub, tray, filter. There are thousands of varieties or kinds of apples. Golden Russet, Tompkins King, Suncrisp, King David, Ozark Gold, Prairie Spy, Wagoner, Honeygold, Newtown Pippin, Molly's Delicious, Liberty, Keepsake. They are nutritious and delicious. Apples, apples, apples. The smallest apples are crab apples. They make good apple jelly. The most popular apple in the United States is the Red Delicious, which originated on a farm in Iowa about 1881. The states of Washington, New York, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and California produce the most apples in the United States. Johnny Appleseed was born in Leominster, Massachusetts, and died in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Some people say, when they like someone, you're the apple of my eye. One apple, the Arkansas black, is reddish purple and becomes nearly black by the end of the season. The apple blossom is the state flower of Arkansas and Michigan. There are over 7,500 varieties of apples grown worldwide and 2,500 varieties grown in the United States. If you store your apples in a cool and dry place, they can last for months. The Macintosh apple was introduced in 1870 in Ontario, Canada. A monument marks the site of the first tree. Also, the Canadian provinces that grow the most apples are British Columbia, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, Ontario, and Quebec. Apples for Everyone by Jill Esbaum. Seen any apples lately? Early each year, in orchards and backyards, apple trees bloom. Drawn by the sweet smell, bees buzz from blossom to blossom. As time passes, petals flutter to the grass and fuzzy bumps appear. Slowly, the baby apples grow bigger, turning all shades of red, a glowing green, a cheerful yellow. Apples might have golden speckles or snazzy stripes, be round as a ball or tall and lumpy bottomed. Limbs droop heavy with ripe fruit. Some apples thud to the ground, then rot and become food for the growing tree. 
At last, it's fall. Harvest time. And fresh apples are everywhere. Grocery stores, farmers markets, roadside stands. You might even climb a ladder to pick your own. Your teeth sink in, crunch, and tart sweet juice dribbles down your chin. People bob for apples at Halloween parties or dip them into melted caramel for a sweet gooey treat. Apples may be baked into pies and cinnamony desserts or added to a yummy Thanksgiving stuffing. Some are cooked into thick applesauce or crushed to make juice. On a chilly night, a steaming mug of tangy cider chases away goosebumps. Apple trees have been growing in America for hundreds of years since colonists brought pips or apple seeds from England. When most of America was still unsettled, a pioneer named John Chapman spent his summers hiking through the wilderness, planting apple seeds wherever he went. His nickname was Johnny Appleseed. An apple seeds lie in its core. Cut an apple crosswise and you'll see the shape of a star. Each of the star pockets has one or two seeds sleeping inside. Americans eat more apples than any other fruit. There are many flavors to choose from with names like Fuji, Gala, Granny Smith, Honeycrisp, Jonathan, Macintosh, Pink Lady, and Red Delicious. Have you found your favorite? Ah, uh, love at first bite. Abuela by Arthur Doros, illustrated by Alyssa Clevin. Abuela takes me on the bus. We go all around the city. Abuela is my grandma. She is my mother's mother. Abuela means grandma in Spanish. Abuela speaks mostly Spanish because that's what people spoke where she grew up before she came to this country. Abuela and I are always going places. Today, we're going to the park. El parque es lindo, says Abuela. I know what she means. I think the park is beautiful too. Tontos pájaros, Abuela says, as a flock of birds surrounds us. So many birds. They're picking up the bread we brought. What if they picked me up and carried me high above the park? What if I could fly? Abuela would wonder where I was, swooping like a bird. I'd call to her. Then she'd see me flying. Rosalba the bird. Rosalba el pájaro, she'd say. Ven, abuela. Come, abuela, I'd say. Si quiero volar, abuela would reply as she leaped into the sky with her skirt flapping in the wind. We would fly all over the city. Mira, Abuela would say, pointing. And I'd look as we soared over parks and streets, dogs and people. 
We'd wave to people waiting for the bus. Buenos dias, we'd say. Buenos dias, good morning, they'd call up to us. We'd fly over factories and trains and glide close to the sea. Cerca del mar, we'd say. We'd almost touch the tops of waves. Abuela's skirt would be a sail, and she could race with the sailboats. I'll bet she'd win. We'd fly to where the ships are docked and watch people unload fruits from the land where Abuela grew up. Mangoes, bananas, papayas, those are all Spanish words. So are rodeo, patio, and burro. Maybe we'd see a cousin of Abuela's hooking boxes of fruit to a crane. We saw her cousin Daniel once unloading and loading the ships. Out past the boats in the harbor, we'd see the Statue of Liberty. Me gusta, Abuela would say. Abuela really likes her. I do too. We would circle around Liberty's head and wave to the people visiting her. That would remind Abuela of when she first came to this country. Vamos al aeropuerto, she'd say. She'd take me to the airport where the plane that first brought her landed. Cuidado, Abuela would tell me. We'd have to be careful as we went for a short ride. Then we could fly to Tio Pablo's and Tia Elisa's store. Pablo is my uncle, my Tio, and Elisa is my aunt, my Tia. They'd be surprised when we flew in, but they'd offer us a cool limonada. Flying is hot work, pero quiero volar más, Abuela would say. She wants to fly more. I want to fly more, too. We could fly to Las Nubes, the clouds. One looks like a cat, un gato. One looks like a bear, un oso. One looks like a chair, una silla. Descansemos un momento, Abuela would say. She wants to rest a moment. We would rest in our chair, and Abuela would hold me in her arms with the whole sky, our house, nuestra casa. We'd be as high as airplanes, balloons, and birds, and higher than the tall buildings downtown. But we'd fly there, too, to look around. We could find the building where my father works. Hola, papa, I'd say as I waved, and Abuela would do a flip for fun as we passed by the windows. Mira, I hear Abuela say. Look, she's telling me. I do look, and we are back in the park. We are walking by the lake. Abuela probably wants to go for a boat ride. Vamos a otra aventura, she says. She wants us to go for another adventure. That's just one of the things I love about Abuela. She likes adventures. Abuela takes my hand. Vamos, she says. Let's go. Bad Apple, A Tale of Friendship by Edward Hemingway. 
Mac was a good apple. He shared his toys with other apples, helped Granny Smith pick up after art class, and loved to dive fearlessly into the watering hole. On a sunny day, Mac could bob for hours. On cloudy days, Mac would search for the perfect pillow of green grass and take a long nap. In his dreams, it was always sunny. But one day, as Mac lay sleeping, it began to rain. Soon, all the little creatures in the earth around him poked their heads out to look for higher ground. Some of them found safety under the large toadstools. Others crawled onto stones and pebbles, but one small worm had another idea. When Mac woke up, he was covered in raindrops and he wasn't alone. You won't believe the dream I just had. A funny little worm was tickling me right here. And now I can't seem to get him out of your head. It was you. And that's how Mac met Will. Will showed Mac how to fly a kite, fly himself, and play in the dirt. He loved making a mess. Mac took his new friend to the watering hole to clean off. He couldn't remember a better day. Until he took Will to the orchard. Look at Mac! He's got worms! Mac's a rotten apple. I'm not rotten. I'm quite sweet, actually. So they left. Will cheered Mac up by reading aloud from some of his favorite novels. He was a bit of a bookworm. Mac liked the adventure stories best. He also liked it when Will finished his sentences for him. The most exciting part is when the pirates find the treasure in the dirt. But the next day, it happened again. Ha ha, it's the bad apple. Ew, worms. And no one in the orchard would play with them. Not even the crab apples. Crab apples can be so mean. That night, the two friends sat alone on the grass without saying a word. In the morning, Will was nowhere to be found. You are a good apple, Will. Mac went back to playing with his orchard friends, diving fearlessly into the watering hole and painting in Granny Smith's class. But nothing was the same. There was a hole in Mac that he couldn't fill. Not a big hole, just a teeny tiny little, you know, a small hole just big enough to fit and nobody finished his sentences. Mac had to find Will. He searched low and high and in between, eek, in the dirt, around the watering hole, and just when he had given up all hope. He looked up in the sky. Mac knew he'd rather be a bad apple with Will than a sad apple without him. I was hoping I could help me turn the pages. How did you know? Because you will always be a good apple in my book. Good and happy. And there's nothing bad about that.
Backyard Animals by Annalise Beckering. Table of Contents. Meet the Bat, page four. All About Bats, page six. Bat History, page eight. Bat Shelter, page 10. Bat Features, page 12. What Do Bats Eat? Page 14, Bat Life Cycle, page 16, Encountering Bats, page 18, Myths and Legends, page 20, Frequently Asked Questions, page 22, Puzzler, Find Out More, page 23, Words to Know and Index, page 24. Meet the Bat. Bats are small flying mammals. They are the only mammals that can fly. Bats have large wings made of two layers of skin. This skin stretches over their long finger bones and arms. It connects to the sides of the body and back legs. Bats' bodies are covered in fur. They often have black or brown fur. It can also be gray, white, red, or orange. Bats are clean animals. When they are not eating or sleeping, they spend time grooming themselves. Bats live in nearly every part of the world, except for the North and South Poles. They eat mosquitoes and bugs to help keep neighborhoods insect free. Fascinating facts. The bumblebee bat is the smallest bat in the world. It weighs less than a penny. Some types of bats can fly up to 60 miles, 97 kilometers per hour. All about bats. There are almost 1,000 different species of bats throughout the world. Some bats are as big as large birds. Others are as small as mice. Bats can weigh between 0 0.07 ounces and 2.9 pounds, 2 grams and 1.3 kilograms. The smallest bat in the world is only one inch or 2.5 centimeters long. Bats are divided into two groups. Old world fruit bats live mostly in tropical areas such as Africa, India, and Australia. These bats are called megabats. Megabats mostly eat fruit and nectar. Microbats are smaller and live in many places around the world. Most microbats eat insects. Some also eat other small mammals and fish. When bats feel threatened, they show their teeth and squeak loudly. Where bats live. Vampire bat. Found in South and Central America. Little brown bat. Found throughout North America. Indian flying fox bat, found in India and other Asian countries. Mexican free-tailed bat, found in Southern United States, Mexico, Chile, Argentina, Southern Brazil, and the Greater and Lesser Antilles. Bat history. Bats have been on earth for a very long time. The oldest bat fossil is about 50 million years old. The remains found in the fossil look much like bats today. This shows that the way bats look has changed very little over time. Some people think bats are harmful animals. However, bats are helpful in many ways. Scientists have been able to make medicine from the saliva of vampire bats. This medicine is used to help people who have had heart attacks or strokes. 
fascinating facts. Bats produce droppings called guano. Guano is an excellent fertilizer for plants and crops. Bats spread plant seeds in their droppings. Bat shelter. From tropical rainforest to the cold Arctic, bats live in most parts of the world. They can live in caves, holes in trees or rock walls, and buildings. Many bats live in colonies or groups. Living with other bats helps them keep warm. Bats roost high up to protect themselves from predators. Some bats hibernate during the winter when there is less food available. These bats find a cave and sleep for five or six months. They wake up in the spring when food can be found more easily. To sleep, bats hang upside down so they can fly away quickly if needed. Some bats migrate during the winter. These bats fly to warmer places when there is little food available in colder areas. Bat features. Many bats are known for flying through the night sky and eating insects. They have many features that help them do these tasks. For example, bat bones are very thin and light. This makes it easier for bats to fly. Head. For their body size, bats have larger brains than birds. They are very smart. Bats can remember places and people for a long time. Wings. Bat wings are made of skin. Bats have long finger bones that support their wings. The wings stretch from the hind leg to the fingers. Bats have a thumb that is free from the wing. They use their thumb to cling to trees and ceilings. The largest bats in the world have wingspans of up to six feet or two meters. Ears. Bats can turn their ears in the direction of sounds. At night, bats make small, high-pitched noises. These noises echo or bounce off other objects. The bats hear the echoes, which help them find where prey is. The echoes also help them avoid flying into objects. Eyes. Bats have keen eyesight. They can see very well at night. Teeth. Bats have small, sharp teeth with jagged edges. They use their teeth to break through the hard shells of fruit and prey, such as insects. What do bats eat? Most bats are insectivores. This means they eat mostly insects, such as beetles, moths, mosquitoes, mayflies, and flying ants. Bats are helpful to humans because they eat insects that can spread disease and eat crops. A colony of bats can eat 250 tons or 227,000 kilograms of insects in one night. Some bats are carnivores. This means they eat meat, such as small fish, reptiles, birds, and other mammals. Vampire bats drink blood from their prey. Certain kinds of bats eat only fruit and nectar. A bat can eat as much as half its own body weight in insects each night. Bat life cycle. Bats mate before they hibernate. This happens in autumn or winter. Male bats sing a special song to attract female bats. Sometimes one male bat will mate with more than 30 female bats. Female bats give birth to one or two pups in a litter. 
Groups of female bats will roost together. Male bats roost apart from females. Pups. At birth, most pups are blind, have no fur, and cannot fly. After a few days, their eyes open. Mother bats recognize their pups through scent and sound. Pups drink milk from their mother. They stay in the roost when their mother leaves to hunt. Young bats. Young bats grow very quickly. They can learn to fly and hunt in two to four weeks. Often young bats cling to their mother when she roosts and flies. Adult bats. Bats live longer than other small animals. They can live for 10 to 20 years. The oldest known bat lived for more than 30 years. Encountering bats. Bats often live near people. Sometimes they roost in attics and sheds. Special bat houses can be made from wood. Hanging a bat house outdoors in trees can keep bats from living inside buildings. In rare cases, bats can carry rabies. It is important not to come into contact with bats. Family pets should be vaccinated against rabies in case they come into contact with a bat or another animal carrying the virus. If you find an injured bat, do not approach it. It is best to call a wildlife officer. During the day, you may come across bats roosting. Try not to disturb them with noise or light. There are 45 bat species in the United States. To learn more, check out this useful website. Myths and legends. Many cultures have myths and legends about bats. Some people believe that bats are dangerous. Bats are sometimes shown as villains in movies and cartoons. Scary stories have been written about these winged animals. In some cases, people believed that bats were vampires or witches' companions. In China, bats are symbols of happiness and good luck. Images of bats appear on Chinese jewelry, furniture, and tapestries. Chinese emperors had images of bats on their thrones and robes. Batman is a comic book superhero who dresses like a bat. A Bat Legend This Ojibwa Indian legend is about how the first bat was created. One morning when Father Son was rising, he got caught in some tree branches. When Father Son did not appear the next day, the animal searched the forest. A squirrel was running through the treetops when he spotted Father Son. The squirrel ran toward Father Son, but the heat burned off his tail, made his fur black, and nearly blinded him. The squirrel tried again to help Father Son. He pushed hard until Father Son was free. Father Son felt bad that the little squirrel was burned while helping him. What do you want more than anything in the world? Father Son asked the squirrel. The squirrel replied, I have always wanted to fly. Father Son granted the squirrel's wish. The little squirrel became the first bat. Frequently Asked Questions when is the best time of day to see bats in nature? The best time to see bats is at dusk, when they are leaving their roosts to hunt. Bats can often be seen flying around lights at night. The lights attract insects, and the bats will hunt for insects around lights. Do bats have predators? Bats have many predators, including snakes, hawks, weasels, owls, cats, dogs, and humans. In Venezuela, 
there is a large centipede that hunts bats. Do bats live in caves? Bats often live in caves. Sometimes thousands or millions of bats will roost together in a cave. Caves offer a safe shelter for bats as they sleep. Few predators can reach them as they hang from the top of a cave. Puzzler, see if you can answer these questions about bats. Number one, what are the two main kinds of bats? If you said megabats and microbats, you are correct. Good job. Number two, what are a bat's wings made out of? If you said finger bones covered by thin layers of skin, you are correct. Number three, how many pups are in a litter of bats? If you said one or two, you are correct. Number four, how long do bats live in nature? If you said 10 to 20 years, you are correct. Number five, what do bats eat? If you said blood, nectar, insects, fish, and other animals, you are correct. Find out more. There are many more interesting facts to learn about bats. Look for these and other books at your library. Big Pumpkin by Erica Silverman, illustrated by S.D. Schindler. Once there was a witch who wanted to make pumpkin pie. So she planted a pumpkin seed. She weeded and watered, and after a while, a sprout poked through. And then a pumpkin grew, and it grew, and it grew, and then it grew some more. Soon, Halloween was just hours away. The witch thought about pumpkin pie and bent down to take her pumpkin off the vine. Well, she pulled and she tucked and she pulled. First, she pulled hard, and then she pulled harder, but that pumpkin just sat. Drat, said the witch. Just then, along came a ghost. Big pumpkin, said the ghost. It's big and it's mine, but it's stuck on the vine, and Halloween's just hours away said the witch, and she kicked that pumpkin. I am bigger than you and stronger too, boasted the ghost. Let me try, <laughs> said the witch. But she thought about pumpkin pie and stepped aside. The ghost bent down to take the pumpkin off the vine. Well, he pulled and he tugged and he pulled. First, he pulled hard and then he pulled harder, but that pumpkin just sat. Drat, said the ghost. Just then, along came a vampire. Big pumpkin, said the vampire. It's big and it's mine, but it's stuck on the vine. And Halloween's just hours away, said the witch. And she kicked that pumpkin. 
I am bigger than both of you, and stronger too, boasted the vampire. Let me try. Hmm, said the witch. Hmm, said the ghost. But they thought about pumpkin pie and stepped aside. The vampire bent down to take the pumpkin off the vine. Well, he pulled and he tugged and he pulled. First, he pulled hard and then he pulled harder. But that pumpkin just sat. Dropped, said the vampire. Just then, along came a mummy. Big pumpkin, said the mummy. It's big and it's mine, but it's stuck on the vine. And Halloween's just hours away, said the witch. And she kicked that pumpkin. I am bigger than all of you and stronger too, boasted the mummy. Let me try. Hmm, said the witch. Hmm, said the ghost. Hmm, said the vampire. But they thought about pumpkin pie and stepped aside. The mummy bent down to take the pumpkin off the vine. Well, she pulled and she tugged and she pulled. First, she pulled hard and then she pulled harder. But that pumpkin just sat. Drat, said the mummy. Just then, along came a bat. Big pumpkin, said the bat. The witch didn't say a word. She just looked at the ghost and rolled her eyes. The ghost looked at the vampire. The vampire looked at the mummy. They all looked at the little bat and they started to laugh. I may not be big and I may not be strong, said the bat, but I have an idea. And the bat told them what to do. Hmm, said the witch. Hmm, said the ghost. Hmm, said the vampire. Hmm, said the mummy. But they thought about pumpkin pie and bent down to take the pumpkin off the vine. Ready, set, pull, called the bat. The bat pulled the mummy, the mummy pulled the vampire, the vampire pulled the ghost, the ghost pulled the witch, and the witch pulled the pumpkin. Well, they pulled, and they tugged, and they pulled. First, they pulled hard, and then they pulled harder, and... Snap! Off came the pumpkin. Drat, said the witch. Whoosh! It flew and it flew and thud. It landed on top of a hill and thump, bump, thump, bump, thump, bump. It bounced all the way down to the witch's house. And when it got to her door, that pumpkin just sat. Hooray for the bat, shouted the witch, and she hurried inside to make pumpkin pie. Mmm, said the ghost. Have some more, said the witch. Couldn't eat another bite, said the vampire. Fun party, said the mummy. Time to go said the bat. Drat, said the witch, as she watched them all leave. Then she went right out and planted another pumpkin seed.
Calavera Abecedario, A Day of the Dead Alphabet Book by Jeanette Winter. On a rooftop patio in Mexico City, the Calaveras come to life. Like his father before him, Don Pedro makes skeletons for the fiesta of El Dia de los Muertos. Enrique, Felipe, and Miguel help their father make the calaveras with torn pieces of brown paper and wheat paste. Don Pedro wraps paste-covered paper around bamboo. Enrique, Felipe, and Miguel press paste-covered paper into molds. The sun dries the paper. Then Don Pedro and his sons fasten the pieces together with more paper and paste. The calaveras are coming to life. Doña Adela snips hair from Gato's bushy tail and makes brushes to paint the calaveras. The years pile on top of one another. Before long, the sons are fathers. Now Leonardo, Ricardo, and David help Enrique, Felipe, and Miguel. And they all help Don Pedro make the calaveras. The fiesta is coming soon. Fathers and sons and grandsons work into the night. The calaveras must be ready to dance on El Dia de los Muertos. At dawn on Fiesta Day, the calaveras go to market, and among the marigolds, candles, and sugar skulls, the dance begins. A is for Ángel. B is for Bruja. C is for Candelera. D is for Doctor. E is for Enfermera. F is for Photographo. G is for Granjero. H is for Huevera. I is for Ilustradora. J is for Jardinero. K is for Kahlo. L is for Limonera, Limera. M is for mariachi. N is for novio, novia. O is for organalero. P is for pescadora. Q is for Químico. R is for Rey and Reina. S is for Sombrero. T is for Tortillera. U is for Unicornio. V is for vaquero. W. X, xylophonista. Y, yucca. Z, zapatero. Now the fiesta is over. The dance 
is done. The candles are out. But when the morning sun lights the sky, Don Pedro and his sons and grandsons will begin again, making calaveras to dance in the fiesta next year. Construction Zoo by Jennifer Thorne, illustrated by Susie Hammer. Up at the zoo, a dull, dreary week. No humans can come to take a peek. The animals fret from night till morning. Then suddenly, without any warning, spinning, crashing, digging, roaring. Animals everywhere wake and skitter to see what set the zoo a flitter. Big trucks roll round hills and bends here to make trouble or here to make friends. Giraffe just craned his neck to see a yellow truck tall as can be. Its head lifts up into the sky the perfect height for giraffe to say hi. Rhino wants to start a fight, then spots a truck and what a sight. Look at its head, so sharp and tough. This bulldozer's made of sturdy stuff. The monkey's pace all worried antsy, but with one swoop, it takes their fancy. Curious elephant can't believe what this machine has up its sleeve. Its trunk can scoop into the ground. It toots a mighty trumpet sound. Giant tortoise wanders close to scout a truck more stacked than most. The dump bumps slowly down the track, its heavy pile safe on its back. Two tiger brothers crouch and spy a cement mixer truck set up nearby. Its striped back spins and rolls all day, just like the cubs' backs when they play. Trucks and animals Two by two, it's party time at Construction Zoo. Then the site gets slow, the trucks pack up and go. The zoo is quiet once again, the animals miss their metal friends. But wait, here comes Zookeeper, a pair of scissors and a crowd of guests with him. A snip, a cheer, construction is done. Thanks, machines. It was so much fun. Creepy But Cool Bats by Tracy Nelson Marrer. Table of Contents. Wings of Wonder, page four. Night Diners, page eight. At Home in the Dark, page 14. Baby Bats, page 18. Are Bats Endangered? Page 20. Name that bat. Page 22. Glossary, page 23. Index, page 23. Wings of Wonder. Bats are the only mammals that can truly fly. Mammals have fur or hair on their bodies. Mammal babies feed on their mother's milk. Bats' wings have a thin skin membrane to catch air. 
thumb or first finger, second finger, third finger, fourth finger, fifth finger, membrane. Most bats cannot take off from the ground. To fly, they drop off a ledge, tree, or other high spot. Bats move their wings the way humans wave their fingers. Bats also have a thumb for gripping. Night diners. Most bats are nocturnal. They fly at night to find food and they sleep during the day. Most bats eat insects such as mosquitoes, beetles, and moths, or small animals such as frogs. Persian trident bats eat insects. Some bats eat fruit. They live in the tropics. The greater bulldog bat has pouches in its cheeks to carry fish when it flies. Wrinkle-faced bats suck on overripe bananas. Bats may look scary, but they are helpful. Fruit bats spread seeds and pollen from plants that humans use for food or medicine. Other bats eat insects that damage crops. The flying fox is the world's largest bat. It eats only fruit. Bats have good eyesight, but they hear even better. They use echolocation or sound images to find food in the dark. Bats bounce clicks and squeaks off objects. The sounds form sharp images in their brains. Creepy or cool. Bats with a nose leaf honk through their noses for echolocation. These odd skin flaps may also help catch echoes. Mexican fruit bat. Nose leaf. At home in the dark. Most bats live in quiet, dark places such as caves or empty buildings. Others roost in trees. Bats live above the ground to hide from predators. A group of bats living together is called a colony. Most bats sleep upside down. They hang onto branches and ledges with hooked toes. Some bats wrap their wings around themselves to keep warm. Bats live nearly everywhere, except very cold places. Some bats migrate to warmer places in the fall areas of the world where bats can be found. Baby bats. Most mother bats give birth to one pup each year. Helpless bat pups cannot fly at birth. They cling to their mother. Creepy or cool. Almost all bats are born without hair and with their eyes closed. This Gambian epauletted fruit bat is flying with a baby on her belly. Pups quickly grow too heavy to fly with their mothers. After four to six weeks, bat pups can fly and hunt on their own. Are bats endangered? Bats are important to the planet. People have destroyed bat habitats or killed bats from fear. Since 2006, white nose fungus has killed more than 1 million bats in North America. Scientists are trying to find a way to stop it. Scientists study and collect information on bats to help bats survive. Name that bat. Match each bat name below with the correct photo. A is the Gambian epauletted fruit bat. B, wrinkle-faced bat. C, 
Greater Bulldog Bat. D. Flying Fox. E. Mexican Fruit Bat. Glossary. Echolocation. Sending sound waves and using their echoes to see where things are. Habitat. A place where an animal usually lives. Mammals. A group of animals that are warm-blooded, have backbones, and feed their young milk. Most also have hair or fur. Membrane, a thin skin or covering layer. Migrate, to move from one region to another with the seasons. Nocturnal, active at night. Predators, animals that hunt other animals for food. Roost, a place where winged animals rest. Tropics, warm or hot areas of Earth. Bats, William, more bats. Look at that. Creepy Carrots, words by Erin Reynolds, pictures by Peter Brown. Jasper Rabbit had a passion for carrots, and the carrots that grew in Krakenhopper Field were the best, fat, crisp, and free for the taking. He pulled some for a morning snack on the way to school. He yanked out a few on his way to Little League practice. He ripped them from the ground on his way home at night. Jasper couldn't get enough carrots. Until they started following him. He first noticed something strange after the big game against the East Valley Hares. Jasper was about to help himself to a victory snack when he heard it, the soft, sinister tuk, tuk, tuk of carrots creeping. He turned, but there was nothing there. Just my imagination, he thought, but he hopped a little faster. That night, as he was brushing his teeth, there they were. Jasper whipped around, but nothing. He laughed at himself, picked his toothbrush off the floor, and went to bed quickly. The next morning, he approached Krakenhopper Field slowly. He reached for two wild carrots. Nothing happened. He bit into one. Nothing happened. Whew, creepy carrots. It was ridiculous. But when he arrived home that evening, Mom! Mom! Jasper screamed. Creepy carrots in the shed! His mom opened the door slowly. There weren't any carrots, not even the regular kind. There are no such thing as creepy carrots, Mom said, shaking her head. Later that night, as Jasper lay in bed, he heard it, breathing, 
terrible carroty breathing. And there on his wall, creepy carrots, he shouted, dad, dad. His dad thumped into his bedroom and threw on the light. They searched under the bed, no creepy carrots. They looked through the closet, no creepy carrots. They opened the dresser drawers, no creepy carrots. Just a bad dream, son, his dad said, shaking his head. Now go to sleep. That wasn't going to happen. By the end of the week, Jasper was seeing creepy carrots creeping everywhere. Jasper knew his parents were wrong. Creepy carrots were real and they were coming for him. But they couldn't get him if they couldn't get out. Jasper hatched a plan. First thing on Saturday, he grabbed supplies and headed to Krakenhopper Field. As the sun finally set across Krakenhopper Field, Jasper Rabbit smiled. On his way home, there was no tuk, tuk, tuk. There were no carrot-shaped shadows. His plan had worked. No creepy carrots would ever get out of that carrot patch again. And as the sun finally set, the carrots of Krakenhopper Field cheered. Their creepy plan had worked. They were sure of it. Jasper Rabbit would never get into that carrot patch ever again. Creepy Crayon, words by Aaron Reynolds, pictures by Peter Brown. Jasper Rabbit was struggling in school. He was flunking math. He was failing spelling. The only subject he was passing was art. Jasper needed serious help. That's when he found the crayon. It was purple, pointy, and perfect. And somehow, it looked happy to see him. That night, Jasper knew he had to study for his spelling test, but Tales from the Carrot Patch was on. By the time it was over, he was way too tired to study. The test was a disaster. Jasper couldn't remember how to spell a single word. That's when he noticed something strange. Jasper picked up the crayon. Immediately, he spelled all the words correctly. When he got his test back, he got an A plus and a sticker. The crayon looked pleased. Creepy, but cool. After dinner, Jasper settled into play Bunny Brawl 3. Math homework first, said Dad. Fine, moaned Jasper. That's when he saw it. Scrawled in peculiar purple penmanship. Who needs math when you have Bunny Brawl 3? Three hours later, he fell asleep. His game in one hand, the purple crayon 
in the other. When Mrs. Lopshire announced a surprise math quiz, Jasper panicked. He reached for a pencil, but instead his hand wrapped around the crayon. Suddenly, math seemed easy. He knew when to carry the one. He knew when to borrow from the bigger numbers. It was like the crayon knew exactly what to do. After the quiz, he saw it written on his backpack. Jasper plus crayon forever. Jasper felt a shiver go up his spine. The next day was the deadline for the poster contest. Jasper had been working on his entry for weeks. It just needed a few finishing touches. The purple crayon rolled across the table all by itself, but Jasper ignored it. Don't ignore me. He shuddered. He scrubbed the writing off the table. He zipped the crayon into his pencil case. He tried to forget all about the crayon. But when he woke up, his precious artwork was better than ever. It was a horrifying masterpiece in purple. Fantastic work, cried Mr. Hoppypot. You should be very proud. But Jasper didn't feel proud. He felt eked out, freaked out, creeped out. When he got home, Jasper descended into the deepest, darkest corner of his basement. He put the crayon in a dusty box and locked it tight. He went to bed feeling much better. But when he woke up the next day, there on the mirror, you need me. In his pencil case, the creepy crayon. And it looked happy to see him. That day, Jasper got all A pluses. It was terrible. Enough was enough. Jasper snapped the creepy crayon in two. He melted it in the microwave and he threw the mess into the garbage. He drifted to sleep that night, feeling relieved. But when he woke up, there on his wall, it was a mural of him graduating elementary school with straight A's. And worst of all, it was really well drawn. And next to it, the creepy crayon. Purple, pointy, and perfect. All day, no matter what Jasper did, the creepy crayon was there, looking oh so pleased. In his hand as he aced his vocabulary quiz. In his pocket as Mrs. Lopshire named Jasper most improved student. In the crowd as the school celebrated Jasper in a special assembly. Things were spinning out of control. Jasper couldn't take it anymore. When he got home, he ran straight to the toilet and he threw the crayon in. It just floated there, spinning slowly. It did not look happy to see him. And then Jasper saw it scribbled inside the bowl. Don't you dare. But Jasper 
dared. That evening, Tails from the Carrot Patch was on, but Jasper studied for his spelling test. His eyes kept darting to his pencil case. No creepy crayon. He flung the toilet lid up. No creepy crayon. He got into bed nervously, watching his walls. No creepy crayon. During the test, Jasper spelled ocean wrong, but he spelled courage right. He got a C plus. It was glorious. It wasn't an A, but it was his. He headed home from school that day, finally feeling free. Far, far away, was an old sewer pipe. Out and away floated the purple crayon. Slowly, silently, it drifted for days and weeks. One thing was clear, the creepy crayon would never cause trouble ever again. Except that's when Elliot Pelican spotted the creepy crayon. It was purple, pointy, and perfect. And somehow it looked happy to see him. Creepy Pair of Underwear Words by Aaron Reynolds Pictures by Peter Brown Jasper Rabbit needed new underwear. On Thursday, Mom took him to the underwear store and grabbed the last three packages of plain white. But as they headed for the checkout, Jasper spotted them. Creepy underwear, so creepy, so comfy. They were glorious. Mom, Mom, can we get these? Jasper pleaded. I think they're a little too creepy, said Mom. They're not creepy, they're cool, said Jasper. I'm not a little bunny anymore. I'm a big rabbit now. Mom agreed to buy one pair. That night, Jasper wore his cool new underwear to bed. Do you want me to leave the hallway light on? Asked Dad. Dad, I'm not a little bunny anymore, said Jasper. I'm a big rabbit now. His dad shut the door. And that's when Jasper noticed the underwear glowed, a ghoulish, greenish glow. He closed his eyes. He pulled up the covers. He buried his face in his pillow, but it didn't help. He could still see that ghoulish, greenish glow. Jasper leaped out of bed and put on a pair of plain white. He stuffed the creepy underwear into the bottom of his laundry hamper. He finally fell asleep. But when he got up the next day, he was wearing the creepy underwear. Jasper threw them into the garbage can. He was still a big rabbit. He wasn't scared or anything, but he was done with scary underwear. After school, Jasper was doing his homework when he heard it. A scratchy, scraping sound coming from his dresser. He opened the drawer 
and they were back staring at him with that ghoulish greenish glow. He snatched the creepy underwear out of the drawer. He grabbed a big envelope and some stamps. Bye-bye, scary underwear, he said, dropping the package in the mailbox to China. When he opened the front door the next morning, there they were. And were those chopsticks? His creepy pair of underwear had somehow returned from China and it had brought back souvenirs? Jasper grabbed his mom's good sewing scissors. She didn't like him using them, but this was an underwear emergency. This time, the creepy underwear were gone for good. At bedtime, he slowly opened his underwear drawer. Nothing, just plain white undies. He searched under his bed. He shook out his lampshades. Whew, there was no sign of creepy underwear. He went into the bathroom to comb his ears. They were back! What's the matter with you? His mom asked. You're so jittery lately. Nothing, he yelped. A grown rabbit couldn't be terrified of his underpants. He seized the underwear. He snagged a shovel from the garage and he rode. He didn't stop pedaling until he reached Creek Hanger Hill. Jasper began to dig. He dug until his hole was dark and deep and 100% underwear proof. He dropped the underwear in. They gleamed from the bottom, that ghoulish greenish glow, but not for long. When he got home, Jasper crept up to his dresser. They couldn't be in there. There was no way, right? He reached for the handle. He peeked in. Nothing, just plain white. Jasper smiled and turned out the light. There was just one problem. It was really dark in there, even for a big rabbit. Jasper turned on the light. He looked at his non-glowy pair of plain white, and he knew what he had to do. The creepy underwear were a little muddy, but they still filled the room with that gentle greenish glow. The next day, Jasper gathered his allowance money and went to the underwear store all by himself just like a big rabbit. That night, Jasper wasn't scared at all. As he lay down to sleep, he smiled. And so did his underwear, because they had finally found somebody who wasn't scared. Of Creepy Underwear
Thomas and friends. Diesel 10 means trouble. Based on the feature film, Thomas and the Magic Railroad, illustrated by Richard Courtney, created by Britt Alcroft. Thomas the Tank Engine was a little blue engine who always tried to be really useful. And all his friends lived on the island of Sodor. Life on the island of Sodor was very peaceful and happy. But on this beautiful island where trains could talk and the railroad was really reliable and right on time, trouble was brewing. Sir Topham Hatt, the railroad director, was going on a vacation. Mr. Conductor, who traveled from place to place in a shower of gold dust, was coming to help him out. I have to go and meet Mr. Conductor, Thomas said. He's going to take care of us while Sir Topham Hatt is away. I think we can take care of ourselves, huffed Gordon. Whoosh! Suddenly, a big diesel engine raced past them. Get out of my way, you blue puffballs, the diesel growled. What was that? asked Gordon nervously. That was a problem. Thomas said as the diesel screeched away. That's Diesel 10. Sir Topham Hatt sent him to help us steam engines. But Diesel 10 is behaving as though he hates us. I think he's a really scary engine. Pah, grumbled Gordon. Really useful engines like us have to be brave, little Thomas. Thomas agreed but he couldn't help feeling frightened. Meanwhile, Diesel 10 was planning to get rid of the steam engines once and for all. He wanted to run the railroad. That night, Diesel 10 sneaked up to the engine shed and threatened Mr. Conductor with his jagged claw. Make the most of tonight, Twinkle Toes, hissed Diesel 10, because you won't like tomorrow. Mr. Conductor had another problem too. I've suddenly lost all my sparkle, he sighed to Thomas. To get it back, I must find some more gold dust. Thomas and the other engines knew they had to help Mr. Conductor find the source of the magic gold dust. While the boss Sir Topham Hat is away, we cats will play, purred Diesel 10 to his pals. Splatter and Dodge gulped. We're going to make life miserable for those steaming heaps of trash on wheels, Diesel 10 continued. This island doesn't need them. It needs diesels. There's no use for steam engines these days. They're history. But what about Mr. Conductor? asked Splatter. Isn't he going to stop us? Dodge asked. Mr. Conductor needs his magic gold dust to keep an eye on us, snickered Diesel 10. And I know he can't because he's just run out. A door opened on Diesel 10's cab roof and out came his huge metal claw. I'll take care of all of them with this, said Diesel 10. He lifted his claw high above them, but then it dropped and hit him on the head. I don't think he meant to do that, 
Splatter and Dodge said to each other. Little did the Diesels know that Toby the tram engine had overheard their plans. Toby told the other engines. Then he followed the Diesels to see what they were going to do next. The Diesels were plotting to destroy the magic buffers that led to Mr. Conductor's magic railroad. We don't know where the entrance to the magic railroad is, and we don't know which are the right buffers to destroy, said Diesel 10 to Splatter and Dodge, so we'll have to destroy all of them. Toby knew he had to do something to stop Diesel 10. I've got to distract him, thought Toby. Clang! Toby rang his bell as loud as he could. It's the oldest teapot, shouted Diesel 10. Smash him! Diesel 10 tried to catch Toby with his claw, but he knocked over a pile of scrap right onto his own tracks. Diesel 10's path was blocked. Uh, boss, did you mean to do that? Asked Splatter and Dodge. Err, Diesel 10 growled. I always mean what I do. Diesel 10 was mad when he found out that Thomas had traveled the magic railroad to bring back Lady, the golden engine. Lady was the source of the magic gold dust. She could help Mr. Conductor foil Diesel 10's plans. Diesel 10 chased Lady, but Thomas raced between them. All three engines headed toward a dangerous old viaduct. Lady crossed the old viaduct. Stones began to fall. When Thomas crossed the viaduct, more stones fell and a big gap appeared in the track. Thomas jumped the gap just in time. But Diesel 10 couldn't stop and he tumbled far below onto a barge filled with sledge. Lady was safe, and there would always be plenty of gold dust. You're a really useful engine, Gordon told Thomas. Peep, peep, Thomas said, and puffed home into the sunset. Holiday History, Day of the Dead, by Claudia Oviedo. Chapter 1, Celebrating the Dead. Thousands of years ago, many people lived in what is now Mexico. The Aztecs were one group who lived here. Tenochtitlan was the center of their empire. The Aztecs believed death was part of the cycle of life. They celebrated it. Skulls were symbols of death. They put out food, water, and tools for the dead. Why? They believed these helped souls on their journey to the land of the dead. This was their final resting place. At this time, many people in Spain were Catholic. On November 1st, they celebrated saints on All Saints Day. On November 2nd, they celebrated the dead on All Souls Day. They visited graves. People brought drinks, bread, flowers, and candles. In the 1500s, Spanish conquerors came to Mexico. Catholic and Aztec traditions mixed. 
This is how Day of the Dead formed. This holiday is celebrated on November 1st and 2nd. Families and friends gather. They invite the souls of loved ones who have died to visit the land of the living. It is a celebration. What do you think? Day of the Dead combines traditions from different cultures. What traditions do you practice? Do you know what cultures they come from? Chapter 2 Day of the Dead Traditions Day of the Dead is a colorful holiday. Yellow, orange, red, purple, pink, white, and black are common. Skulls are still an important symbol. People decorate sugar skulls. They are made from sugar. Skeletons are another common symbol. The most famous is La Catrina. She wears a fancy hat. People dress up like her for parades and festivals. People decorate with papel picado. These paper banners are colorful. They have detailed patterns. People hang them at festivals and other celebrations. They also place them on altars. Did you know? Marigolds are another symbol of this holiday. The smell helps souls find their way back to the land of the living. People also make these flowers out of paper. People visit cemeteries. They tell stories. They clean up graves. They set up altars in cemeteries or at home. They place offerings on the altars. Take a look. What are some common altar offerings? Take a look. Belongings, such as toys, books, photos, or other items of importance to the dead. Calaveras de azúcar, decorated sugar skulls. Candles, to light the way for souls. Marigolds, favorite meals to feed the souls. Pan de muerto, bread decorated with dried fruit and colored sugar. Papel picado, colorful paper cut into fancy patterns. Water, to give souls something to drink. Chapter 3 Day of the Dead Around the World Day of the Dead is celebrated in many places. In Mexico, people celebrate at home. They also celebrate in cemeteries with music and dancing. Some cities have festivals or parades. In the United States, some communities and schools celebrate. People set up altars. Kids learn how to cut papel picado. Others decorate sugar skulls. Celebrations around the world honor the dead on November 2nd. In Guatemala, people fly big kites. Why? These are thought to scare away bad spirits. In El Salvador, people dress up as characters from myths. Day of the Dead is more popular than ever. People gather, they honor the dead, they enjoy colorful flowers, sugar skulls, and food. They watch skeletons dance in parades. Do you celebrate Day of the Dead? If not, would you like to? What do you think? Day of the Dead honors and celebrates people who have died. Do you think this is important? Why or why not? A gift for Abuelita, celebrating the Day of the Dead. By Nancy Lewin, illustrated by Robert Chapman. Rosita 
and her grandmother spent every day together. Her mother was very busy, but Abuelita always had time for Rosita. Mira, Rosita, look, her grandmother said. She held up three strands of yarn. Each takes a turn crossing over the other. One strand alone can be broken, but when they are woven together, they make a cord that is strong, like my love for you and your love for me. With patient hands, she taught Rosita how to braid. One morning, they made up a song about making tortillas. What do my hands say? Pla, pla, pla. What does the pawn say? Saw, saw, saw. What does my mouth say? Da, da, da. Dame mas tortillas. They laughed as they stacked up the finished tortillas. Abuelita scolded the day she discovered Rosita pulling up plants in the garden. I'm weeding, protested Rosita. Those are not weeds, replied Abuelita. She showed Rosita what to pull and what to save. These little plants are chiles. We will harvest them together. This year, you can help me make salsa. Rosita was pleased. She liked helping her grandmother cook. Then Abuelita got sick. Soon she was too weak to work in the garden. Rosita sat by her grandmother's bed, braiding and telling her stories. The chiles are fat now, she told Abuelita. When you are well, we will pick them together. But before the chiles could ripen, Abuelita died. Rosita missed her very much. She missed the soap scent of Abuelita's everyday dress and the pla, pla, pla of her hands shaping dough for tortillas. She missed the strong warmth of her grandmother's arms. She wanted to hear Abuelita's voice whisper, Good night. Abuelita is in heaven with the angels, Mama, told Rosita at bedtime. She will watch over you while you are sleeping. Rosita did not want Abuelita to be with the angels. She wanted her at home. We need Abuelita here, Rosita told Abuelo in October. Her grandfather nodded. His brown eyes glistened. Yes, he said, I miss her too. You can show Abuelita how much you miss her, mija. Make her a gift for when she visits us on the Day of the Dead. On the Day of the Dead, families remember the people they love who have died. Each family makes an ofrenda at an altar to welcome the dead. Everybody makes gifts for the altar. But what can I make? Rosita wondered. What are you making? She asked her brother Carlos just before the holidays. Is it a gift for the altar? Yes, said Carlos. A lizard for Tio Antonio. He always liked lizards. Rosita's father was in the marigold garden. What are you making? She asked him. A harvest of flowers for the altar and graves. Abuelo Leon loved these flowers. Rosita found her mother in the kitchen. What are you making? She asked her. Chicken and mole for Tia Dolores. It was her favorite. What are you making? Rosita asked Abuelo. Is it for me, Abuelita? Yes, I am weaving this blanket to keep her soul warm. Rosita remembered something she knew how to do. She asked Abuelo for three long strands of yarn. 
Then she sat near his loom in the courtyard and started to braid. She braided the following morning as well, when her family went to the market. They sold some flowers and bought candles and incense, apples and bread of the dead. What a beautiful braid, said the woman who sold them the bread. Gracias, but it isn't finished yet, said Rosita. All the way home on the bus, Rosita worked on her braid. The cord reached from the tips of her fingers past her elbow. That afternoon, Rosita's family prepared the ofrenda. Mama and Rosita brought food from the kitchen, tortillas and chicken and brown mole sauce. Rosita helped her mother light a candle for each soul they were remembering. One for your tío Antonio, and one for Abuelo Leon, said Mama. One for my tía Dolores, and one for our dear Abuelita. Then everyone added their gifts to the altar. Everyone except Rosita. Where is your braid? asked Mama. It isn't finished yet, Rosita said. All afternoon, friends came to visit, bringing their gifts for the dead. As each person arrived, Rosita stopped braiding and hurried to greet them. Abuelita never came. When will I see her? Rosita asked Carlos. Silly, he said. You won't be able to see her. Spirits are invisible. If spirits are invisible, Rosita asked Papa, how will I know Abuelita is here? You will feel that she is near, said Papa. How will it feel? Rosita wondered as she braided her cord. More friends arrived in the evening, but Abuelita didn't come. Where is Abuelita? Rosita asked Papa. Why didn't she come? It is a long way from heaven, he said. Perhaps she will be at the graveyard tomorrow. The next day, Rosita and her family went to the graveyard. They pulled weeds and washed the gravestones. When the graves looked beautiful and new again, they spread out a picnic. As they ate, they told stories of the people they remembered. Will Abuelita be here soon? Rosita asked. Think of all the things you loved about Abuelita, Mama suggested. Then she will know where to find you. Rosita braided her cord and remembered. She remembered her grandmother's husky old voice when she sang this song about making tortillas. She remembered the tales Abuelita told while she cooked chiles for salsa. Rosita braided, remembering all she had loved. As twilight deepened, she finished her braid. It was as tall as she was. Rosita sat by her grandmother's grave, stroking the cord with her fingers. In it, she had braided the things she remembered. The scent of her grandmother's dress, the pla, pla, pla of her hands on the tortillas, her songs and her scolding, her tales and the taste of her salsa. Closing her eyes, Rosita began to feel warm, as if she were safe in her grandmother's arms. Soft wings brushed her face like a kiss. Then in her heart, a husky voice whispered, Buenos noches, Rosita. Oh, Abuelita, you came. Mira, I made this for you. She laid her gift over the grave, and she knew that, like the braid, the cord of their love was too strong to be broken.
The Dead Family Diaz by P.J. Bracegirdle. Pictures by Polly Bernatine. Morning came as the dead sun chased off the dead moon. All across the land of the dead, everyone's spirits were high. Rise and shine, sleepy skulls, Mrs. Diaz called. Breakfast is getting cold. Huevos muertos, cheered Estrellita. Yum! Angelito looked at his plate miserably. Today was the day of the dead, when his family would walk among the living, and Angelito was feeling scared. Did I tell you how the living have big red tongues and bulging eyes? His sister jabbered. And if you touch one, they feel all hot and squishy. Ew, gasped Angelito, turning whiter than ever. Mrs. Diaz hushed her daughter. The living are our friends, she said, and this is the one time each year everyone gets together to celebrate. But were they really hot and squishy? Angelito listened in horror to his sister's stories about Halloween when the living put out fiery-eyed pumpkins to scare the dead away. Except it never works, cackled Estrellita. <laughs> the day of the dead is nothing like Halloween, Angelito's father insisted. Now eat up. We don't want to be late. Angelito fed his breakfast to Dante while Estrellita chomped away. Finally, the family piled into the car. I told you we should have left earlier, Mr. Diaz grumbled. Just look at this traffic. Nearby, a large crowd was waiting for the elevator to the land of the living, and the dead were getting restless. Quit pushing, numbskull. Tell it to the zombies at the back. Jostled and shoved, the Diaz family squeezed into a packed elevator. Up and up they went until, ding, the doors finally opened. Welcome to the land of the living, a booming voice shouted. Pushed into the bright world beyond, Angelito froze. Where were his parents? Shouting people, chiming bells, and blaring music drowned out his calls. He darted through the crowd, searching, but his family was nowhere to be found. Finally, Angelito arrived at a quiet square. Spotting a friendly-looking skull, he asked, You didn't see a man and a woman and a bone-headed girl wearing too much jaw gloss pass by, did you? The boy laughed but shook his head. Angelito began to slump away. I'm Pablo, by the way, the boy called. Did you happen to see any of them yet? Them? He means the living, Angelito thought. He told Pablo all about the terrible shouting he'd heard near the elevators. They must be getting ready to attack, whispered Pablo. Let's get out of here. The pair scrambled behind a fruit and vegetable stand where Angelito came up with a plan. They'd tip over boxes of cherries so their enemies would slip. And then we can finish them off with these, Pablo suggested, handing over a few tomatoes. Before long, they heard an angry mob approaching. Get ready, whispered Angelito. Aim. Wait, hold your fire, cried Pablo. It wasn't a mob at all but a parade full of banging drums and blasting trumpets. Still, 
Pablo warned that some of them might be hiding in it. Maybe we should keep our masks on just in case. Masks? laughed the skeleton boy. What masks? These ones, silly, said Pablo, reaching for Angelito's face. Hey, you're as cold as a popsicle, he squealed. And you've got bulging eyes, cried Angelito. Ah! You're one of them, they both shouted. Angelito took off, tearing down streets and alleyways without looking back. Out of breath, he finally stopped. Had he really been playing with a living boy the whole time? How freaky, he shuddered. How icky, how awful. But how incredibly fun, he had to admit. Except now he was alone again. Feeling glum, Angelito wandered around the deserted town until he found himself at the cemetery gates. Inside, a big party was going on. There was a loud bark. Dante! Angelito cried, rushing over to his family. Mrs. Diaz squeezed her son so tightly he thought he might crack. Angelito told them how he'd gotten lost and had been looking for them all day. We're just glad you're safe, sighed his father. Now let's get to the buffet. I'm ready to stuff my rib cage. Estreita slid up to her brother. Oh, I bet you were so scared, she whispered gleefully all alone in the land of the living. Actually, I wasn't alone, Angelito said. And then, spotting a familiar face, the dead boy discovered that he didn't need guts to be brave. Hey, Pablo, wait up, Angelito called. The living boy turned, then a big smile crossed his face. Sorry for saying you had bulging eyes, said Angelito. Sorry for calling you a popsicle, Pablo replied. So we're cool again, Angelito asked, grinning a big skeleton grin. Pablo winked, cool as your bones. Angelito told Pablo all the things Estrellita had said to make him scared of the living. She's okay, mostly, he admitted, but sometimes she can be a real knuckle bone. Maybe she just needs to meet a real living boy up close, Pablo said. <laughs> the dead moon had already chased off the dead sun by the time the dead family Diaz returned home. Bone tired, Angelito headed to bed where he dreamed sweet dreams. The Day of the Dead, El Dia de los Muertos, is a holiday celebrated in Mexico on November 1st when it is believed that the spirits of the dead return to visit the living. Though it is always sad when people die, the Day of the Dead is a happy holiday a time for people to remember and appreciate friends and relatives who have passed on. The day is full of singing, dancing, and feasting. Special displays, known as altars, are made to welcome these beloved souls into the homes of their living family, with food laid out for the spirits to enjoy when they visit.
Where is mi ofrenda? by Mariana Galvez. My name is Amelia, and today is Day of the Dead. I need your help collecting items for this year's ofrenda. Are you ready to help me find all we need to place on our altar? Is the red picture frame hanging on the wall? Can you look to see if the orange sempasuchil is planted in the garden? Are the yellow candles on the stand at the marketplace? Did you find the stack of mom's favorite green books on the floor? Are the blue plates with food on top of the dining table? Is the purple copal incense hidden behind the plant? Yummy! Have you set your sights on the brown pan de muerto on the counter? Is dad decorating the white sugar skulls? Is the rainbow papel picado hanging from the tree? We did it! We've gathered all items and placed them on the altar. Our ofrenda is the perfect way to honor and remember our dearly departed today and always. Frames. Framed photos are magical keys that unlock the passageway for spirits to visit on Dia de Muertos. These photos are placed in premier spots on each altar. Sempasuchil. With their beautiful color and unique aroma, Sempasuchil attracts souls to their altars. Their petals can also be scattered on the ground to make a path for souls to follow. Candles. The warm glow of candles provides loved ones with a heartwarming welcome home. Books, personal item. Personal items such as books and other mementos are placed on the altars to honor the hobbies and activities loved ones once cherished. Talavera plates, food and water. When spirits arrive at their altars after long journeys, they are welcomed with water and their favorite meals. Copal incense. Copal incense, derived from a native tree in Mexico, guides souls with the lovely scent of home back to their altars. Pan de Muerto. Pan de Muerto, a traditional pan dulce baked for the celebration of Dia de Muertos, serves as a symbol of the departed and an offering to the spirits. Sugar Skulls. Sugar skulls, brightly colored, symbolize the sweetness of life and are displayed on altars to represent the celebrated souls. Papel Picado, celebration. The vibrant colors and delicate imagery of Papel Picado symbolizes the fragility of life and creates a pathway for souls to journey through. Altar. In the celebration of Dia de Muertos, altars are decorated and adorned in memory of loved ones who have passed. Calavera Abecedario, A Day of the Dead Alphabet Book by Jeanette Winter. On a rooftop patio in Mexico City, the calaveras come to life. Like his father before him, Don Pedro makes skeletons for the fiesta of El Dia de los Muertos. Enrique, Felipe, and Miguel help their father make the calaveras 
with torn pieces of brown paper and wheat paste. Don Pedro wraps paste-covered paper around bamboo. Enrique, Felipe, and Miguel press paste-covered paper into molds. The sun dries the paper. Then Don Pedro and his sons fasten the pieces together with more paper and paste. The calaveras are coming to life. Doña Adela snips hair from Gato's bushy tail and makes brushes to paint the calaveras. The years pile on top of one another. Before long, the sons are fathers. Now Leonardo, Ricardo, and David help Enrique, Felipe, and Miguel. And they all help Don Pedro make the calaveras. The fiesta is coming soon. Fathers and sons and grandsons work into the night. The calaveras must be ready to dance on El Dia de los Muertos. At dawn on fiesta day, the calaveras go to market. And among the marigolds, candles, and sugar skulls, the dance begins. A is for Ángel. B is for Bruja. C is for Candelera. D is for Doctor. E is for Enfermera. F is for Photographo. G is for Granjero. H is for Huevera. I is for Ilustradora. J is for Jardinero. K is for Calo. L is for Limonera, Limera. M is for Mariachi. N is for Novio, Novia. O is for Organalero. P is for Pescadora. Q is for Químico. R is for Rey and Reina. S is for Sombrero. T is for Tortillera. U is for unicornio. V is for vaquero. W. X, xilophonista. Y, yucca. Z, zapatero. Now the fiesta is over. The dance is done. The candles are out. But when the morning sun lights the sky, Don Pedro and his sons and grandsons will begin again, making calaveras to dance in the fiesta next year. Little Skeletons Countdown to Midnight by Susie Hamarillo. 
When the old clock strikes the hour of one, out of the tomb, a skeletito's Roomba. Toomba lock a toomba lock a toomba tomb. A toomba lock a toomba lock a toomba la. When the old clock strikes the hour of two, two skeletitos eat up their food. Toomba lock a toomba lock a toomba tomb. A toomba lock a toomba lock a toomba la. When the old clock strikes the hour of three, three skeletitos backwards flee. Toomba lock a toomba lock a toomba tomb. A toomba lock a toomba lock a toomba la. When the old clock strikes the hour of four, four skeletitos go out the door. Toomba lock a toomba lock a toomba tomb. A toomba lock a toomba lock a toomba la. When the old clock strikes the hour of five, five skeletitos jump up and jive. Toomba lock a toomba lock a toomba tomb. A toomba lock a toomba lock a toomba la. When the old clock strikes the hour of six, six skeletitos get a chest fix. Toomba lock a toomba lock a toomba tomb. A toomba lock a toomba lock a toomba la. When the old clock strikes the hour of seven, seven skeletitos rocket up to heaven. Toomba lock a toomba lock a toomba tomb. A toomba lock a toomba lock a toomba la. When the old clock strikes the hour of eight, eight skeletitos eat up some cake. Toomba lock a toomba lock a toomba tomb. A toomba lock a toomba lock a toomba la. When the old clock strikes the hour of nine, nine skeletitos shake up their spine. Toomba lock a toomba lock a toomba tomb. A toomba lock a toomba lock a toomba la. When the old clock strikes the hour of ten, ten skeletitos go to sleep again. Toomba lock a toomba lock a toomba tomb. A toomba lock a toomba lock a toomba la. When the old clock strikes the hour of eleven, eleven skeletitos march in a procession. Toomba lock a toomba lock a toomba tomb. A toomba lock a toomba lock a toomba la. When the old clock strikes the hour of twelve, twelve skeletitos dance by themselves. Toomba lock a toomba lock a toomba tomb. A toomba lock a toomba lock a toomba la. Diesel's Devious Deed, and other Thomas the Tick Engine stories, based on the Railway series by the Reverend W. Audrey. Photographs by David Mitten and Terry Permain, for Britt Allcroft's production of Thomas the Tink Engine and Friends. Pop Goes the Diesel. Duck is very proud of being Great Western. He talks endlessly about it, but he works hard too and makes everything go like clockwork. It was a splendid day. The cars and coaches behaved well. The passengers even stopped grumbling, but the engines didn't like having to bustle about. There are two ways of doing things, Duck told them, the Great Western way or the wrong way. I'm Great Western and... Don't we know it, they groaned. The engines were glad when a visitor came. He purred smoothly towards them. Sir Topham Hat introduced him. Here is Diesel. I have agreed to give him a trial. He needs to learn. Please teach him, Duck. Good morning, purred Diesel in an oily voice. Pleased to meet you, Duck. Is that James and Henry and Gordon, too? 
I am delighted to meet such famous engines. The silly engines were flattered. He has very good manners, they murmured. We are pleased to have him in our yard. Duck had his doubts. Come on, he said. Diesel purred after him. You're worthy top. Sir Topham hat to you, ordered Duck. Diesel looked hurt. Your worthy Sir Topham hat thinks I need to learn. He is mistaken. We Diesels don't need to learn. We know everything. We come to a yard and improve it. We are revolutionary. Oh, said Duck. If you're Reva thing a gummy, perhaps you would collect my cars while I fetch Gordon's coaches. Diesel, delighted to show off, purred away. When Duck returned, Diesel was trying to take some cars from a siding. They were old and empty. They had not been touched for a long time. Diesel found them hard to move. Pull, push, backwards, forwards, rear, rear. The cars groaned. We can't, we won't. Duck watched with interest. Diesel lost patience. Grrr, he roared and gave a great heave. The cars jerked forward. Oh, we hear, oh, we hear. They screamed, we can't, we won't. Some of their brakes snapped and the gears jammed in the sleepers. Grrr. Ho, 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 chuckled Duck. Diesel recovered and tried to push the cars back, but they wouldn't move. Duck ran quietly round to collect the other cars. Thank you for arranging these, Diesel. I must go now. Don't you want this lot? No, thank you, Diesel gulped. And I've taken all this trouble. Why didn't you tell me? You never asked me. Besides, said Duck, you were having such fun being Rev whatever it was you said. Goodbye. <coughs> Diesel had to help the workmen clear the mess. He hated it. All the cars were laughing and singing at him. Cars are waiting in the yard. Tackling them with easel, show the world what I can do. Gaily boasts the diesel. In and out he creeps about like a big black weasel. When he pulls the wrong cars, out pop goes the diesel. Grrr, growled diesel and scuttled away to sulk in the shed. Diesel's Devious Deed Diesel, the new engine, was sulking. The freight cars would not stop singing rudely at him. Duck was horrified. Shut up, he ordered, and bumped them hard. I'm sorry our cars were rude to you, Diesel. Diesel was still furious. It's all your fault. You made them laugh at me. Nonsense, said Henry. Duck would never do that. We engines have our differences, but we never talk about them to the cars. That would be dis, dis, disgraceful, said Gordon. Disgusting, put in James. Despicable, finished Henry. Diesel hated Duck. He wanted him to be sent away, so he made a plan. He was going to tell lies about Duck. Next day, he spoke to the cars. I see you like jokes. You made a good joke about me yesterday. I laughed and laughed. Duck told me one about Gordon. I'll whisper it. Don't tell Gordon I told you. And he sniggered away. Ha ha ha, guffawed the cars. 
Gordon will be cross with Duck when he knows. Let's tell him and get back at Duck for bumping us. They laughed rudely at the engines as they went by. Soon, Gordon, Henry, and James found out why. Disgraceful, said Gordon. Disgusting, said James. Despicable, said Henry. We cannot allow it. They consulted together. Yes, they said. He did it to us. We'll do it to him and see how he likes it. Duck was tired out. The cars had been cheeky and troublesome. He wanted to rest in the shed. The three engines barred his way. Whoosh! Keep out! Stop fooling, said Duck. I'm tired. So are we, hissed the engines. We are tired of you. We like diesel. We don't like you. You tell tales about us to the cars. I don't. You do. I don't. You do. Sir Topham Hat came to stop the noise. Duck called me a galloping sausage, spluttered Gordon. Rusty red scrap iron, hissed James. I'm old square wheels, fumed Henry. Well, Duck... Duck considered. I only wish, sir, he said gravely, that I'd thought of those names myself, if the dome fits. He made cars laugh at us, accused the engines. Sir Topham Hat recovered. He'd been trying not to laugh himself. Did you duck? Certainly not, sir. No steam engine would be as mean as that. Diesel lurked up. Now, Diesel, you heard what Duck said. I can't understand it, sir, to think that Duck of all engines. I'm dreadfully grieved, sir, but know nothing. I see, said Sir Topham Hat. Diesel squirmed and hoped he didn't. I'm sorry, Duck, but you must go to Edward's station for a while. I know he will be glad to see you. As you wish, sir. Duck trundled sadly away while Diesel smirked with triumph. A close shave for Duck. Duck, the great western engine, puffed sadly to Edward Station. It's not fair, he complained. Diesel has been telling lies about me and made Sir Topham Hat and all the engines think I'm horrid. Edward smiled. I know you aren't, and so does Sir Topham Hat. You wait and see. Why don't you help me with these cars? Duck felt happier with Edward and set to work at once. The cars were silly, heavy, and noisy. The two engines had to work hard, pushing and pulling all afternoon. At last, they reached the top of the hill. Goodbye, whistled Duck, and rolled gently over the crossing to the other line. Duck loved coasting down the hill, running easily with the wind, whistling past. Suddenly, tweet! It was a conductor's warning whistle. Hurrah, 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 laughed the cars. We've broken away, we've broken away. Chase him, bump him, throw him off the rails, they yelled. Hurry, duck, hurry, said the driver. They raced through Edward Station, but the cars were catching up. As fast as we can, then they'll catch us gradually. The driver was gaining control. Another clear mile and we'll do it. Oh, glory, look at that. James was just pulling out of their line from the station ahead. Any minute there would be a crash. It's up to you now, Duck, cried the driver. Duck put every ounce of weight and steam against the cars. It's too late, Duck groaned and shut his eyes. He veered into a siding where a barber had set up shop. 
He was shaving a customer. Crash! The silly cars had knocked their conductor off his van and left him far behind after he had whistled a warning. But the cars didn't care. They were feeling very pleased with themselves. Beg pardon, sir, gasped Duck. Excuse my interruption. No, I won't, said the barber. You frightened my customers. I'll teach you. And he lathered Duck's face all over. Poor Duck. Thomas was helping to pull the cars away when Sir Topham Hat arrived. I do not like engines popping through my walls, fumed the barber. I appreciate your feelings, said Sir Topham Hat, but you must know that this engine and his crew have prevented a serious accident. It was a very close, um, shave. Oh, said the barber. Oh, excuse me. He filled a basin of water to wash Duck's face. I'm sorry. I didn't know you were being a brave engine. That's all right, sir. I didn't know that either. You were very brave indeed, said Sir Topham Hat. I'm proud of you. Sir Topham Hat watched the rescue operation. Then he had more news for Duck. And when you are properly washed and mended, you are coming home. Home, sir? Do you mean the yard? Of course. But, sir, they don't like me. They like Diesel. Not now. I never believed Diesel, so I sent him packing. The engines are sorry and want you back. A few days later, when he came home, there was a really rousing welcome for Duck, the great western engine. Wooly Bear In the summer, the work crews cut the long grass along the tracks, raking it into heaps to dry in the sun. At this time of year, Percy stops where they have been cutting. The men load up his empty wagons and he pulls them to the station. Toby then takes them to the hills for the farmers to feed their stock. Whish! Percy gave a ghostly whistle. Don't be frightened, Thomas, he laughed. It's only me. Your ugly fizz is enough to frighten anyone, said Thomas. You're like ugly indeed. I'm a green caterpillar with red stripes, continued Thomas firmly. You crawl like one too. I don't. Who's been late every afternoon this week? It's the hay. I can't help that, said Thomas. Time's time, and Sir Topham Hat relies on me to keep it. I can't if you crawl in the hay till all hours. Green caterpillar indeed, fumed Percy, as he set off to collect some hay to take to the harbor. Everyone says I'm handsome, or at least nearly everyone. Anyway, my curves are better than Thomas's corners. Thomas says I'm always late, he grumbled. I'm never late, or at least only a few minutes. What's that to Thomas? He can always catch up time farther on. All the same, he and his driver decided to start home early. Then came trouble. Crash! A crate of treacle was upset all over Percy. Percy was cross. He was still sticky when he puffed away. The wind was blowing fiercely. Look at that, exclaimed the driver. The wind caught the piled hay, tossing it up and over the track. The line climbed here. Take a run at it, Percy, his driver advised. Percy gathered speed, but the hay made the rails slippery and his wheels wouldn't grip. Time after time, he stalled with spinning wheels and had to wait until the line ahead was cleared 
before he could start again. Everyone was waiting. Thomas seethed impatiently. Ten minutes late. I warned him. Passengers will complain, and Sir Topham Hat. Then they all saw Percy. They laughed and shouted. Sorry I'm late, Percy panted. Look what's crawled out of the hay, teased Thomas. What's wrong? asked Percy. Talk about hairy caterpillars, puffed Thomas. It's worth being late to have seen you. When Percy got home, his driver showed him what he looked like in a mirror. Bust my buffers! No wonder they all laughed. I'm just like a woolly bear. Please clean me before Toby comes. But it was no good. Thomas told Toby all about it. Instead of talking about sensible things like playing ghosts, Thomas and Toby made jokes about woolly bear, caterpillars, and other creatures which crawl about in hay. They laughed a lot, but Percy thought they were really being very silly indeed. One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish by Dr. Seuss. From here to here, from here to there, funny things are everywhere. One fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. Black fish, blue fish, old fish, new fish. This one has a little star. This one has a little car. Say, what a lot of fish there are. Yes, some are red and some are blue. Some are old and some are new. Some are sad and some are glad. And some are very, very bad. Why are they sad and glad and bad? I do not know. Go ask your dad. Some are thin and some are fat. The fat one has a yellow hat. From there to here, from here to there, funny things are everywhere. Here are some who like to run. They run for fun in the hot, hot sun. Oh me, oh my. Oh me, oh my, what a lot of funny things to go by. Some have two feet and some have four. Some have six feet and some have more. Where do they come from? I can't say, but I bet they have come a long, long way. We see them come. We see them go. Some are fast and some are slow. Some are high and some are low. Not one of them is like another. Don't ask us why. Go ask your mother. Say, look at his fingers. One, two, three. How many fingers do I see? One, Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. He has eleven. Eleven. This is something new. I wish I had eleven too. Bump, bump, bump. Did you ever ride a wump? We have a wump with just one hump. But we know a man called Mr. Gump. Mr. Gump has a seven hump wump. So if you like to go bump bump, just jump on the hump of the wump of a gump. Who am I? My name is Ned. 
I do not like my little bed. This is no good. This is not right. My feet stick out of bed all night. And when I pull them in, oh dear, my head sticks out of bed up here. We like our bike. It is made for three. Our Mike sits up in back, you see. We like our Mike, and this is why. Mike does all the work when the hills get high. Hello there, Ned. How do you do? Tell me, tell me, what is new? How are things in your little bed? What is new? Please tell me, Ned. I do not like this bed at all. A lot of things have come to call. A cow, a dog, a cat, a mouse. Oh, what a bed. Oh, what a house. Oh dear, oh dear, I cannot hear. Will you please come over near? Will you please look in my ear? There must be something there, I fear. Say, look, a bird was in your ear. But he is out, so have no fear. Again, your ear can hear, my dear. My hat is old. My teeth are gold. I have a bird I like to hold. My shoe is off. My foot is cold. My shoe is off. My foot is cold. I have a bird I like to hold. My hat is old. My teeth are gold. And now my story is all told. We took a look. We saw a nook. On his head, he had a hook. On his hook, he had a book. On his book was how to cook. We saw him sit and try to cook. He took a look at the book on the hook. But a nook can't read, so a nook can't cook. So what good to a nook is a hook cookbook? The moon was out and we saw some sheep. We saw some sheep take a walk in their sleep. By the light of the moon, by the light of a star, they walked all night from near to far. I would never walk, I would take a car. I do not like this one so well. All he does is yell, yell, yell. I will not have this one about. When he comes in, I put him out. This one is quiet as a mouse. I like to have him in the house. At our house, we open cans. We have to open many cans, and that is why we have a Zans. A Zans for cans is very good. Have you a Zans for cans? You should. I like to box. How I like to box. So every day I box a gox. In yellow socks I box my gox. I box in yellow gox box socks. It is fun to sing. If you sing with a ying, my ying can sing like anything. I sing high and my ying sings low, and we are not too bad, you know. This one, I think, is called a yink. He likes to wink. He likes to drink. He likes to drink and drink and drink. The thing he likes to drink is ink. The ink he likes to drink is pink. He likes to wink and drink pink ink. So if you have a lot of ink, then you should get a yink, I think. Hop, 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 I am a yop. All I like to do is hop from finger top to finger top. I hop from left to right and then hop, hop, I hop right back again. I like to hop all day and night from right to left and left to right. Why do I like to hop, hop, hop? I do not know. Go ask your pop. Brush, 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 brush. Comb, 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 comb. Blue hair is fun to brush and comb. 
All girls who like to brush and comb should have a pet like this at home. Who is this pet? Say, he is wet. You never yet met a pet, I bet, as wet as they let this wet pet get. Did you ever fly a kite in bed? Did you ever walk with 10 cats on your head? Did you ever milk this kind of cow? Well, we can do it, we know how. If you never did, you should. These things are fun and fun is good. Hello, hello, are you there? Hello, I called you up to say hello. I said hello, can you hear me, Joe? Oh no, I cannot hear your call. I cannot hear your call at all. This is not good and I know why. A mouse has cut the wire, goodbye. From near to far, from here to there, funny things are everywhere. These yellow pets are called the Zeds. They have one hair upon their heads. Their hair grows fast, so fast they say. They need a haircut every day. Who am I? My name is Ish. On my hand I have a dish. I have this dish to help me wish. When I wish to make a wish, I wave my hand with a big swish swish. Then I say I wish for fish, and I get fish right on my dish. So, if you wish to wish a wish, you may swish for fish with my ish wish dish. At our house, we play out back. We play a game called Ring the Gack. Would you like to play this game? Come down, we have the only gack in town. Look what we found in the park, in the dark. We will take him home. We will call him Clark. He will live at our house. He will grow and grow. Will our mother like this? We don't know. And now, good night. It is time to sleep, so we will sleep with our pet Zeep. Today is gone, today was fun, tomorrow is another one. Every day from here to there, funny things are everywhere. Edward's Exploit, and other Thomas the Tank Engine stories, based on the Railway series by the Reverend W. Audrey. Photographs by David Mitten and Terry Permain. For Brit Allcross production of Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends. Donald and Douglas. Donald and Douglas are twins and had arrived from Scotland to help Sir Topham Hatt, but only one engine had been expected. The twins meant well, but did cause confusion. Sir Topham Hatt had given them numbers, Donald 9 and Douglas 10, but he was still planning to send one engine home. There was a brake van in the yard that had taken a dislike to Douglas. Things always went wrong when he had to take it out. His trains were late and he was blamed. Douglas began to worry. Donald, his twin, was angry. You're a muckle nuisance, said Donald. It's to leave you behind I'd be wanting. You can't, said the brake van. I'm essential. Och, are you? Donald burst out. You're nothing but a screeching and noise when all is said and done. Spite Dougie, would you? Take that. Oh, ooh, cried the van. 
There's more coming should you misbehave. The van behaved better after that. Until one day, Donald had an accident. The rails were slippery. He couldn't stop in time. Donald wasn't hurt, but Sir Topham Hatt was most annoyed. I am disappointed, Donald. I didn't expect such, um, clumsiness from you. I had decided to send Douglas back and keep you. I'm sorry, sir, said Donald. I should think so, too. You have upset my arrangements. Now James will have to help with the goods work while you have your tender mended. James won't like that. Sir Topham Hatt was right. James grumbled dreadfully about his extra work. Anyone would think, said Douglas, that Donald had his accident on purpose. I heard tell about an engine and some tar wagons. Shut up, said James. It's not funny. He didn't like to be reminded of his own accident. Well, well, well. Surely, James, it wasn't you. You didn't say. James didn't say. He slouched sulkily away. James is cross, snickered the spiteful brake van. We'll try to make him crosser still. Hold back, giggled the freight cars to each other. James did his best, but he was exhausted when they reached Edward's station. Luckily, Douglas was there. Help me up the hill, please, panted James. These freight cars are playing tricks. We'll show them, said Douglas. Slowly but surely, the snorting engines forced the freight cars up the hill. But James was losing steam. I can't do it! I can't do it! Leave it to me, shouted Douglas. The conductor was anxious. Go steady! The van's breaking! The van was in pieces. No one had been hurt, and soon Edward came to clear the mess. Sir Topham Hatt was on board. I might have known it would be Douglas, he said. Douglas was grand, sir, said Edward. James had no steam left, but Douglas worked hard enough for three. I heard him from my yard. Two would have been enough, said Sir Topham Hatt. I want to be fair, Douglas, but I don't know. I really don't know. Sir Topham Hatt was making up his mind about which engine to send away, but that's another story. The Deputation Snow came early to the island of Sodor. It was heavier than usual. Most engines hate snow. Donald and Douglas were used to it. Coupled back to back with a van between their tenders and a snowplow on their fronts, they set to work. They puffed backwards and forwards, patrolling the line. Generally, the snow slipped away easily but sometimes they found deeper drifts. Presently, they came to a drift which was larger than most. They charged it and were just backing for another try when... Help! Help! Losh sakes, Donald! It's Henry! Don't worry yourself, Henry. Wait a while. We'll have you out. Henry was very grateful. He saw all was not well. The twins were looking glum. They told him Sir Topham Hatt was making a decision. He'll send us away for sure. It's a shame, said Percy. A lot of nonsense about a broken signal box, grumbled Gordon. That spiteful brake van too, put in James. Good riddance, that's what I say. The twins were splendid in the snow, added Henry. 
It isn't fair. They all agreed that something must be done, but none of them knew what. Percy decided to talk to Edward about it. What you need, said Edward, is a deputation. He explained what that was. Percy ran back quickly. Edward says we need a depot station. Of course, said Gordon. The question is, what is a desperation? Asked Henry. It's when engines tell Sir Topham Hat something's wrong, said Percy. Did you say tell Sir Topham Hat? Asked Duck thoughtfully. There was a long silence. I propose, said Gordon, that Percy be our, er, hum, disputation. Me? squeaked Percy. I can't. Rubbish, Percy, said Henry. It's easy. That's settled then, said Gordon. Poor Percy wished it wasn't. Hello, Percy. It's nice to be back. Percy jumped. Er, y y yes, sir, please, sir. You look nervous, Percy. What's the matter? Please, sir, they've made me a desperation, sir, to speak to you, sir. I don't like it, sir. Sir Topham Hat pondered. Do you mean a deputation, Percy? Yes, sir, please, sir, it's Donald and Douglas. They say, sir, that if you send them away, sir, well, they'll be turned into scraps, sir. That would be dreadful, sir. Please, sir, don't send them away. Thank you, Percy, that will do. Later, Sir Topham Hatt spoke to the engines. I had a deputation. I understand your feelings and I've given a lot of thought to the matter. He paused impressively. Donald and Douglas, I hear that your work in the snow was good. You shall have a new coat of paint. The twins were surprised. Thank ye, sir. But your names will be painted on you. We'll have no more mistakes. Thank you, sir. Does this mean that both of us? Sir Topham Hatt smiled. It means, but the rest of his speech was drowned in delighted chorus of cheers and whistles. The twins were here to stay. The Diseasel Bill and Ben are tank engine twins. Each has four wheels, a tiny chimney and dome, and a small squat cab. Their freight cars are filled with china clay. It is needed for pottery, paper, paint, and many other things. The twins are now kept busy pulling the cars for engines on the main line and for ships in the harbor. One morning, they arranged some cars and went away for more. They returned to find them all gone. The twins were most surprised. Their drivers examined a patch of oil. That's diesel, they said. It's a whattle? asked Bill. A diseasel, I think, replied Ben. There's a notice about them in our shed. Coughs and sneezels spread diseasels. You had a cough in your smoke box yesterday. It's your fault the diseasel came. It isn't. It is. Stop arguing, you two, laughed their drivers. Let's go and rescue our freight cars. Bill and Ben were horrified. But the diseasel will magic us away like the freight cars. He won't magic us, replied their drivers. We'll more likely magic him. Listen, he doesn't know your twins, so we'll take away your names and numbers, and then this is what we'll do. Puffing hard, the twins set off on their journey to find the diesel. They were looking forward to playing tricks on him. 
Creeping into the yard, they found the diesel on a siding with the missing cars. Ben hid behind, but Bill went boldly alongside. The diesel looked up. Do you mind? Yes, said Bill. I do. I want my cars back. These are mine, said the diesel. Go away. Bill pretended to be frightened. You're a big bully, he whimpered. You'll be sorry. He ran back and hid behind the cars on the other side. Ben now came forward. Car stealer, hissed Ben. He ran away too. Bill took his place. This went on and on till the diesel's eyes nearly popped out. Stop, you're making me giddy. The two engines gazed at him. Are there two of you? Yes, we're twins. I might have known it. Just then, Edward bustled up. Bill and Ben, why are you playing here? We're not playing, protested Bill. We're rescuing our cars, squeaked Ben. Even you don't take our cars without asking, but this diesel did. There's no cause to be rude, said Edward severely. This engine is a Metropolitan Vickers Diesel Electric Type 2. The twins were most impressed. We're sorry, Mr. Er. Never mind, the diesel smiled. Call me Boko. I'm sorry I didn't understand about the cars. That's all right then, said Edward. Now off you go, Bill and Ben. Fetch Boko's cars, then you take this lot. There's no real harm in them, he said to Boko, but they're maddening at times. Boko chuckled. Maddening, he said, is the word. Edward's Exploit Bertie the bus was giving some visitors a tour of the island of Sodor. It was their last afternoon, and Edward was preparing to take them to meet Bill and Ben. He found it hard to start the heavy train. Did you see him straining? asked Henry. Positively painful, remarked James. Just pathetic, grunted Gordon. He should give up and be preserved before it's too late. Shut up, burst out Duck. You're all jealous. Edward's better than any of you. You're right, Duck, said Boko. Edward's old, but he'll surprise us all. I've done it. We're off. I've done it. We're off, said Edward as he finally puffed out of the station. Bill and Ben were delighted to see the visitors. They loved being photographed. Later, they took the party to the China Clay Works in a brake van special. Everyone had a splendid time, and the visitors were most impressed. Then Edward took the visitors home. On the way, the weather changed. Wind and rain buffeted Edward. His sanding gear failed, and his firemen rode in front, dropping sand on the rails by hand. Suddenly, Edward's wheels slipped fiercely, and with a shrieking crack, something broke. The crew inspected the damage. Repairs took some time. One of your crank pins broke, Edward, said his driver. We've taken your side rods off. Now you're like an old fashioned engine. Can you get these people home? They must start back tonight. I'll try, sir, promised Edward. Edward puffed and pulled his hardest, but his wheels kept slipping and he could not start the heavy train. The passengers were anxious. The driver, fireman, and conductor went along the train, 
making adjustments between the coaches. We've loosened the couplings, Edward. Now you can pick your coaches up one by one, just as you do with freight cars. That'll be much easier, said Edward. Come on. He puffed and moved cautiously forward. The first coach moving helped to start the second, and the second helped the third. I've done it, I've done it, puffed Edward. Steady, boy, warned his driver. Well done, boy, you've got them, you've got them. And he listened happily to Edward's steady beat as he forged slowly but surely ahead. At last, battered, weary, but unbeaten, Edward steamed in. Henry was waiting for the visitors with the special train. Peep, peep! Sir Topham Hat angrily pointed to the clock, but excited passengers cheered and thanked Edward, his driver, and fireman. Duck and Boko saw to it that Edward was left in peace. Gordon and James remained respectfully silent. Green Eggs and Ham by Dr. Seuss. I am Sam. I am Sam. Sam I am. That Sam I am. That Sam I am. I do not like that Sam I am. Do you like green eggs and ham? I do not like them, Sam I am. I do not like green eggs and ham. Would you like them here or there? I would not like them here or there. I would not like them anywhere. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam I am. Would you like them in a house? Would you like them? with a mouse? I do not like them in a house. I do not like them with a mouse. I do not like them here or there. I do not like them anywhere. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam I am. Would you eat them in a box? Would you eat them with a fox? Not in a box, not with a fox. Not in a house, not with a mouse. I would not eat them here or there. I would not eat them anywhere. I would not eat green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam I am. Would you, could you, in a car? Eat them, eat them, here they are. I would not, could not in a car. You may like them. You will see, you may like them in a tree. I would not, could not in a tree, not in a car. You let me be. I do not like them in a box. I do not like them with a fox. I do not like them in a house. I do not like them with a mouse. I do not like them here or there. I do not like them anywhere. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam I am. A train, a train, a train, a train. Could you, would you, on a train? Not on a train, not in a tree, not in a car. Sam, let me be. I would not, could not in a box. I could not, would not with a fox. I will not eat them with a mouse. I will not eat them in a house. I will not eat them here or there. I will not eat them anywhere. I do not eat green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam I am. Say, 
In the dark? Here, in the dark? Would you, could you, in the dark? I would not, could not, in the dark. Would you, could you, in the rain? I would not, could not, in the rain. Not in the dark, not on a train, not in a car, not in a tree. I do not like them, Sam, you see. Not in a house, not in a box, not with a mouse, not with a fox. I will not eat them here or there. I do not like them anywhere. You do not like green eggs and ham? I do not like them, Sam I am. Could you, would you, with a goat? I would not, could not, with a goat. Would you, could you, on a boat? I could not, would not, on a boat. I will not, will not, with a goat. I will not eat them in the rain. I will not eat them on a train. Not in the dark, not in a tree, not in a car. You let me be. I do not like them in a box. I do not like them with a fox. I will not eat them in a house. I do not like them with a mouse. I do not like them here or there. I do not like them anywhere. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam I am. You do not like them, so you say. Try them, try them, and you may. Try them and you may, I say. Sam, if you will let me be, I will try them, you will see. Say, I like green eggs and ham. I do. I like them, Sam I am, and I would eat them in a boat, and I would eat them with a goat. And I will eat them in the rain, and in the dark, and on a train, and in a car, and in a tree. They are so good, so good, you see. So I will eat them in a box, and I will eat them with a fox, and I will eat them in a house, and I will eat them with a mouse, and I will eat them here and there. Say, I will eat them anywhere. I do so like green eggs and ham. Thank you. Thank you, Sam I am. El Barrio by Debbie Chocolate, illustrated by David Diaz. This is El Barrio, my home in the city, with its rain-washed murals and sparkling graffiti. El Barrio is Spanish Harlem, Humboldt Park, and Tar Beach Parties. El Barrio is where Nativity Parades, Cinco de Mayo, and Day of the Dead explode into big holidays. Feliz Navidad! El Barrio is a quinceanera party. My sister turns 15 today. And a swollen birthday piñata, bursting with candy treasure. El Barrio is where my cousins come from lots of different lands. Mexico, Colombia, Puerto Rico, and Cuba. And where on Sundays, Aztec eyes and Mayan faces go to La Iglesia to pray. This is a picture of my sister on her first communion. El Barrio is silver-streaked tenements, neon city streets, 
storefront churches, and bodegas that never sleep. El barrio is where sometimes at night, grandfather plays a soft bolero on his guitar. He sings to me and my sister of the olden days. This Rosario once belonged to my grandmother. Now it belongs to my sister. El Barrio is a shimmering cold hydrant spray on a hot summer day. Vegetable gardens instead of lawns and brightly colored houses that look like villages. El Barrio is our Lady of Guadalupe candles, syrupy sweet churros, ice cold paletas, and a lemon yellow fire escape as tall as a city skyscraper. El Barrio is a quinceanera mass, a chiffon dress, a bouquet of roses for Our Lady of Guadalupe's brown hands. Poppy places a glittering corona on my sister's head. El barrio is a heartbeat. Shh, listen. It's the sound of blaring trumpets, tejano and salsa music tickling my feet. The mariachis play at all the quinceaneras in my neighborhood. El Barrio is a quinceanera waltz. My sister gliding across the floor with Papi, whose heart is filled with pride and love. Today, my beautiful sister looks all grown up. El Barrio is where my grandparents, dancing to a slow ranchera at dusk, bring the crowd to their feet. On this special day, my sister gives her baby dolls away to the little girls at her quinceanera. El Barrio is where my sister whispers in my ear, you made my quinceanera special just by being here. This is El Barrio, my home in the city. Fletcher and the Falling Leaves by Julia Rawlinson, pictures by Tiffany Beek. The world was changing. Each morning, when Fletcher bounded out of the den, everything seemed just a little bit different. The rich green of the forest was turning to a dusty gold, and the soft swishing sound of summer was fading to a crinkly whisper. Fletcher's favorite tree looked dull, dry, and brown. Fletcher was beginning to get worried. I think my tree is sick, said Fletcher. What's wrong with it? His mother asked. Its leaves are turning brown, said Fletcher. Don't worry, it's only autumn, she said. Fletcher ran back to his tree and patted the rough bark. Don't worry, it's only autumn, he said. You'll be feeling better soon. But the tree didn't get better. Each day, more leaves turned brown. One morning, the wind blew a small brown leaf off a branch. Fletcher jumped up and caught it very gently in his paw. Don't worry, tree. I've got your leaf. I'll fix you.
Fletcher looked around, picked a piece of grass, and carefully tied the leaf to a branch. Just then, another gust of wind ruffled Fletcher's fur. The little leaf shook itself free and fluttered back to the ground. Fletcher picked it up again and thought very hard. Then he poked the leaf onto a twig and pushed it down firmly. Now you hold on tight, said Fletcher. No more flying around. The little leaf gave a tiny rustle in reply. The next day, a strong wind was blowing through the forest. Fletcher rushed out of the den and ran all the way to his tree. Lots of branches were bare, and the little lost leaves spun everywhere. Don't worry, tree. I'll catch them for you, I promise. Round and round and round whirled Fletcher after the swirling leaves. Wonderful! Just what I need for my nest, said a squirrel. But these belong to the tree, said Fletcher. Don't take them away. The tree doesn't need them anymore, said the squirrel, bounding off. Help! Help! The wind and the squirrel are stealing our leaves, cried Fletcher. Leaves! Terrific! Just what I need to keep warm, said a porcupine, rolling around. But these belong to the tree, said Fletcher, plucking leaves from the porcupine's needles. Not anymore, snuffled the porcupine, and away he rolled. Help! Help! The wind, the squirrel, and the porcupine are stealing our leaves! cried Fletcher. Suddenly, a flock of friendly birds swooped down from the sky. They picked up the leaves in their beaks and poked them onto the tree's branches. Soon, the tree was leafy again, and Fletcher flopped down and smiled. Thank you, birds, thank you, he gasped as the birds fluttered away. He lay looking up through the leaves at the sky and drifted off to sleep. But the wind continued to blow and the branches still danced. The leaves shivered and shook themselves and began to wriggle free. They tossed and turned and twitched and twirled and tumbled to the ground. They brushed Fletcher's ears and nose and filled his dreams with a whispering sound. When Fletcher finally woke up, he couldn't believe his eyes. Instead of a roof of dancing leaves, all he could see were bare branches against the sky. Oh, tree, I am so sorry, gulped Fletcher. All your leaves are gone. But then he saw, high in the branches, one small leaf still holding on. I won't let the wind steal that one, said Fletcher, and he began to climb. He crawled along to the last leaf and held it firmly onto its branch. All day long, the wind blew the branch bounced, and Fletcher held tight. I'll stay with you, Leaf, he said. Don't worry. But then, with a sudden whoosh of wind, the branch bounced high. With a plip, the leaf let go and fluttered like a little flag clutched in Fletcher's paw. Fletcher looked sadly at the leaf he had promised to save. He carried it carefully down the tree and back to the den. 
He made a cozy little bed for it and gently tucked it in. But all night long, he could only think of his tree, all on its own. At dawn, Fletcher tiptoed outside. The wind had finally stopped blowing and the air was cold. The moon still hung in the clear sky and pale stars glimmered. As he came to his favorite tree, Fletcher saw a magical sight. The tree was hung with a thousand icicles, shining silver in the early light. You are more beautiful than ever, whispered Fletcher. But are you all right? A tiny breeze shivered the branches, making a sound like laughter. And in the light of the rising sun, the sparkling branches nodded. Fletcher gave his tree a hug. Then he went back to the den for a nice warm breakfast. Frankie Stein Starts School by Lola M. Schaefer, illustrated by Kevin Atberry. One beautiful day, Frankie Stein came into the world. His parents, Mr. and Mrs. Stein, stood and stared. Their son didn't look like them. He didn't act like them, but as he grew, Frankie's clean-cut looks made him the scariest Stein of all. And then came the day when he was ready to start school. Frankie Stein stood on the steps of Miss Wart's Academy for Ghouls and Goblins. He had been waiting for this night for a long time. Frankie waved goodbye to his family and rushed inside. During story hour, Miss Wart read a book about ghosts. Frankie scooted close so he could see and hear the scary parts. Ew! howled Wilma, pointing to Frankie. I'm not sitting next to him. He looks weird. During math, Frankie counted teeth. Look, Goldilocks knows his numbers, said Skelly. Stop making fun, said Frankie. I can't concentrate. During art class, Frankie painted monsters. Vinny swooped near and asked, are you going to sign your picture, pretty boy, Stein? The class pointed at Frankie and laughed. Cut it out, yelled Frankie. Why don't you leave me alone? Because we don't like you, said Vinny. Yeah, said Skelly. You don't look like us. So what, said Frankie. I can still be scary, even scarier than you. What do you mean? They all shouted. Watch and find out, said Frankie. Time for reading, said Miss Wart. Frankie sat and read How to Be Gross. Then he twisted and contorted his face up, down, sideways, and around. Grotesque, shouted Miss Wart, and she gave Frankie a black star. Time for coloring, said Miss Wart. 
Frankie picked up the glow-in-the-dark chalks. He colored his face purple, his lips orange, his fingers yellow, and his nails black. Bone-chilling, shouted Skelly. Everyone nodded. Time to listen to scary sounds, said Miss Wart. Frankie listened to coyote calls, then stretched his neck and yelped so loudly that the windows shook and Miss Wart's teeth fell out. Ear shattering, howled Wilma. Everyone clapped and followed Frankie to the science corner. Frankie mixed a potion that burbled and gurgled. He took a big gulp and grew two long fangs. Blood curdling, shouted Vinnie. Everyone cheered and faster than lightning bolts, the class dashed around the classroom, becoming scarier and scarier. When school was over, Frankie rushed out of Miss Wart's Academy of Ghouls and Goblins. How was your first night of school, son? asked Mr. Frankenstein. Ghoulish, said Frankie. I heard scary stories, counted teeth, painted a monster, and yelped like a coyote. What did you like best? asked Mrs. Frankenstein. Friends, said Frankie. I made a lot of new frightening friends. That's our Frankie, said Mr. and Mrs. Frankenstein. A scary monster indeed. As the sun rose, Frankie Stein waved goodbye and stomped home with his family. Frankie Stein by Lola M. Schaefer, illustrated by Kevin Atterbury. Frankie Stein came into the world on a bright, sunny day. Our son, announced his proud parents, and they rushed to his side. Oh my, said his mother, he's cute. Why doesn't he look scary like us? asked his father. I don't know, said his mother, but with our help, I'm sure he will. Mr. and Mrs. Frank N. Stein showered their son with scariness. They made faces at him. They shouted, boo and gotcha and every night they read him stories by candlelight. Little Red Rotten Hood. One day, while feeding Frankie, his father was shocked to see a lock of sun gold hair. What's this? he asked. Oh, I can take care of that, said his mother. When Frankie got his first tooth, it was white. What's this? asked his mother. I can take care of that, said his father. During a game of peekaboo, Frankie's face shone pink and smooth. We can take care of that, said his parents. Little by little, Frankie began to look like a stein. I'm starting to see a resemblance, said his mother. Yes, but he still isn't all that scary, said his father. 
That's true, said his mother, but at least Frankie can act scary like us. Indeed, said his father. Mrs. Frankenstein taught Frankie how to walk. Hold your arms out straight, said his mother. Frankie did. Now take big, slow steps, she said, like this. Frankie tried. He really did. But his walk was more of a bounce. Mr. Frankenstein taught Frankie how to moan. Open your mouth wide, said his father. Frankie did. Now groan long and loud, he said, like this. Oh! Frankie tried. He really did. But his moan was more of a squeak. Ooh! Ooh! Well, Frankie might not have all our scary looks, said his mother. And he might not act scary like us, said his father. But he is a Stein, they said. Maybe he just needs a little inspiration. That night, Frankie's mother and father pulled the family tree from the closet. This is your Uncle Franklin, said Mr. Frankenstein to his son. His laugh turns men to stone. Frankie chuckled. Here is your great granddaddy, Frank the Gripper, said Mrs. Frankenstein. He can hold the attention of an entire town. Frankie flexed his muscles. And this is your grandmother, Frances, said Mr. and Mrs. Frankenstein. She's always full of surprises, said his mother. Frankie raised his eyebrows. So, you see, son, said Frankie's father, you come from a long line of steins, each one different but scary. Indeed, said Frankie, studying each family member, and I'll be scary too. Just wait and see. For the next few weeks, Frankie stayed in his room and practiced scary. Frankie tried and tried, but he just couldn't look or act like his parents. Instead, Frankie decided on his own kind of scary. Early one morning, Frankie made a grand appearance. Well, what do you think? He asked his parents. Horrifying, yelled his mother and father. They threw their hands in front of their faces. If you think that's scary, said Frankie, watch this. He wrapped his arms around his parents and hugged them tight. Spine tingling blurted Mr. and Mrs. Frankenstein between gasps. Then Frankie leaned close and gave them each a big lip-smacking kiss. Mr. and Mrs. Frankenstein clutched their hearts. Scary! They shrieked and they fainted dead away. From that day forward, Frankie Stein was considered the scariest Stein of all. Until Francie Stein came into the world. From Seed to Pumpkin by Wendy Pfeffer, illustrated by James Graham Hale.
When spring winds warm the earth, a farmer plants hundreds of pumpkin seeds. Every pumpkin seed can become a baby pumpkin plant. Underground, covered with dark, moist soil, the baby plants begin to grow. As the plants get bigger, the seeds crack open. Stems sprout up. Roots dig down. Inside the roots are tubes. Water travels up these tubes the way juice goes up a straw. In less than two weeks from planting time, green shoots poke up through the earth. These shoots grow into tiny seedlings. Two leaves, called seed leaves, uncurl on each stem. They reach up toward the sun. Sunlight gives these leaves energy to make food. Like us, plants need food to grow. But green plants do not eat food as we do. Their leaves make it. To make food, plants need light, water, and air. Leaves catch the sunlight. Roots soak up rainwater. And little openings in the leaves let air in. Using energy from the sun, the leaves mix the air with water from the soil to make sugar. This feeds the plant. Soon, broad prickly leaves with jagged edges unfold on the stems. The new leaves are rough and prickly, but the seed leaves are smooth and round. The seed leaves dry up. Now the new leaves make food for the pumpkin plant. Each pumpkin stem has many sets of tubes. One tube in each set takes water from the soil up to the leaves so they can make sugar. The other tube in each set sends food back down so the pumpkin can grow. The days grow warmer. The farmer tends the pumpkin patch to keep weeds out. Weeds take water from the soil. Pumpkin plants need that water to grow. Pumpkin plants don't stand up tall. As the stem grows longer, they sprawl all around the ground. Before long, twisted, tangled vines cover the pumpkin patch. Soon, flower buds appear on the vines. After each bud opens, its orange petals grow bigger and bigger. They look like bright orange umbrellas. During the heat of the day, the flowers close. They open again during the cool nights and early mornings. The bright orange flowers attract swarms of bees. The bees buzz about, carrying yellow pollen from the male flowers to the female flowers. Now pumpkins can grow. The petals wither away. Where the flowers bloomed, tiny hard fruits begin to grow. Hundreds of these cling to the vines. The days grow hot. All summer, the warm sun and the cool rain help the tiny fruits grow larger and larger. Soon, summer is over. The corn stalks next to the pumpkin patch turn brown. Leaves on trees turn red, orange, and yellow. Pumpkins change color too. As they ripen, they change from green to yellow, then to orange. In just four months, small, flat, white pumpkin seeds have grown into big, fat, orange pumpkins. The pumpkins are ripe and round with lumps and bumps. They come in all sizes and shapes and they're waiting in the autumn sun. 
Some pumpkins will be carved into jack-o'-lanterns for Halloween. Some will be baked into pumpkin pies for Thanksgiving. Colorful leaves turn brown. Winter winds begin to blow and soon the trees are bare. The farmer looks out over the pumpkin patch where only a few dead vines remain. But when spring winds warm the earth, once again he will plant hundreds of pumpkin seeds. And once again, they will grow from seed to pumpkin. A gift for Abuelita, celebrating the Day of the Dead. By Nancy Lewin, illustrated by Robert Chapman. Rosita and her grandmother spent every day together. Her mother was very busy, but Abuelita always had time for Rosita. Mira, Rosita, look! Her grandmother said. She held up three strands of yarn. Each takes a turn crossing over the other. One strand alone can be broken, but when they are woven together, they make a cord that is strong, like my love for you and your love for me. With patient hands, she taught Rosita how to braid. One morning, they made up a song about making tortillas. What do my hands say? Pla, pla, pla. What does the pawn say? Saw, saw, saw. What does my mouth say? Da, da, da. Dame mas tortillas. They laughed as they stacked up the finished tortillas. Abuelita scolded the day she discovered Rosita pulling up plants in the garden. I'm weeding, protested Rosita. Those are not weeds, replied Abuelita. She showed Rosita what to pull and what to save. These little plants are chiles. We will harvest them together. This year, you can help me make salsa. Rosita was pleased. She liked helping her grandmother cook. Then Abuelita got sick. Soon she was too weak to work in the garden. Rosita sat by her grandmother's bed, braiding and telling her stories. The chiles are fat now, she told Abuelita. When you are well, we will pick them together. But before the chiles could ripen, Abuelita died. Rosita missed her very much. She missed the soap scent of Abuelita's everyday dress and the pla, pla, pla of her hands shaping dough for tortillas. She missed the strong warmth of her grandmother's arms. She wanted to hear Abuelita's voice whisper, Good night. Abuelita is in heaven with the angels, Mama, told Rosita at bedtime. She will watch over you while you are sleeping. Rosita did not want Abuelita to be with the angels. She wanted her at home. We need Abuelita here, Rosita told Abuelo in October. Her grandfather nodded. His brown eyes glistened. Yes, he said, I miss her too. You can show Abuelita how much you miss her, mija. Make her a gift for when she visits us on the Day of the Dead. On the Day of the Dead, families remember the people they love who have died. Each family makes an ofrenda at an altar 
to welcome the dead. Everybody makes gifts for the altar. But what can I make? Rosita wondered. What are you making? She asked her brother Carlos just before the holidays. Is it a gift for the altar? Yes, said Carlos, a lizard for Tio Antonio. He always liked lizards. Rosita's father was in the marigold garden. What are you making? She asked him. A harvest of flowers for the altar and graves. Abuelo Leon loved these flowers. Rosita found her mother in the kitchen. What are you making? She asked her. Chicken and mole for Tia Dolores. It was her favorite. What are you making? Rosita asked Abuelo. Is it for mi abuelita? Yes, I am weaving this blanket to keep her soul warm. Rosita remembered something she knew how to do. She asked Abuelo for three long strands of yarn. Then she sat near his loom in the courtyard and started to braid. She braided the following morning as well when her family went to the market. They sold some flowers and bought candles and incense, apples and bread of the dead. What a beautiful braid, said the woman who sold them the bread. Gracias, but it isn't finished yet, said Rosita. All the way home on the bus, Rosita worked on her braid. The cord reached from the tips of her fingers past her elbow. That afternoon, Rosita's family prepared the ofrenda. Mama and Rosita brought food from the kitchen, tortillas and chicken and brown mole sauce. Rosita helped her mother light a candle for each soul they were remembering. One for your tío Antonio. And one for Abuelo Leon, said Mama. One for my Tia Dolores. And one for our dear Abuelita. Then everyone added their gifts to the altar. Everyone except Rosita. Where is your braid? asked Mama. It isn't finished yet, Rosita said. All afternoon, friends came to visit, bringing their gifts for the dead. As each person arrived, Rosita stopped braiding and hurried to greet them. Abuelita never came. When will I see her? Rosita asked Carlos. Silly, he said. You won't be able to see her. Spirits are invisible. If spirits are invisible... Rosita asked Papa, how will I know Abuelita is here? You will feel that she is near, said Papa. How will it feel? Rosita wondered as she braided her cord. More friends arrived in the evening, but Abuelita didn't come. Where is Abuelita? Rosita asked Papa. Why didn't she come? It is a long way from heaven, he said. Perhaps she will be at the graveyard tomorrow. The next day, Rosita and her family went to the graveyard. They pulled weeds and washed the gravestones. When the graves looked beautiful and new again, they spread out a picnic. As they ate, they told stories of the people they remembered. Will Abuelita be here soon? Rosita asked. Think of all the things you loved about Abuelita, Mama suggested. Then she will know where to find you. Rosita braided her cord and remembered. She remembered her grandmother's husky old voice when she sang this song about making tortillas. She remembered the tales Abuelita told while she cooked chiles for salsa. Rosita braided, 
remembering all she had loved. As twilight deepened, she finished her braid. It was as tall as she was. Rosita sat by her grandmother's grave, stroking the cord with her fingers. In it, she had braided the things she remembered. The scent of her grandmother's dress, the pla, pla, pla of her hands on the tortillas, her songs and her scolding, her tales and the taste of her salsa. Closing her eyes, Rosita began to feel warm, as if she were safe in her grandmother's arms. Soft wings brushed her face like a kiss. Then in her heart, a husky voice whispered, Buenos noches, Rosita. Oh, Abuelita, you came. Mira, I made this for you. She laid her gift over the grave, and she knew that, like the braid, the cord of their love was too strong to be broken. Gustavo the Shy Ghost by Flavia Z. Drago Gustavo was a ghost. He enjoyed doing the normal things that paranormal beings do, passing through walls, making objects fly, and glowing in the dark. But there was nothing in the world that he loved more than playing the violin. Well, almost nothing. Gustavo was secretly in love with Alma, the prettiest monster in town, but he also had a problem. You see, Gustavo was so shy that some things felt incredibly difficult for him. And the worst part of it, Making friends was terrifying. Gustavo had never dared to speak to any of the other monsters. He tried getting close to them in many different ways. But even when he was right in front of them, they just couldn't see him. Gustavo longed to be a part of something. More than anything, he wanted to make a friend. I have to be brave. I have to let the others see me, he thought. So he decided to send a letter, a very special one. Dear Monsters, I would like to invite you to my violin concert which will take place at the Day of the Dead party, next full moon at the cemetery. I would be thrilled to see you there. Gustavo the Ghost. As the days went by, Gustavo couldn't stop thinking. What if no one shows up? What if they don't like my music? What if they don't like me? Except tonight, was the night, and this time he couldn't hide. But not a soul had come. So, all alone, Gustavo did what he loved most, and the music made him happy, so happy that he glowed. Oh, how he glowed! Gustavo! We're so sorry we're late. We wanted to get you flowers, but we got lost instead. And then we heard your music. 
and we saw your glow. We really loved your concert. Would you like to hang out with us? From that moment on, Gustavo's life changed and everyone discovered that even if he didn't talk much, he was the best at helping and protecting his friends. But mostly, Gustavo never stopped surprising them. And they never stopped loving him. That's my monster! Written by Amanda Knoll, illustrated by Howard McWilliam. Tonight, when I looked under the bed for my monster, I found this note instead. So long, kid. Gotta go. Someone needs me more than you do. Gabe. What? Gabe was my monster! Nobody needed him more than me. But someone sure did need a monster. My little sister, Emma. Now that Emma slept in a toddler bed, she liked to climb out, roam the house, and play noisy games at night. I knew a monster would keep her in bed so she could fall asleep, but not... My monster, I had to get Gabe back. I tiptoed across the hall to Emma's room. She wasn't even there. But Gabe was. I gulped, zoomed across the carpet, and leaped onto Emma's bed before Gabe could grab my toes. Gabe, I whispered. Please go back to our room. I'll get Emma to sleep. You, he snorted, you're gonna get her to sleep. Ha, ah, that's a good one. But you know what? I like you, kid. So I'll give you three chances. If she's not asleep, I'll be back. And Gabe was gone. Just then, Emma toddled into the room. She clearly needed a monster. Maybe she didn't know how to get one, but I did. Hey, Emma, I said, let's play. Can you knock on the floor? Emma knocked with a dinosaur. It worked. I heard some creaking under Emma's bed. Then something sniffled. It squelched and dripped. So far, so good, I thought. This monster sounds scary enough for Emma. But Emma kept on playing. A slime-covered monster slid out. It oozed towards Emma. She laughed, wiping one of the monster's noses. Icky wipe! Emma wasn't scared at all. Excuse me, I said to the mucus monster. I uh, didn't catch your name. My dabe is Agatha, she said through stuffed noses. Type for bed, Ebba. Emma giggled and wiped some more. I knew this wouldn't work. Thanks, Agatha. Nice try. But I think we need a monster with claws. Agatha snuffled, and then she was gone. Emma! I coaxed again. Knock, knock. She knocked on the floor with a teapot this time, and I heard more creaking. Then a slippery tail 
slithered out from under the bed. The second monster rasped, I'm Cynthia. Much better, I thought, when I saw the jagged claws. Cynthia might be the perfect monster for Emma. But Emma blinked and said, Pretty! Then she decorated Cynthia's tail with bracelets. Ugh, Cynthia snarled. I'm not here to play dress up. I'm here to scare you into bed. Cynthia rattled loudly, but Emma danced to the beat. I'm sorry, Cynthia, I said. This isn't going to work. Well, I never, she sniffed, and then she was gone. Cynthia, come back, Emma demanded, stomping on the floor. Excellent, I thought. Maybe that would summon the perfect monster for Emma. Tentacles swarmed from under the bed, and an icy voice called, Ooh! I shrank back in horror, but Emma was enchanted. Who's out of bed? The monster continued, Come to Vla A Ademir. Emma high fived one of the tentacles, and the third monster emerged. I already had doubts about this one, but he was my last chance. Vladimir, I asked, can you get Emma to sleep? Yes, he hissed, reaching for Emma. I can get her. Emma giggled and hopped over the tentacles like jump ropes. Oh no, I blurted. She's not supposed to be having fun. This'll never work. Vlad's tentacles drooped. He slunk under the bed and he was gone. Sorry, Vlad, I called. Boy, was I sorry. I was about to lose Gabe forever. Now Emma was coloring and singing. Blah, blah, mir, blah, blah, Cynthia, ya, ya, agafa, fa, fa. Gabe must have heard her because he was back. That's it, kid, he grunted. You had your three tries. Now? It's my turn. Gabe's green ooze sizzled across the floor as he growled, Put the crayon down. Emma peered at my hulking, sharp-clawed monster and said, Fuzzy! Hey, Gabe, I cheered. Emma isn't afraid of you. What? Gabe burst out from under the bed and loomed over Emma. Steam spurted from his ears. Get into bed, Gabe thundered. Emma hopped up, but she kept singing, Fuzzy, fuzzy monster. Gabe, I said. Emma's not scared enough to fall asleep. Please, let's go back to our room. No can do, kid, Gabe growled. I may not be the perfect monster for Emma, but I'm the best so far. At least she's in bed now. I gotta stay here. You're on your own. I knew Emma needed Gabe, but he was my monster. How was I ever going to get to sleep without him? Just then, we heard a tiny noise. <coughs> Emma froze. Gabe and I peered under the bed. 
Bella, what are you doing here? Gabe asked. Hi, Gabe, Stella said, tugging on her tutu. You forgot, hick, your snack. Mama thought, hick, you'd be hungry, so she, hick, sent this. Who knew? Gabe had a little sister, too. I thought Stella's hiccups were cute, but Emma obviously didn't. Stella sure noticed. She tiptoed closer, hiccuping with every step. Hick! 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 From under her covers, Emma squeaked, Shoo! Shoo? Stella repeated, Oh, shoo! That's where toes go. I love toes! Stella crept toward Emma's feet. Emma squealed, scrunched in her feet, and giggled. No toes! No toes! Gabe laughed. Stella, it looks like you're the perfect monster for Emma. Now, if you don't mind, you can get her to sleep while I get back to what I do best. Stella nodded. Hick! I sighed with relief and switched off Emma's lamp. Then I ran to my room, leaped into my bed, and scrunched in my feet so Gabe couldn't get them. I shivered happily. Emma had Stella, I had Gabe, everything was back to normal. I shivered again. We'd all be asleep in no time. Holiday History Day of the Dead by Claudia Oviedo Chapter 1 Celebrating the Dead Thousands of years ago, many people lived in what is now Mexico. The Aztecs were one group who lived here. Tenochtitlan was the center of their empire. The Aztecs believed death was part of the cycle of life. They celebrated it. Skulls were symbols of death. They put out food, water, and tools for the dead. Why? They believed these helped souls on their journey to the land of the dead. This was their final resting place. At this time, many people in Spain were Catholic. On November 1st, they celebrated Saints on All Saints Day. On November 2nd, they celebrated the Dead on All Souls Day. They visited graves. People brought drinks, bread, flowers, and candles. In the 1500s, Spanish conquerors came to Mexico. Catholic and Aztec traditions mixed. This is how Day of the Dead formed. This holiday is celebrated on November 1st and 2nd. Families and friends gather. They invite the souls of loved ones who have died to visit the land of the living. It is a celebration. What do you think? Day of the Dead combines traditions from different cultures. What traditions do you practice? Do you know what cultures they come from? Chapter 2 Day of the Dead Traditions Day of the Dead is a colorful holiday. Yellow, orange, red, purple, pink, white, and black are common. Skulls are still an important symbol. People decorate sugar skulls. They are made from sugar. Skeletons are another common symbol. The most famous is La Catrina. 
She wears a fancy hat. People dress up like her for parades and festivals. People decorate with papel picado. These paper banners are colorful. They have detailed patterns. People hang them at festivals and other celebrations. They also place them on altars. Did you know? Marigolds are another symbol of this holiday. The smell helps souls find their way back to the land of the living. People also make these flowers out of paper. People visit cemeteries. They tell stories. They clean up graves. They set up altars in cemeteries or at home. They place offerings on the altars. Take a look. What are some common altar offerings? Take a look. Belongings, such as toys, books, photos, or other items of importance to the dead. Calaveras de azúcar, decorated sugar skulls. Candles, to light the way for souls. Marigolds, favorite meals to feed the souls. Pan de muerto, bread decorated with dried fruit and colored sugar. Papel picado, colorful paper cut into fancy patterns. Water, to give souls something to drink. Chapter 3 Day of the Dead Around the World Day of the Dead is celebrated in many places. In Mexico, people celebrate at home. They also celebrate in cemeteries with music and dancing. Some cities have festivals or parades. In the United States, some communities and schools celebrate. People set up altars. Kids learn how to cut papel picado. Others decorate sugar skulls. Celebrations around the world honor the dead on November 2nd. In Guatemala, people fly big kites. Why? These are thought to scare away bad spirits. In El Salvador, people dress up as characters from myths. Day of the Dead is more popular than ever. People gather, they honor the dead, they enjoy colorful flowers, sugar skulls, and food. They watch skeletons dance in parades. Do you celebrate Day of the Dead? If not, would you like to? What do you think? Day of the Dead honors and celebrates people who have died. Do you think this is important? Why or why not? How do apples grow? By Betsy Maestro, illustrated by Julio Maestro. When you bite into a juicy apple, you're eating part of a flower. Fruit comes from flowers. In winter, an apple tree is bare. It's hard to imagine it covered with flowers or fruit. But even in the cold and snow, Tiny leaf buds and flower buds are waiting to open. Inside each leaf bud are tiny curled up leaves. Inside each flower bud are all the parts of an apple flower. Buds. Apple flowers are pink and white and sweet to smell. And each flower is the beginning of an apple. When spring comes, there are more hours of sunlight. The days are longer and warmer. The leaf buds open. Tiny green leaves appear on each twig. When the apple tree is covered with leaves, the flower buds begin to open. Up close, you can see bunches of small pink and white flowers 
at the end of each twig. Each flower can become an apple, but all the right things must happen first. An apple flower has many parts and each has a special job to do. Apple flower buds. Sepals. Around the outside are the sepals. They form a little cup to protect the rest of the flower. As the flower blossoms, the sepals open too. The pretty colored petals and sweet flowery smell bring many insects and birds to the apple tree. These animal helpers are needed for flowers to make fruit. Flower petals, sepals, opening. Inside each flower are the male and female parts that make a new apple grow. The male parts are called stamens. Each flower has many stamens. If you look inside an apple flower, you can see all the stamens sticking up in a circle. Stamens. At the top of each stamen, pollen is made. Pollen is a yellow powder. Each flower has thousands of pollen grains. Each grain of pollen holds male cells. Pollen. The female part of the flower is called a pistil. You can see some of the pistil right at the center of the flower. The pistil has tiny tubes with sticky tops. At the bottom of the flower, out of sight, these tiny tubes meet. The place where the tubes meet is the ovary. The ovary is the part of the pistil that holds the female cells. The ovary will become the inside core of the apple. Pistol. Ovary. An apple can grow when the male cells join with the female cells when the flower is fertilized. The male cells from the pollen have to reach the female cells in the ovary. This sounds easy, but it's not. The apple flower can be fertilized only by pollen from a different apple tree. Since apple trees can't move, they can't carry the pollen themselves. They need helpers for this job. Bees are some of the apple tree's best helpers. Bees are attracted to the colorful petals of the flowers. They like the smell of the sweet flower juice, the nectar. Bees fly from tree to tree collecting nectar. They will use the nectar to make honey. As the bees gather nectar, pollen grains stick to their bodies. When they land on the flowers of other apple trees, some of this pollen falls off. The grains of pollen land on the sticky tops of the pistil's tubes. The male cells in the pollen grains travel down these tiny tubes. At the bottom, they reach the ovary. Here, the male cells join with the female cells. The flower is fertilized. Pollen sticks here. Tubes. Inside view. Ovary. Now the petals fall to the ground. The petals are no longer needed. They have done their job. The flower has been fertilized. Now an apple will begin to grow. It will grow right at the spot where the flower meets the stem. As the fertilized ovary grows bigger, it forms the apple's core, which holds the seeds. They will be well protected here. Around the ovary, the rest of the apple is swelling too. This is the white fleshy part that you can eat. Inside view, core. Look at the bottom of a ripe apple. You can see bits of the dried sepals left from the flower. When the apple is cut open, you can see the seeds. Look carefully and you'll see five little compartments or sections. 
There may be as many as 10 seeds inside your apple. The seeds are the fertilized female cells. Apple seeds can grow into new apple trees. The apple trees must feed the growing apples. By using sunlight, water, and air, the leaves make a special kind of sugar. This sugar feeds the fruit. It takes about 50 leaves to make the sugar for one apple. All summer long, the apples grow bigger and riper. When fall arrives, the apples are almost ripe. During the last few weeks, the apples can feed themselves. They make their own sugar now. The sugar makes the apples sweet. Sunlight helps the leaves and the apples to make food. It also helps to change the skin color of some apples. Different kinds of apples have different skin colors. Some turn red and others turn yellow. Some varieties of apples stay green even when they are ripe. Red Delicious, Macintosh, Golden Delicious, Granny Smith. When the apples are ripe, it is time for picking. If no one picks the apples, they will fall to the ground. Animals will eat some of them and may carry the apple seeds to other places. Some of these seeds will grow into new apple trees. Some of the apples may just rot on the ground. After a while, they will become part of the soil. They will help to feed the trees. As fall ends, the trees lose their leaves. New buds are already forming. They will be next year's apples. For now, the apple tree's work is over. For you, it's time for the best part. It's apple eating time. I Met My Monster, written by Amanda Knoll, illustrated by Howard McWilliam. One night, when I reached under the bed for my truck, I found this note instead from the office of Mr. Z. Monsters, meet here for a final test. Ha! My parents were obviously trying to trick me into staying in bed. I didn't believe in monsters. So I crumpled the paper, grabbed my truck, and zipped over to my garage. I heard some creaking and rumbling, but I wasn't scared. Our house always made noises at night. But then a voice under the bed scolded. Stop that stomach rumbling. The child will hear you. Voices? Stomach rumbling? If this was part of my parents' trick, it was pretty cool. I peered into the inky blackness. Five pairs of eyes blinked back. See? Now he knows we're here, the voice sighed. One of you has broken monster rule number one. Maintain the element of surprise. This is no trick, I thought. There are monsters under my bed. A long-necked yellow monster slid out, followed by four little monsters. Rule number two, the yellow one instructed, never block the bed, all of you, scoot over. Hey, I realized, that one must be their teacher. I sat up straight, mesmerized by the monster parade shuffling across my bedroom. That's better, the teacher monster said, 
access to the bed is clear. Now, who knows rule number three? The purple monster teetered on his tiptoes and gurgled, Get the child into bed! That's correct, Genghis. And how would you do that? Well, Mr. Z, I would uh, roar my scariest roar. All right, give it a go. Genghis took a deep breath, opened his mouth, and let out a tiny whirp. Stomach rumbling would have a better chance of getting me into bed than that funny little noise, I laughed. The child is right, said Mr. Z, shaking his head. That was not sufficiently scary. Genghis, I'm sorry. You're not the best monster for this child. There was some creaking as Genghis slunk beneath the bed. Before I could investigate where Genghis had gone, Mr. Z asked, now, who wants to try to get the child into bed? The orange monster looked at the ceiling and the red monster looked at the floor. Only the green one looked at me. First, he stared at my toes and started drooling. Then he took a step toward me and I heard that rumbling noise again. I sprang into bed so he couldn't get my feet. Mr. Z blinked. Very unconventional, Gabe. Your stomach gurgles seem to be what this child needs. What I needed was to make sure this little Gabe monster didn't eat my toes. Right, you three. The child is now in bed, said Mr. Z. As every monster knows, the ultimate objective is rule number four. Who can tell me what that is? The orange monster bounced and squeaked. Keep the child in bed until it falls asleep. Correct, Morgan. And how would you accomplish that? Shadow puppets, shadow puppets, she squeaked again. Gabe whistled through his nose and I snickered, but Mr. Z said, interesting idea, try it. Morgan hopped onto my night table and flailed her arms near my lamp. Silly shadows blobbed onto the wall and a cloud of fluffy fur tickled my nose. Achoo! Morgan, stop at once, Mr. Z ordered. You're supposed to scare him, not make him sneeze. I'm sorry, but you're not a match either. Morgan's arms flopped to her side and she scuttled under my bed. There was some more creaking and Morgan was gone. After all that sneezing, I really needed a tissue. Suddenly, a huge shadow of uncut claws loomed across my room. Awesome, I thought, and kind of scary. I froze in place. Powerful performance, Gabe, said Mr. Z. But do either of you see a problem? Oh, I know, chirped the red monster. The child is out of bed again. Correct, Abigail, Mr. Z continued, and one of you must get him back in. Let's revisit rule number one, maintain the element of surprise. All at once, poof, the monsters vanished. Then I heard more rumbling. Were they hiding in my closet, making noises to scare me? Ha, <laughs> no. It was only my stomach grumbling. All this excitement was making me hungry. I tiptoed past the closet and peeked out the door. So far, so good. 
no monsters. Then I stepped over the squeaky stair and sneaked down to the kitchen. As I reached into the pantry, I heard some chattering behind me. I sure hoped it wasn't that toe-loving Gabe. I yanked open the fridge. Ha! It wasn't Gabe. It was just the red monster shivering on the shelf. Found you, I laughed. Nice try, Abigail, said Mr. Z, but this isn't working. You're not the right monster for this child. But Mr. Z, she whined, it's not my fault. He's not scared of me. I'm sorry, Abigail. Let's go. Abigail clomped behind Mr. Z. When I heard the creaking, I knew she was gone. I grabbed some crackers and headed upstairs, wondering if Gabe was gone too. I munched all the way down the hall, then went into the bathroom to brush my teeth again. When I opened the door a minute later, Gabe was definitely not gone. He was right there and he was huge. I charged into my room and slammed the door. When I leaped into bed, I knew my toes were safe. Whew! I was surprised to hear breathing under my bed, ragged breathing and stomach rumbling. Hey kid, Gabe growled. Good to see ya. I pulled my covers up tight. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to start the evening with an ominous puddle of drool. I peeked over the edge of the bed. Green ooze spread soundlessly from underneath. Then the bed quivered as Gabe unfurled his spiked tail. Well, this looks quite promising, Mr. Z noted. When I heard some more creaking, I knew Mr. Z was gone. I was alone with Gabe. Gabe loomed over my bed and began sharpening his uncut claws on my bedpost. Huh, how, how'd you get so big? I gasped. Rule number five, my friend, he explained. People food makes monsters grow. So thanks for the crackers. Got any toes I can munch? I scrunched in my feet so Gabe couldn't get them. This was way better than playing with trucks. No toes tonight, but you can have this, I offered, tossing a stuffed monster off the bed. Gabe, do for it. His soft, comforting snorts filled the room as he snuffled the toy. I shivered. Kid, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. No other monsters can scare me like you, I giggled. Gabe was the monster for me. His snorts and ooze were perfect. I yawned, then shivered again. I was asleep in no time. How the Grinch Stole Christmas by Dr. Seuss. Every who down in Whoville liked Christmas a lot. But the Grinch who lived just north of Whoville did not. The Grinch hated Christmas 
the whole Christmas season. Now please don't ask why. No one quite knows the reason. It could be his head wasn't screwed on just right. It could be, perhaps, that his shoes were too tight. But I think that the most likely reason of all may have been that his heart was two sizes too small. But whatever the reason, his heart or his shoes, he stood there on Christmas Eve, hating the Who's, staring down from his cave with a sour, grinchy frown at the warm lighted windows below in their town. For he knew every Who down in Whoville beneath was busy now hanging a mistletoe wreath. And they're hanging their stockings, he snarled with a sneer. Tomorrow is Christmas. It's practically here. Then he growled with his Grinch fingers nervously drumming, I must find a way to stop Christmas from coming. For tomorrow, he knew. All the Who girls and boys would wake bright and early. They'd rush for their toys and then, oh, the noise, oh, the noise, 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 noise. That's one thing he hated, the noise, noise, noise. Then the Who's, young and old, would sit down to a feast, and they'd feast, and they'd feast, and they'd feast, 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 feast. They would feast on who pudding and rare who roast beast, which was something the Grinch couldn't stand in the least. And then they'd do something he liked least of all. Every who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, would stand close together with Christmas bells ringing. They'd stand hand in hand, and the Who's would start singing. They'd sing, and they'd sing, and they'd sing, 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 sing. And the more the Grinch thought of this Who Christmas sing, the more the Grinch thought, I must stop this whole thing. Why, for 53 years, I've put up with it now. I must stop this Christmas from coming. But how? Then he got an idea, an awful idea. The Grinch got a wonderful, awful idea. I know just what to do, the Grinch laughed in his throat. And he made a quick Santa Claus hat and a coat. And he chuckled and clucked, what a great Grinchy trick. With this coat and this hat, I look just like Saint Nick. All I need is a reindeer. The Grinch looked around. But since reindeer are scarce, there were none to be found. Did that stop the old Grinch? No, the Grinch simply said, if I can't find a reindeer, I'll make one instead. So he called his dog Max. Then he took some red thread and he tied a big horn on the top of his head. Then he loaded some bags and some old empty sacks on a ramshackle sleigh and he hitched up old Max. Then the Grinch said, get up! And the sleigh started down towards the homes where the Who's lay a snooze in their town. All their windows were dark. Quiet snow filled the air. All the Who's were all dreaming, sweet dreams without care. When he came to the first little house on the square, this is stop number one, the old Grinchy Claws hissed. And he climbed to the roof, empty bags in his fist. 
Then he slid down the chimney, a rather tight pinch. But if Santa could do it, then so could the Grinch. He got stuck only once for a moment or two. Then he stuck his head out of the fireplace flue where the little who stockings all hung in a row. These stockings, he grinned, are the first things to go. Then he slithered and slunk with a smile most unpleasant around the whole room and he took every present. Pop guns and bicycles, roller skates, drums, checkerboards, tricycles, popcorn, and plums. And he stuffed them in bags. Then the Grinch very nimbly stuffed all the bags one by one up the chimney. Then he slunk to the ice box. He took the Who's feast. He took the Who pudding. He took the roast beast. He cleaned out that ice box as quick as a flash. Why, that Grinch even took their last can of Who hash. And the Grinch grabbed the tree and he started to shove when he heard a small sound like the coo of a dove. He turned around fast and he saw a small who, little Cindy Lou who, who was not more than two. The Grinch had been caught by this tiny who daughter who'd got out of bed for a cup of cold water. She stared at the Grinch and said, Santa Claus, why? Why are you taking our Christmas tree? Why? But you know that old Grinch was so smart and so slick. He thought up a lie and he thought it up quick. Why, my sweet little tot, the fake Santa Claus lied. There's a light on this tree that won't light on one side. So I'm taking it home to my workshop, my dear. I'll fix it up there. Then I'll bring it back here. And his fib fooled the child. Then he patted her head and he got her a drink and he sent her to bed. And when Cindy Lou Who went to bed with her cup, he went to the chimney and stuffed the tree up. Then the last thing he took was the log for their fire. Then he went up the chimney himself, the old liar. On their walls he left nothing but hooks and some wire. And the one speck of food that he left in the house was a crumb that was even too small for a mouse. Then he did the same thing to the other whose houses, leaving crumbs much too small for the other whose mouses. It was quarter past dawn, all the who's still abed. All the who's still a snooze when he packed up his sled, packed it up with their presents, the ribbons, the wrappings, the tags and the tinsel, the trimmings, the trappings. 3,000 feet up, up the side of Mount Crumpet, he rode with his load to the tip top to dump it. Poo, poo to the who's. He was the Grinchishly humming, they're finding out now that no Christmas is coming. They're just waking up. I know just what they'll do. Their mouths will hang open a minute or two. Then the Who's down in Whoville will all cry boo-hoo. That's a noise, grinned the Grinch, that I simply must hear. So he paused. 
and the Grinch put his hand to his ear. And he did hear a sound rising over the snow. It started in low, then it started to grow. But the sound wasn't sad. Why, this sound sounded merry. It couldn't be so, but it was merry, very. He stared down at Whoville. The Grinch popped his eyes. Then he shook. What he saw was a shocking surprise. Every who down in Whoville, the tall and the small, was singing without any presents at all. He hadn't stopped Christmas from coming. It came. Somehow or other, it came just the same. And the Grinch with his Grinch feet, ice cold in the snow, stood puzzling and puzzling. How could it be so? It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. And he puzzled three hours till his puzzler was sore. Then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. And what happened then? Well, in Whoville they say that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. And the minute his heart didn't feel quite so tight, he whizzed with his load through the bright morning light and he brought back the toys and the food for the feast. And he, he himself, the Grinch, carved the roast beast. to catch a witch from the New York Times best-selling series Alice Walstead and Megan Joyce based on designs by Andy Elkerton. We happily dressed in our costumes with care getting ready for trick-or-treat night. What we yet didn't know was who else had a plan for Halloween mischief to give us a fright. The pumpkins were carved and lit from within as we walked in the crisp autumn air. We started to notice ghosts, ghouls, and goblins popping up over here, there, and everywhere. But there aren't enough kids living in our town to account for this many creatures. Some of these beings just might be real. Take a look at all their weird features. Time to floss, bump, and boogie. Up very high was a witch in the sky. On her broom, she had invites to carry. With a wave of her wand, the music began. When dancing, the ghost looked less scary. We figured out that the witch brought the creatures, so we set traps for a Halloween prize. We have to catch her to send all the ghouls back. It won't be easy, cause this witch is wise. Free broom, rebristling, stop here. Beyond catching the witch, there's candy to get, chocolates and sweets, big and small. If the tricks, treats, and traps all fall in line, this spooky night, we might have it all. 
Whoosh. She likes spiders and maybe their webs can help out. The witch could get stuck on the floor. Hang on a second. Wait just a minute. Do we have more kids than before? First prize for busting best moves. This witch is clever and brought lots of friends. We need far better traps before this night ends. Zombies, dinos, ghosts, wolves, and more. Monsters everywhere and one in a pool. We can't catch them all in just one night. Better trap the witch before ghouls rule my school. This is getting serious. We're running out of time. Do witches even stop for roadblocks? Sure hope she falls for a tunnel of tricks. We need to return our dad's toolbox. The witch stops her boogie to come and explore, wondering what tricks are inside. She's wise to the trap and summons some help, sending a bat in first as her guide. We watch the boat to see when to start. She skipped the boat and just used her broom. Makes sense, we guess. Why wouldn't she fly? We had no idea that thing had such zoom. The dance party had hit the finale at last. Each dancing monster started to cheer. There's no doubt about it, we have to admit. This witch threw the party of the year. Then, just when we thought it was over, and all the goblins were with us forever. The witch opened a portal and they left in a flash. As party hostess, she's welcome whenever. Happy Halloween. See you next year. by Mo Willems. Ribbit, 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 ribbit. Hmm? Ribbit. Piggy? What are you doing, Piggy? I'm a frog. You are a frog? Yes. I did not know that. I was sure you were a pig. You look like a pig and your name is Piggy. I was a pig, now I'm a frog, baby. You learn something new every day. When did you become a frog? About five minutes ago. Five minutes ago? Five minutes ago, she was a pig? Now she is a frog? Ribbit. What if I become a frog? Hopping all day? Eating flies? Ribbit. I do not want to be a frog! It is okay, Gerald. It is pretend. It is the end? No, Gerald. Pretend. I am pretending. What is pretending? Pretending is when you act like something you are not. 
Wow. And you can just do that? You can just go out and pretend to be something you are not? Sure, everyone pretends. Even grown-up people? All the time. You really do learn something new every day. Do you want to try it, Gerald? Do you want to pretend to be a frog? Ready? I cannot. Yes, you can, Ribbit. No, I can't. Yes, you can. 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 No, I can't. Daryl! Why can't you pretend to be a frog? Because I am a cow. Moo! Ribbit, ribbit, ribbit. Moo! by Peter H. Reynolds. Ramon loved to draw. Anytime, anything, anywhere. One day, Ramon was drawing a vase of flowers. His brother, Leon, leaned over his shoulder. Leon burst out laughing. What is that? he asked. Ramon could not even answer. He just crumpled up the drawing and threw it across the room. Leon's laughter haunted Ramon. He kept trying to make his drawings look right, but they never did. After many months and many crumpled sheets of paper, Ramon put his pencil down. I'm done. Marisol, his sister, was watching him. What do you want? He snapped. I was watching you draw, she said. Ramon sneered. I'm not drawing. Go away. Marisol ran away, but not before picking up a crumpled sheet of paper. Hey, come back here with that. Ramon raced after Marisol up the hall and into her room. He was about to yell but fell silent when he saw his sister's walls. He stared at the crumpled gallery. This is one of my favorites, Marisol said, pointing. That was supposed to be a vase of flowers, Ramon said, but it doesn't look like one. Well, it looks vase-ish, she exclaimed. Vase-ish? Ramon looked closer. Then he studied all the drawings on Marisol's walls and began to see them in a whole new way. They do look ish he said ramon felt light and energized thinking ishly allowed his ideas to flow freely he began to draw what he felt loose lines quickly springing out without worry 
Ramon once again drew and drew the world around him. Making an ish drawing felt wonderful. He filled his journals. Tree-ish, house-ish, boat-ish, afternoon-ish, fish-ish, sun-ish. Ramon realized he could draw ish feelings too. Peace-ish, silly-ish, excited-ish. His ish art inspired ish writing. He wasn't sure if he was writing poems, but he knew they were poem-ish. Ponder, pond, ponder, dream yonder. Pond, pond, yawned, yawned. Gleam, wander. Ramon. One spring morning, Ramon had a wonderful feeling. It was a feeling that even ish words and ish drawings could not capture. He decided not to capture it. Instead, he simply savored it. And Ramon lived ishfully ever after. Johnny Appleseed a Tall Tale Retold and Illustrated by Stephen Kellogg John Chapman, who later became known as Johnny Appleseed, was born on September 26, 1774. When the apples on the trees surrounding his home in Leominster, Massachusetts, were as red as the autumn leaves. John's first years were hard. His father left the family to fight in the Revolutionary War, and his mother and his baby brother both died before his second birthday. By the time John turned six, his father had remarried and settled in Longmeadow, Massachusetts. Within a decade, their little house was overflowing with 10 more children. Nearby was an apple orchard. Like most early American families, the Chapmans picked their apples in the fall, stored them in the cellar for winter eating, and used them to make sauces, cider, vinegar, and apple butter. John loved to watch the spring blossoms slowly turn into the glowing fruit of autumn. Watching the apples grow inspired in John a love of all of nature. He often escaped from his boisterous household to the tranquil woods. The animals sensed his gentleness and trusted him. As soon as John was old enough to leave home, he set out to explore the vast wilderness to the west. When he reached the Allegheny Mountains, he cleared a plot of land and planted a small orchard with the pouch of apple seeds he had carried with him. John walked hundreds of miles through the Pennsylvania forest, living like the Indians he befriended on the trail. As he traveled, he cleared the land for many more orchards. He was sure the pioneer families would be arriving before long, and he looked forward to supplying them with apple trees. When a storm struck, he found shelter in a hollow log or built a lean-to. On clear nights, he stretched out under the stars. Over the next few years, John continued to visit and care for his new orchards. The winter slowed him down but he survived happily on a diet of butternuts. 
One spring, he met a band of men who boasted that they could lick their weight in wildcats. They were amazed to hear that John wouldn't hurt an animal and had no use for a gun. They challenged John to compete at wrestling, the favorite frontier sport. He suggested a more practical contest, a tree chopping match. The woodsman eagerly agreed. When the sawdust settled, there was no question about who had come out on top. John was pleased that the land for his largest orchard had been so quickly cleared. He thanked the exhausted woodsmen for their help and began planting. During the next few years, John continued to move westward. Whenever he ran out of apple seeds, he hiked to the eastern cider presses to replenish his supply. Before long, John's plantings were spread across the state of Ohio. Meanwhile, pioneer families were arriving in search of home sites and farmland. John had located his orchards on the routes he thought they'd be traveling. As he had hoped, the settlers were eager to buy his young trees. John went out of his way to lend a helping hand to his new neighbors. Often he would give his trees away. People affectionately called him Johnny Appleseed, and he began using that name. He particularly enjoyed entertaining children with tales of wilderness adventures and stories from the Bible. In 1812, the British incited the Indians to join them in another war against the Americans. The settlers feared that Ohio would be invaded from Lake Erie. It grieved Johnny that his friends were fighting each other. But when he saw the smoke of burning cabins, he ran through the night, shouting a warning at every door. After the war, people urged Johnny to build a house and settle down. He replied that he lived like a king in his wilderness home, and he returned to the forest he loved. During his long absences, folks enjoyed sharing their recollections of Johnny. They retold his stories, and sometimes they even exaggerated them a bit. Some recalled Johnny sleeping in a treetop hammock and chatting with the birds. Others remembered that a rattlesnake had attacked his foot. Fortunately, Johnny's feet were as tough as elephants hide, so the fangs didn't penetrate. It was said that Johnny had once tended a wounded wolf and then kept him for a pet. An old hunter swore he'd seen Johnny frolicking with a bear family. The storytellers outdid each other with the tall tales about his feats of survival in the untamed wilderness. As the years passed, Ohio became too crowded for Johnny. He moved to the wilds of Indiana, where he continued to clear land for his orchards. When the settlers began arriving, Johnny recognized some of the children who had listened to his stories. Now they had children of their own. It made Johnny's old heart glad when they welcomed him as a beloved friend and asked to hear his tales again. When Johnny passed 70, it became difficult for him to keep up with his work. Then, in March of 1845, while trudging through a snowstorm near Fort Wayne, Indiana, he became ill for the first time in his life. 
Johnny asked for shelter in a settler's cabin, and a few days later, he died there. Curiously, Johnny's stories continued to move westward without him. Folks maintained that they'd seen him in Illinois, or that they'd greeted him in Missouri, Arkansas, or Texas. Others were certain that he'd planted trees on the slopes of the Rocky Mountains or in California's distant valleys. Even today, people still claim they've seen Johnny Appleseed. Little Skeletons Countdown to Midnight by Susie Hamarillo. When the old clock strikes the hour of one, out of the tomb, a skeletito's roomba. Toomba laka, toomba laka, toomba tomb, a toomba laka, toomba laka, toomba la. When the old clock strikes the hour of two, two skeletitos eat up their food. Tumba laka, tumba laka, tumba tum, a tumba laka, tumba laka, tumba la. When the old clock strikes the hour of three, three skeletitos backwards flee. Tumba laka, tumba laka, tumba tum, a tumba laka, tumba laka, tumba la. When the old clock strikes the hour of four, four skeletitos go out the door. Tumba laka, tumba laka, tumba tum, a tumba laka, tumba laka, tumba la. When the old clock strikes the hour of five, five skeletitos jump up and jive. Tumba laka, tumba laka, tumba tum, a tumba laka, tumba laka, tumba la. When the old clock strikes the hour of six, six skeletitos get a chest fix. Tumba laka, tumba laka, tumba tum, a tumba laka, tumba laka, tumba la. When the old clock strikes the hour of seven, seven skeletitos rocket up to heaven. Tumba laka, tumba laka, tumba tum, a tumba laka, tumba laka, tumba la. When the old clock strikes the hour of eight. Eight skeletitos eat up some cake. Tumba laka, tumba laka, tumba tum. A tumba laka, tumba laka, tumba la. When the old clock strikes the hour of nine, nine skeletitos shake up their spine. Tumba laka, tumba laka, tumba tum. A tumba laka, tumba laka, tumba la. When the old clock strikes the hour of ten, ten skeletitos go to sleep again. Tumba laka, tumba laka, tumba tum, a tumba laka, tumba laka, tumba la. When the old clock strikes the hour of eleven, eleven skeletitos march in a procession. Tumba laka, tumba laka, tumba tum, a tumba laka, tumba laka, tumba la. When the old clock strikes the hour of twelve, twelve skeletitos dance by themselves. Tumba laka, tumba laka, tumba tum, a tumba laka, tumba laka, tumba la. Magda's Tortillas by Becky Chavara Chares, illustrated by Anne Vega. Mira, abuela, look! Magda Madrigal had just washed her little hands, and now she presented them for inspection.
It was time to get to work in her abuela's kitchen. Magda fidgeted with excitement. Today she was seven years old, and Abuela Madrigal had promised her that on her birthday she would be old enough for her first tortilla making lesson. Magda tried to imitate Abuela's every move. She had even pinned her hair in a bun, just like her grandmother did. Magda flapped her apron and then tried to reach behind her back and tie it on without looking too, but she couldn't. Magda did not want to admit that she needed a little help, but finally she tugged silently at Abuela's little finger. At the kitchen table, Abuela took a ball of arena from the large mixing bowl and dropped it onto the cutting board. She poked it with her little finger to see how soft it was. Magda poked it too. Que facile, she said to herself. It was softer than the clay she played with at school. Magda had watched Abuela make tortillas many, many times, ever since she was a little girl. So she felt sure that her first batch of tortillas would be as perfect and round as Abuela's always were. Abuela looked at her granddaughter with a little smile. Lista, Magda? She asked. Are you ready? See, si, Abuela, I'm ready, Magda said with an eager nod. Abuela put the first bolita of dough at the center of the cutting board. Magda made two tight fists and smooshed the ball flat. The dough felt soft and warm. Magda patted down the masa, grunting with effort. At last, she stood back to see how her first tortilla looked. Ay, mira, sighed Abuela with admiration. But Magda hung her head down. Yucko, Abuela, she said. That's not a tortilla. No es yucko, mi hijita. Look at what you've made, Abuela said proudly. Un corazoncito, a little heart. What? Magda said, blinking. Her head rose slowly, and she looked at her abuela with wide eyes. It was a little heart. But it's not supposed to be a heart, she cried. I wanted a round one like you make. Well then, try again. Andale. Abuela sounded just like Magda's mama when she gave orders at home. Magda took a deep breath. This time she decided to use the rolling pin. Then she remembered that her abuela always dusted the pin. Magda reached for the fine white flour. Un poquito, un poquito, Abuela suggested. Just dust it on like bath powder. Magda closed her eyes tight. She pressed down on the ball of dough. Up and down, side to side, up and down, side to side. Magda struggled with the rolling pin. She was determined to make the tortilla nice and flat and round. At last, she put the rolling pin down. How did her second tortilla look? Magda slowly peeked out of one eye, then the other. She crossed her arms and pressed her lips into a ball. They looked like a tiny ball of pink dough. Abuela, I give up, Magda blurted. She stomped out of the kitchen in a puff of flour. But why? Por qué, mi hijita? 
Abuela called to Magda's back. Come look at this star you've made. It's the Christmas star, La Estrella de Belen. Magda was already halfway down the hall, but she stopped. What? She whispered to herself. Back she scurried to see what Abuela was talking about. Maybe Abuela saw something Magda hadn't. The tortilla did have five points, just like a star. Suddenly, Magda realized this was no time to give up. Tortilla making wasn't as easy as she thought it would be, but it certainly was full of surprises. Magda took the rolling pin again and kept rolling out the little balls of dough. After six, seven, eight balls, she had just as many different shapes. Magda longed for a perfectly round tortilla, but not one was just like her abuelas. Magda made a heart, a Christmas star, and a banana. She even made a hexagon. At least that's what her older brother Eduardo called it. And he knew everything about geometry. She made a cloud, a football, and a flower. Abuela told Magda that one with its squiggly edges reminded her of Los Lagos, the lake near her hometown in Mexico. Alongside Magda, Abuela rolled out even more tortillas, enough for Magda's merienda, the afternoon snack time that would be given today in honor of the birthday girl. Abuela's rolling pin seemed to dance and jump up and down, back and forth, with a bump, bump, a thump, tun, tun, pa, tump. Abuela didn't even watch what she was doing. And yet, each tortilla she made came out the same, perfectly round. They were as round as clocks, as round as car tires, as round as pizzas, Magda thought as she watched her abuela work. Each tortilla looked as if she had used a cookie cutter to shape it. How Magda wished she had something to make her. Her tortillas round too. Es todo. That's it, sighed Abuela at last. She rolled out her last perfectly round tortilla and headed for El Comal, the hot griddle on the stove. Soon, all the tortillas, Magda's and Abuela's both, were freckled on each side with brown blisters hot off the comel. Abuela asked Magda to call in the entire family to get ready for la merienda. Meanwhile, she stacked her own round tortillas high on a plate. Then she put Magda's tortillas on her best party platter and she placed it in the middle of the dinner table. But Magda wasn't eager to serve her tortillas. Everyone will laugh at the funny shapes, she thought to herself. She hid behind her abuela, covering her ears and pressing her face into the big bow on abuela's apron. Even so, she heard a wild outburst. Magda's big brother, Eduardo, her little brother, Gabriel, and her cousins Karina, Marisol, Lucy, and Martine were all shouting. Abuela jumped at the noise and Magda pressed her hands even more tightly over her ears. Me first, I'm the oldest, she heard Eduardo say. No, me, 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 squeaked Gabriel. I'm the littlest. He hung on to the edge of the table standing on his tiptoes. Well, I'm the hungriest, said Karina. Magda couldn't see what the fuss was about. She swallowed hard and slowly 
peeked around Abuela's elbow. Pero los niños had not even noticed Abuela's plate. They were fighting over Magda's tortillas. Well, mi hijita, said Mommy, I know you have the best teacher, but you also have a special talent. My Magda is a tortilla artist. Si, sí, es cierto, Abuela agreed cheerfully. Mira, our Magda is very talented, said Tio Manuel. Magda had to see for herself. She stepped out from behind her abuela, dusted off her little hands, and took a long look at the platter with all its different shapes. A smile came to her face, and Magda beamed at her own accomplishment. A tortilla artist, she whispered to herself. Si, sí, muy talentosa, boasted her poppy. Tio Manuel grabbed his camera and quickly snapped a picture. Soon the tortillas would be buttered and gobbled up, but he would save this proud moment and Magda's one-of-a-kind tortillas for the family photo album. A second later, the children swarmed around Abuela, who was still blinking from the flash of the camera. Teach me, teach me, they all shouted. I know lindos, Abuela replied sweetly, putting her hands out to shush the children. Por qué? Why not, Abuela? Little Gabriel said. The room became quiet as the children waited for her answer. Abuela put her hands on Magda's shoulders before she spoke. Miren, chiquitos. I know how to mix the harina, and someday I'll show each one of you, said Abuela. Pero Magda is the artist. Only she can show you her secret. What an honor to hear such a compliment from her Abuela, who made such perfectly round tortillas. Magda felt very special and very grown up. Thank you, Abuela, Magda said. Then she pulled at Abuela's apron to get her to bend down. Tengo un secreto, she whispered. I have a secret. Dime, hijita, you can tell me, Abuela coaxed. Magda put her arms around Abuela's neck. I don't care how many tortillas I make or how many shapes I create, she said. Your tortillas will always be my favorite, mis tortillas favoritas. I will never make them just the way you do. A little tear rolled into the deep lines of Abuela's smiling cheek. Then Magda gave her grandmother un abrazo, an Abuela-sized hug. A moment later, Magda had another idea. She snuggled up a little closer to ask, Abuela, when can you show me how to mix the dough? Abuela chuckled. Mira, she said, how about if we do that next year on your eighth birthday, mi linda? Magda's face lit up. She could hardly wait. But first, Abuela added, you need to make more tortillas for your marienda. They're nearly all gone already. Andale, Magda. Si, sí, Abuela, Magda said. But what shapes should I make? Abuela burst out laughing. Oh, mi linda, anything you like. It's all in your hands now.
Thomas and friends. May the best engine win. Illustrated by Tommy Stubbs. Created by Britt Alcroft. Early one morning on the island of Sodor, Sir Topham Hatt came to the yard. Thomas and Emily were preparing for a busy day. Thomas always worked very hard. He was proud to be a really useful engine. Emily was new. She wanted to prove that she was really useful too. She hoped that Sir Topham Hatt would see how excited she was to start the day. Thomas, there's a lot to do today. I hope that everything gets done on time, said Sir Topham Hatt. Why should Thomas get all the work? asked Emily. I can do anything he can. I'm faster than him too. Sir Topham Hatt was glad that Emily wanted to help. He told them, I can divide up the duties so that both of you will have the same workload today. Emily knew it would be a long day, but she smiled. She told Thomas, now you'll see what I can do. Thomas was used to long days. Emily, this might be too much work for you, he teased. You should let me do more. Pfft, she puffed. I'll race you. Whoever finishes and makes it back to the station first is the winner. Let's go, peeped Thomas. With a peep and a poop, Thomas and Emily left the station side by side. Emily's first stop was the quarry. She'd brought crates full of new tools and she had to stay in place while the workers unloaded them. After all the crates were taken away, the workers hitched her to freight cars full of large stones. Emily knew that really useful engines were supposed to be good at waiting, but it was difficult for her to be patient. Please hurry, she told the workers. I don't want Thomas to get ahead. While Emily was at the quarry, Thomas was running his branch line. He moved from station to station. At every stop, more passengers got off and Annie and Clarabelle got lighter and lighter. I'll bet I'm pulling ahead of Emily already, thought Thomas. Along the way to his last station, Thomas saw Emily. She was going to Suttery with stone from the quarry. There you are, slow coach, she called. Thomas laughed. That stone looks awfully heavy, he said. He hoped that Emily would get tired from hauling such a heavy load. Thomas's second job was to deliver a load of barrels to the docks. He had to wait for the barrels to be moved onto boats. Thomas was not a very patient engine, but he knew it would do no good to win the race if he didn't do his job just right. The other engines will tease me forever if Emily wins, he thought. He would have to go extra fast to his next stop. Is it time to go back to the shed? He asked his driver. You still have to haul some troublesome trucks to Cronk, said the driver. Troublesome trucks were always bumping and bashing. Thomas had to work hard to keep them in line. Don't try anything funny, he said as they left the station. But soon Thomas had to stop at a signal. The signal man explained, some rocks have fallen onto the tracks. You'll have to wait until the way is clear. Oh, bother said Thomas. I wonder where Emily is now. Emily had left Suttery, 
Her final job was a special along the mountain route. On the way, she passed Thomas, who was stopped at the signal. Poor Thomas, she called to him. Looks like you're stuck. Emily sped up. She saw a sign warning of a winding track ahead, but she didn't want to slow down and risk losing the race. The track was difficult and she was going too fast. Her driver told her to slow down, but it was too late. As Emily took a turn, one of her trucks tipped over. Now she had to wait for help. Thomas will get ahead for sure, she thought. Thomas was having better luck. The rocks had been cleared and he was almost done with his last job of the day. He saw Harvey moving on the opposite track. Hello, Harvey, he peeped. Where are you headed? Emily's hit a spot of trouble on the line, said Harvey. Nothing to worry about. Emily was glad to see Harvey. She thanked him for his help. I'll take the rest of the path slowly, she said. If I'm more careful, I still might beat Thomas. Thomas was having some difficulty with the troublesome trucks. They made him go faster than he wanted to, but his brakes were strong and he was able to stay on the track. Once the troublesome trucks were unhitched, he sped away toward home. I hope Emily isn't there yet, he thought. The sun was nearly setting by the time Thomas arrived at the yard. He didn't see Emily anywhere. Emily arrived only a minute later. When she saw Thomas, she frowned. She had really wanted to beat him. Thomas saw her sad expression. He knew that he would have been sad if he had lost. So he decided not to brag. That was a close race, he said. You won fair and square, said Emily. But I'll beat you tomorrow, she added. Thomas laughed. We'll see about that. Where is Mi Ofrenda? by Mariana Galvez. My name is Amelia, and today is Day of the Dead. I need your help collecting items for this year's ofrenda. Are you ready to help me find all we need to place on our altar? Is the red picture frame hanging on the wall? Can you look to see if the orange cempasuchil is planted in the garden? Are the yellow candles on the stand at the marketplace? Did you find the stack of mom's favorite green books on the floor? Are the blue plates with food on top of the dining table? Is the purple copal incense hidden behind the plant? Yummy! Have you set your sights on the brown pond de muerto on the counter? Is dad decorating the white sugar skulls? Is the rainbow papel picado hanging from the tree? We did it! We've gathered all items and placed them on the altar. Our ofrenda is the perfect way to honor and remember our dearly departed today and always. Frames. Framed photos are magical keys that unlock the passageway 
for spirits to visit on Dia de Muertos. These photos are placed in premier spots on each altar. Sempasuchil. With their beautiful color and unique aroma, Sempasuchil attracts souls to their altars. Their petals can also be scattered on the ground to make a path for souls to follow. Candles. The warm glow of candles provides loved ones with a heartwarming welcome home. Books, personal item. Personal items such as books and other mementos are placed on the altars to honor the hobbies and activities loved ones once cherished. Talavera plates, food and water. When spirits arrive at their altars after long journeys, they are welcomed with water and their favorite meals. Copal incense. Copal incense derived from a native tree in Mexico guides souls with the lovely scent of home back to their altars. Pan de Muerto. Pan de Muerto a traditional pan dulce baked for the celebration of Dia de Muertos serves as a symbol of the departed and an offering to the spirits. Sugar skulls. Sugar skulls, brightly colored, symbolize the sweetness of life and are displayed on altars to represent the celebrated souls. Papel picado, celebration. The vibrant colors and delicate imagery of papel picado symbolizes the fragility of life and creates a pathway for souls to journey through. Altar. In the celebration of Dia de Muertos, altars are decorated and adorned in memory of loved ones who have passed. The Places You'll Go by Dr. Seuss. Congratulations! Today is your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own and you know what you know. And you are the guy who'll decide where to go. You'll look up and down streets, look them over with care. About some you will say, I don't choose to go there. With your head full of brains and your shoes full of feet, you're too smart to go down any not so good street. And you may not find any you'll want to go down. In that case, of course, you'll head straight out of town. It's opener there in the wide open air. Out there, things can happen and frequently do to people as brainy and footsy as you. And when things start to happen, don't worry, don't stew, just go right along you'll start happening too. Oh, the places you'll go. You'll be on your way up. You'll be seeing great sights. You'll join the high flyers who soar to high heights. You won't lag behind because you'll have the speed. You'll pass the whole gang and you'll soon take the lead. Wherever you fly, you'll be best of the best. Wherever you go, you will top all the rest. Except when you don't, because sometimes you won't. I'm sorry to say so, but sadly it's true that bang ups and hang ups can happen to you. 
you can get all hung up in a prickly perch and your gang will fly on. You'll be left in a lurch. You'll come down from the lurch with an unpleasant bump and the chances are then that you'll be in a slump. And when you're in a slump, you're not in for much fun. Unslumping yourself is not easily done. You will come to a place where the streets are not marked. Some windows are lighted, but mostly they're dark. A place you could sprain both your elbow and chin. Do you dare to stay out? Do you dare to go in? How much can you lose? How much can you win? And if you go in, should you turn left or right? Or right and three quarters? Or maybe not quite? Or go around back and sneak in from behind? Simple it's not, I'm afraid you will find. For a mind maker upper to make up his mind. You can get so confused that you'll start in to race down long wiggled roads at a breaknecking pace and grind on for miles across weirdish wild space headed, I fear, toward a most useless place, the waiting place. For people just waiting, waiting for a train to go or a bus to come or a plane to go, or the mail to come, or the rain to go, or the phone to ring, or the snow to snow, or waiting around for a yes or no, or waiting for their hair to grow. Everyone is just waiting. Waiting for the fish to bite, or waiting for wind to fly a kite, or waiting around for Friday night, or waiting, perhaps, for their Uncle Jake, or a pot to boil, or a better break, or a string of pearls, or a pair of pants, or a wig with curls, or another chance. Everyone is just waiting. No, that's not for you. Somehow you'll escape all that waiting and staying. You'll find the bright places where boom bands are playing. With banner flip flapping, once more you'll ride high, ready for anything under the sky. Ready because you're that kind of a guy. Oh, the places you'll go. There is fun to be done. There are points to be scored. There are games to be won. And the magical thing you can do with that ball will make you the winningest winner of all. Fame! You'll be famous as famous can be with the whole wide world watching you win on TV. Except when they don't, because sometimes they won't. I'm afraid that sometimes you'll play lonely games too. Games you can't win because you'll play against you. All alone, whether you like it or not. Alone will be something you'll be quite a lot. And when you're alone, there's a very good chance you'll meet things that scare you right out of your pants. There are some down the road between hither and yon that can scare you so much you won't want to go on. But on you will go. Though the weather be foul, on you will go, though your enemies prowl. On you will go, though the hacken cracks howl. Onward up many a frightening creek, though your arms may get sore and your sneakers may leak. On and on you will hike, and I know you'll hike far and face up to your problems, whatever they are. You'll get mixed up, of course, as you already know. You'll get mixed up with many strange birds as you go. So be sure when you step, 
Step with care and great tact. And remember that life's a great balancing act. Just never forget to be dexterous and deft. And never mix up your right foot with your left. And will you succeed? Yes, you will indeed. 98 and three quarters percent guaranteed. Kid, you'll move mountains. So, be your name Boxbaum or Bixby or Bray or Medici Alley Van Allen O'Shea. You're off to great places. Today is your day. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. One Green Apple by Eve Bunting, illustrated by Ted Lewin. This is my second day in the new school in the new country. There are to be no lessons today because we are going somewhere. Other days will not be like this one. Tomorrow, I will go again to the class where I will learn to speak English. Mothers drive us to the start of an orchard where a hay wagon is waiting. We climb on and lean against the bundles of hay. The wagon is pulled by a tractor and we jolt along. I think it odd to have boys and girls sit together. It was not like this in my village. The students know each other but they don't know me and I don't know them. I can't understand them when they speak and I can't speak to them. Some are friendly, but some look at me coldly and smile cruel smiles. I hear my country mentioned not fondly. I would prefer to go home. My father has explained to me that we are not always liked here. Our home country and our new one have had difficulties, he says, but it will be good for us here in time. How much time, I wonder? I am different too, in other ways. My jeans and t-shirt look like theirs, but my dupata covers my head and shoulders. I have not seen anyone else wearing a dupata, though all the girls and women in my home country do. The girl who sits next to me smiles and points to herself. Anna, she says. She points to me, Farah. I nod and say, Farah, which is my name. Then I look across the field where cows graze. I am tight inside myself. Three dogs come and run in front of us. I think they belong here and know the way. I once had a dog called Hadis. We stop at a place where apple trees bunch together. I find out we are to pick the fruit. Old apples have fallen in the grass. The three dogs are eating them. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Their crunches sound like hadises. Our teacher gathers us around her. She talks to the class. Then she looks at me in a kind way. One, she says. She touches an apple, then picks it. One, she says again. I am to take only one, as the other students have done. I nod. I want to say, I understand. It's not that I am stupid. It is just that I am lost in this new place. 
but I don't know how to tell her. I pull away from the rest. Beside me is a tree, shorter than others. That does not seem to belong. It is small and alone like me. A few hard green apples hang from its branches. I twist one off. It fits perfectly in my hand. We hold our apples and run and slide down a hill. The dogs race ahead. Their ears blow backward, inside out, pink and shiny. At the bottom of the hill is a little crooked house made of wood. I wonder if a cow lives in it or a goat. Perhaps it is the home of a shepherd. In the house is a wooden machine with a metal handle. I see no cow or goat or shepherd. The house is here for some other reason. Our teacher lines us up. One by one, we plop our apples into the machine. I will be last to drop my small green one. My teacher seems about to speak. Then she shrugs and smiles. A boy shouts, hey! He moves toward me as if to stop me from putting in my little green apple. But he is too late. It has already gone. There are blades inside the machine that chop the apples. Ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. The students begin to push on the handle that presses the chopped up apples. The skin and the pulp stay in the bag while the juice flows through. I hang back, not sure if I should be with the others. Pushing the handle must be hard. They lean against it and grunt. I am strong. I can help. I take a step toward them. Anna calls and waves to me to come beside her. A boy makes a place for me on the handle between them. I am pleased. We push and push. It is hard, but we are working together and we can do it. The juice drips down. Drip, drip, drip. Our teacher has brought paper cups. We line up again, fill them and drink. We lick our lips. I think I taste my special apple. Apple cider, Anna says. That must be what we are drinking. I say the word inside myself where it can't be heard. Apple. The other word is too difficult. Our teacher is speaking. She is holding out a bag for our cups and making signs that we must get ready to leave. Anna sits next to me in the wagon as we ride back. There is a boy on my other side. Jim, he says, and points at himself. I nod. Jim, I say silently. Hay tickles my arms and makes Anna sneeze. It smells of dry sunshine. Jim pats his stomach and a belch jumps up from his throat. Everyone laughs. I do too. Laughs sound the same as at home, just the same. So do sneezes and belches and lots of things. It is the words that are strange, but soon I will know their words. I will blend with the others the way my apple blended with the cider. I take a deep breath. Apple, I say. Anna claps. I smile and smile and smile. It is my first outside myself word. There will be more.
Wellington by Michael Bond, illustrated by R. W. Alley. Mr. and Mrs. Brown first met Paddington on a railway platform. In fact, that was how he came to have such an unusual name for a bear, because Paddington was the name of the station. The Browns were waiting to meet their daughter, Judy, when Mr. Brown noticed something small and furry near the left luggage office. It looks like a bear, he said. A bear, repeated Mrs. Brown. In Paddington Station? Don't be silly, Henry. There can't be. But Mr. Brown was right. It was sitting on an old leather suitcase marked Wanted on Voyage. And as they drew near, it stood up and politely raised its hat. Good afternoon, it said. May I help you? It's very kind of you, said Mr. Brown. But as a matter of fact, we were wondering if we could help you. You're a very small bear, said Mrs. Brown. Where are you from? The bear looked around carefully before replying, Darkest Peru. I'm not really supposed to be here at all. I'm a stowaway. You don't mean to say you've come all the way from South America on your own? exclaimed Mrs. Brown. Whatever did you do for food? Unlocking the suitcase, the bear took out an almost empty glass jar. I ate marmalade. It said, bears like marmalade. Mrs. Brown looked at the label around the bear's neck. It said, quite simply, please look after this bear. Thank you. Oh, Henry, she cried. We can't leave him here all by himself. There's no knowing what might happen to him. Can't he come home and stay with us? Stay with us? Repeated Mr. Brown nervously. He looked down at the bear. Er, would you like that? He asked. That is, he added hastily, if you don't have nothing else planned. Oh, yes, replied the bear. I would like that very much. I've nowhere to go and everyone seems in such a hurry. That settles it, said Mrs. Brown. Now, you must be thirsty after your journey. Mr. Brown can get you some tea while I go and meet our daughter, Judy. But Mary, said Mr. Brown, we don't even know its name. Mrs. Brown thought for a moment. I know, she said. We'll call him Paddington after the station. Paddington, the bear tested it several times to make sure. It sounds very important. Mr. Brown tried it out next. Follow me, Paddington, he said. I'll take you to the snack bar. Mr. Brown was as good as his word. Paddington had never seen so many snacks on one tray. He didn't know which to try first. He was so hungry and thirsty that he climbed up onto the table to get a better look. Mr. Brown turned away, pretending he had tea with a bear at Paddington Station every day of his life. Henry, cried Mrs. Brown when she arrived with Judy. What are you doing to that poor bear? Paddington jumped up to raise his hat and in haste he slipped on a strawberry tart, skidded on the cream and fell over backward into his cup of tea. I think 
we'd better go before anything else happens, said Mr. Brown. Judy took hold of Paddington's paw. Come along, she said. We'll take you home and you can meet Mrs. Bird and my brother, Jonathan. Mr. Brown led the way to a waiting taxi. Number 32 Windsor Gardens, please, he said. The driver stared at Paddington. Bears is extra, he growled. Sticky bears is twice as much and make sure none of it comes off on my interior. It was clean when I set out this morning. The sun was shining as they drove out of the station and there were cars and big red buses everywhere. Paddington waved to some people waiting at a bus stop and several of them waved back. It was all very friendly. Paddington tapped the taxi driver on his shoulder. It isn't a bit like darkest Peru, he announced. The man jumped at the sound of Paddington's voice. Cream, he said bitterly. Cream and jam all over my coat. He slid the little window behind him shut. Oh dear, Henry, murmured Mrs. Brown. I wonder if we're doing the right thing. Fortunately, before anyone had time to answer, they arrived at Windsor Gardens and Judy helped Paddington onto the pavement. Now you're going to meet Mrs. Bird, she said. She looks after us. She's a bit fierce at times, but she doesn't really mean it. I'm sure you'll like her. Paddington felt his knees begin to wobble. I'm sure I shall if you say so, he replied. The thing is, will she like me? Goodness gracious, exclaimed Mrs. Bird. What have you got there? It's not a what, said Judy. It's a bear called Paddington, and he's coming to stay with us. A bear, said Mrs. Bird, as Paddington raised his hat. Well, he has good manners. I'll say that for him. I'm afraid I stepped on a jam tart by mistake, said Paddington. I can see that, said Mrs. Bird. You'd better have a bath before you're very much older. Judy can turn it on for you. I dare say you'll be wanting some marmalade too. I think she likes you, whispered Judy. Paddington had never been in a bathroom before. While the water was running, he made himself at home. First of all, he tried writing his new name on the steam on the mirror. Then he used Mr. Brown's shaving cream to draw a map of Peru on the floor. It wasn't until a drip landed on his head that he remembered what he was supposed to be doing. He soon discovered that getting into a bath is one thing, but it's quite another matter getting out again, especially when it's full of soapy water. Paddington tried calling out, help, at first in a quiet voice, so as not to disturb anyone, then very loudly, help, help. When that didn't work, he began bailing the water out with his hat, but the hat had several holes in it and his map of Peru soon turned into a sea of foam. Suddenly, Jonathan and Judy burst into the bathroom and lifted a dripping Paddington onto the floor. Thank goodness you're all right, cried Judy. We heard you calling out. Fancy making such a mess, said Jonathan admiringly. You should have pulled the plug out. 
Oh, said Paddington, I never thought of that. When Paddington came downstairs, he looked so clean that no one could possibly be cross with him. His fur was all soft and silky, his nose gleamed, and his paws had lost all traces of the jam and cream. The Browns made room for him in a small armchair, and Mrs. Bird brought him a pot of tea and a plate of hot buttered toast and marmalade. Now, said Mrs. Brown, you must tell us all about yourself. I'm sure you must have had lots of adventures. I have, said Paddington earnestly. Things are always happening to me. I'm that sort of bear. He settled back in the armchair. I was brought up by my Aunt Lucy in darkest Peru, he began but she had to go into a home for retired bears in Lima. He closed his eyes thoughtfully and a hush fell over the room as everyone waited expectantly. After a while, when nothing happened, they began to get restless. Mr. Brown tried coughing, then he reached across and poked Paddington. Well, I never he said. I do believe he's fast asleep. After all that's happened to him, said Mrs. Brown, is it any wonder? and Me by Arthur Doros. Pictures by Rudy Gutierrez. Good morning, I called to Papa. Buenos dias, Papa says back to me. He pushes sleep from his eyes. I am awake and ready to go. It will be a great day for Papa and me. Cantemos, cantemos, we sing. I sing high, he sings low. Our different voices go together. We are always cooking up something new. He wants eggs. I say pancakes. Papa brings down a plate. He flips, I catch. We invent a special food. Sabroso! Papa says it is so tasty. Today, I know just where to go. Crossing the street, Papa says, La mano, and takes my hand. I have an idea. Papa has an idea, too. At the park, I splash in puddles. Papa steps around them. Aquaman, Waterman, he calls me. Water here, water everywhere. Papa swings me over. There's a tree I want to climb. I can't reach the branches. Papa boosts me. Alto, alto, high. I say, I sway with the wind, showing Papa what I can do. I am flying, flying, cuidado. Be careful, Papa says to me. Mira, look, I tell him. A bird is up there, aguila, eagle, Papa tells me. He says my eyes see things he can't see. In the sand, I draw Papa's face. La cara, he says, and draws me. I want to swim in the water. No ahora, Papa says. Not now. 
It's time to go. I see our bus, the number 43. On the bus, Papa stands with his head near the ceiling. I can look out the window. I tell Papa a story, and he tells a story to me. Un cuento, he says, about when he was a kid. Our stop, our stop, I say to Papa. I push the button and the bus slows down. Papa and me race the rest of the way. I can do some things better than Papa. He can do some better than me. Ganador, ganador. Who is the winner? I knock on the door. No one answers. Otra vez. Papa says, I try again. The door creaks open. Abuela and Abuelo, my grandparents. Papa's mother and father are waiting for us. Abrazos. They give hugs to me and Papa. Valentine's Day is Cool by Kimberly and James Dean. I meow you. It was the day before Valentine's Day and Pete was riding his skateboard home when he saw his friend Callie. She was holding a big red heart that said love. Have you finished your Valentine's Day cards? Asked Callie. No, Valentine's Day is not cool, Pete said. Oh, Pete, Valentine's Day is my favorite holiday. It's a day to tell people how special they are to you, Callie insisted. Pete skated on, but something in the back of his mind told him that Callie might be right. By the time Pete got home, he had decided that Callie was right about Valentine's Day. So he got out his pencils, paper, crayons, and markers and sat down at the kitchen table. First, Pete started to work on a card for his friend Larry. Pete made several cards with big red hearts, but he was not happy with his work. Pete wanted to make the perfect cards for every cat in his class. I'll never get all these cards done in time, Pete told his mom. Pete's mom smiled. Just do your best, she said. Just tell Larry why he is cool. There is something cool about every cat. Pete got back to work. He thought hard about what was cool about Larry. To Larry, happy Valentine's Day from Pete. Perfect, Pete said. After that, it didn't take Pete long to make cards for all the boys. To Josh, to Trey, to Rob, to John. Then Pete made special cards for all the girls and wrote Love Pete on each one. And of course, he made the biggest heart-shaped card for his mom. The next day, Pete and Callie waited for the bus together. I decided you were right. Valentine's Day is cool. That's awesome. Callie said, by the way, I am having a Valentine's Day party at my house after school if you want to come. The bus pulled up then 
and P. M. Callie got on. Mr. Ted, the bus driver, smiled and said good morning. But as soon as they were in their seats, P. put his head in his paws. What's wrong? Callie asked. I forgot to make a card for Mr. Ted, he cried. Then Pete thought, but I can make him an awesome card before we get to school. Pete pulled out a piece of paper and colored pencils from his backpack. He began to draw. Happy Valentine's Day. Thanks for picking us up every day for school, Pete and Callie said as they handed Mr. Ted his valentine. Thank you, Mr. Ted told them. You just made my day. What about Mrs. Gold, the crossing guard? We need to make her a valentine too, Pete practically shouted. Let's do it, Callie said. Let's make valentines for everyone. Pete and Kelly got super busy making cards for everyone. To Mrs. Gold, Happy Valentine's Day. After school, Pete went to Callie's party. He rang the bell and then he froze. Callie opened the door only to find her friend in a panic. What's wrong, Pete? I forgot something very important, Pete admitted. What? Callie asked. I just realized I forgot to make a card for you, Pete said. That's okay, Pete. Cards are just a way of showing you care. Hanging out with you, that's way better than any card. This is the best Valentine's Day ever. And happy Valentine's Day to you. Love, Pete. Falling for Autumn by Kimberly and James Dean. It is the first day of fall and Pete the cat is feeling blue. I like summer better, he says. In summer, I can swim and surf and play at the beach. Maybe you just need to remind yourself of all the things you love about autumn. Mom suggests. Hmm, Pete says. I'll try. Pete finds Grandma in the kitchen. She's baking delicious pumpkin pies. The whole house smells sweet and spicy. Pete loves helping Grandma bake pumpkin pie, but he loves helping eat it even more. After the baking is done, Pete picks a squat orange pumpkin from the counter and slips it into his backpack as a souvenir. Next, Pete heads to the town corn maze. Pete and his friends wander through the long twisty paths made of tall corn stalks. The best part of the corn maze is getting lost and having to start over again. As he leaves, Pete plucks a golden corn cob from the maze and places it inside his backpack. Then Pete visits Grandpa, who is knitting on the porch. Grandpa helps Pete use the knitting needles to knit the yarn into cool patterns. Together, Pete and Grandpa make a long, cozy scarf for Pete to wear. When they're done, Pete chooses a little ball of leftover yarn and places it inside his backpack. 
Next, Pete goes to the hayride at the park. Pete, Bob, Mom, Dad, and Grandpa all pile into a wagon filled with hay. They go on a bumpy wagon ride around the park. Woohoo! Pete shouts. At the end of the ride, Pete grabs a handful of sweet smelling hay from the wagon and stuffs it into his backpack. Pete heads over to the apple orchard where he and Callie go apple picking. They eat sweet apple donuts and drink hot apple cider and fill their buckets with apples of all different shapes and sizes. Before he leaves, Pete chooses a round red apple and drops it into his backpack. Next, Pete stops by the park. He plays touch football with Bob and their friends. Pete scores a touchdown and everyone cheers. After the game, Pete grabs Bob's football and stuffs it into his backpack. It barely fits. Bob won't mind if I borrow this, Pete says. Finally, Pete heads back home, but he stops in his front yard, which is covered in bright leaves falling from the trees. Pete helps his dad rake the leaves into big colorful mounds. Then Pete runs and jumps into all the leaf piles. After he's done jumping, Pete picks a bunch of red and gold and orange leaves and stuffs them into his backpack. Pete's backpack is bursting with fall souvenirs. He can't wait to show mom. I love autumn, Pete says. Wonderful, says mom. You know, these would make great decorations for Thanksgiving. So Pete helps mom fill a basket with all his mementos. They place the basket at the center of the table. You did a great job, Pete, says mom. It's beautiful, says dad. Is that my football? Asks Bob. Just then, the doorbell rings. The Thanksgiving guests are here. All of Pete's family and friends gather around the dining room table. They tell stories and laugh at jokes while they eat. Everyone is having a great time. Pete looks around the table and smiles. He loves lots of things about autumn, but Pete knows what he loves most all year long. his family and friends. Pete the Cat, Trick or Pete? by James Dean. It's Halloween. Pete the cat is excited to go trick or treating in his superhero costume. I hope nothing too spooky happens, says Pete. Don't worry, says Pete's dad. We have our flashlights. Let's go trick or treating, says Pete. Boo. Pete and his dad walk outside. Whoosh! The wind rustles the leaves. Pete sees something moving in the tree. I wonder what it is. Do you know? It's just an owl. That wasn't too spooky, says Pete. They arrive at a neighbor's house. Pete rings the bell. He hears a strange sound coming to the door. Boo, meow, trick or treat. 
Welcome. It's just Callie, Pete says. She's not too spooky. Callie joins Pete and his dad, trick-or-treating. At the next house, there is something in the yard. What could it be? Phew! It's just a scarecrow, says Pete. That's not too spooky. Pete rings the doorbell. Trick or treat, says Pete and Callie. Happy Halloween. Let's see who's behind the door. Awesome costume, says Pete. Very spooky, but not too spooky. Thank you, says Mrs. Gold, the crossing guard. At the next house, there is something glowing on the steps. Cool, says Pete. Jack-o'-lanterns. Callie rings the doorbell. Trick or treat, says Pete and Callie. Happy Halloween. It's Pete's teacher. One piece of candy each, she says. Suddenly, they hear something behind them. What was that? asks Callie. Oh, it's just our friend Emma, says Pete. Not spooky, but groovy. One last house, and then we'll go home, says Pete's dad. Pete rings the bell. Ding dong. Yikes, it's a spooky ghost, screams Pete. Don't be silly, Pete. It's just me, says Grandma. Callie and Pete get treats and hugs. Trick-or-treating wasn't too spooky at all. It was actually full of sweet surprises. Happy Halloween! Pick a Pumpkin by Patricia Tote, illustrated by Jarvis. Pick a pumpkin from the patch. Tall and lean or short and fat. Vivid orange, ghostly white. Or speckled green might be just right. Pumpkin snugly in your arms. Wheel a wagon through the farm. Stop for mugs of spicy punch. Toffee apples sweet to crunch. Homeward from the pumpkin patch. All your goodies stacked in back. Now... Brush or wipe your pumpkin clean. Rub it smooth and make it gleam. Find the perfect carving space lined with papers just in case you make a mess. Next, gather other things you need. A bowl, a spoon for scooping seeds. A tool to trace a spooky face and plastic saws for cutting shapes. Then, invite a round, a friend or two. Form a pumpkin carving crew. Let grown-ups cut the top a bit, big enough for hands to fit. Reach down deep into the hole. Grab the seeds and give a pull. Lumpy chunks, sticky strings, clumpy seeds, guts and things. With the spoon, scrape sides neatly. Clean the inside out completely. Now all together. Carve the eyes, giant circles 
of surprise. Small slit sleeping or one eye peeping. Cross-eyed crazy, angry lazy. And below those, make a nose. A triangle, a pinprick, a nose that grows from thin to thick. Under the nose is where the mouth goes. A kiss, a frown, a toothy grin, a zigzag gap cut long and thin, a smirk, a snarl, an eerie O, or pointy fangs all in a row. But wait! Before you light your new creation, first it's time for decorations. Cobwebs strung from post to post. Rings of gauzy dancing ghosts. Spiders, tombstones, dangling bats. Skeletons and witches' hats. Now quick, slip on gear to trick or treat and grab a sack to hold your sweets. Lift your pumpkin up with pride. March it to a place outside. Set it safely on the ground and call the crew to gather round. Ask someone to strike a match. Watch the candle's wick will catch. See it glow outside your door. Look, it's not a pumpkin anymore. It's a jack-o'-lantern. Its red hot eyes will gaze and flicker. Its fiery grin will blaze and snicker to guard your house while you have fun. Happy Halloween, everyone! Pumpkin Jack, written and illustrated by Will Hubble. When Tim carved his first pumpkin, it was fierce and funny and just perfect. A jack-o'-lantern this good deserved a name, so Tim gave it one. Jack. Long after the best trick-or-treat candy was eaten, Tim still kept Jack. At night, when a candle made Jack's face dance on the wall and filled the dark with warm pumpkin smells, Tim felt Jack was almost magic. Yet, too soon, the spell was broken. This pumpkin is beginning to rot, announced Mom. It's time to throw it out. Tim knew it was useless to argue. He carried Jack to the garden, which was filled with the brown ghosts of last summer's plants. A dead garden is better than a trash can, thought Tim. Still, it made him sad to leave Jack outside and alone. Whenever chores or play brought Tim to the garden, he looked at Jack. Every time, Jack was different. He became wrinkled and his fierce smile began to look silly. Mold spread over Jack's bright orange skin. As the days turned colder, Jack grew flatter. Winter began. Soon Jack was hidden beneath snow and Tim forgot about him. The cold, heavy jacket days came. Snowman and sliding days, indoor days, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Valentine's. 
When all these days had passed and the March winds melted the snow, Tim found Jack. There wasn't much left, just a faded and crumpled pumpkin skin, a stem and a few seeds. Jack's Halloween magic was a distant memory now. Tim scraped a thin blanket of earth over the last bits of his pumpkin. Goodbye, Jack, he whispered. When the spring turned barefoot warm, a tiny sprout appeared where Jack had been. Tim found it and guessed what it was. In the days that followed, Tim weeded and watered and watched the sprout. Slowly and steadily, the plant changed and grew. It branched and spread a web of vines over the ground, but no pumpkins appeared. The days turned hot. Flowers opened on the plant each morning, yellow stars that twisted shut forever in the afternoon. Still, there were no pumpkins. Finally, Tim found a little green ball growing behind a crumpled blossom. A pumpkin! Tim let out a whoop and ran to show his mom. By August, the plant had spilled onto the lawn. Tim's favorite game became pumpkin hunting. He carefully waded among the leaves, searching for green pumpkins like hidden treasures. School began again and the days cooled. Tim had less time to visit the garden. When he did, the pumpkin plant seemed tired. There were few new leaves and the old tattered ones no longer hid the fat green pumpkins. Then, one October morning, Tim woke to see frost coating the garden. The frozen plants seemed changed to pale blue glass. After school, Tim discovered what the frost had done. The pumpkin plant's leaves were as limp as wet paper. It was dying. Tim searched among the withered leaves for the unripe pumpkins. He picked them and put them on the front porch, hoping for one more change. By Halloween, the pumpkins had ripened to bright orange. There were many, for the plant had been generous. Tim was generous too. He gave away all but one. From jack-o'-lantern to seed to pumpkin again, the circle was almost complete. Now it was time for Tim to do his part. He gave his pumpkin a face. It smiled at him in a fierce and funny way. Tim smiled too and said, Welcome back, Jack. Pumpkin Soup by Helen Cooper. Deep in the woods, there's an old white cabin with pumpkins in the garden. There's a good smell of soup. And at night, with luck, you might see a bagpiping cat through the window and a squirrel with a banjo and a small singing duck. Pumpkin soup, the best you ever tasted. Made by the cat who slices up the pumpkin. Made by the squirrel who stirs in the water. Made by the duck who scoops up a pipkin of salt 
and tips in just enough. They slurp their soup and play their song, then pop off to bed in a quilt stitched together by the cat, embroidered by the squirrel, and filled with fine feathers from the duck, and is peaceful in the old white cabin. Everyone has his own job to do. Everyone is happy, or so it seems. That's mine, squeaked the squirrel. Stirring is my job, give it back. You're much too small, snapped the cat. We'll cook the way we always have. But the duck held on tight until the squirrel tugged with all his might. And whoops, the spoon spun through the air and bopped the cat on the head. Then there was trouble, a horrible squabble, a row, a racket, a rumpus in the old white cabin. I'm not staying here, wailed the duck. You never let me help with anything. And he packed up a wheelbarrow, put on his hat, and waddled away. You'll be back, stormed the cat, after we've cleaned up. And the squirrel shook his spoon in the air, but the duck didn't come back. Not for breakfast, not even for lunch. I'll find him, scoffed the cat. He'll be hiding outside. I bet he's in the pumpkin patch. But the duck was not in the pumpkin patch. They could not find him anywhere. So they waited all that long afternoon. The cat watched the door, the squirrel paced the floor. That duck will be sorry when he comes home, they muttered. But the duck didn't come home, not even at soup time. The soup wasn't tasty. They made it too salty. They didn't feel hungry anyway. They both sobbed over supper and their tears dripped into the soup and made it even saltier. We should have let him stir the soup, sniffled the squirrel. He was only trying to help, wept the cat. Let's go out and look for him. The cat and the squirrel were scared as they wandered down the path in the dark, dark woods. They feared for the duck, all alone with the trees and the foxes and the wolves and the witches and the bears. But they couldn't find him. On and on they trudged until they reached the edge of a steep, steep cliff. Maybe he fell down that, wailed the cat. I'll save him, squeaked the squirrel, and he scrambled down on a long, shaky rope. He searched all around on the ground, but he couldn't find the duck. Then the cat whispered in a sad little voice, Duck might have found some better friends. He might, sighed the squirrel, friends who let him help. And the more they thought about it, as they plodded back, the more they were sure they were right. But when they were almost home, they saw light shining from the old white cabin. It's duck, they shrieked as they burst through the door. And the duck was so happy to see them. He was also very hungry, and though it was late, they thought they would all make some pumpkin soup. When the duck stirred, the cat and the squirrel didn't say a word. Not even when the duck stirred the soup so fast that it slopped right out of the pot. Not even when the pot got burnt. Then the duck showed the squirrel how to measure out the salt and the soup was still 
the best you ever tasted. So, once again, it was peaceful in the old white cabin. Until the duck said, I think I'll play the bagpipes now. Round is a Tortilla, a Book of Shapes by Roseanne Greenfield Tong, illustrated by John Para. Round are sombreros, round is the moon, round are the trumpets that blare out a tune. Round are campanas that chime and ring, Round are the nests where the swallows sing. Round are tortillas and tacos too. Round is a pot of abuela stew. I can name more round things. Can you? Square are the letters. We know them well. Square is a board game to help us spell. Square are ventanas that give us a view. Square is my clock and my photos too. Square is the park and the zocalo. Square is a fountain from long ago. How many square things do you know? Rectangles are carts with bells that chime and cold paletas in summertime. Stone metates inside our casa help us grind our corn to masa. Rectangles are flags that fly above the scoreboard way up high. How many rectangles do you spy? Triangles are crunchy chips for guacamole and other dips. Triangles sail on the breeze. They line the shore and glide on seas. Sandias chilled in tubs of ice. Quesadillas by the slice. Triangles can beat the heat. What other triangles can you eat? Oval is my favorite locket. A special pebble in my pocket. I find ovals at the store. Huevos, olives, beans galore. Can you name a couple more? Stars for parties, stars for light. Lining streets with colors bright. There are so many shapes wherever you go. How many more shapes do you know? Stumpkin by Lucy Ruth Cummins. It was a few days before Halloween. Outside a little shop in a big city, a shopkeeper placed some pumpkins on the shelves. A girl came and looked at the pumpkins. When she was done, she picked one up and carried it away. The other pumpkins worried after their friend. But later, they spotted him across the street and way up high. He was a jack-o'-lantern. Beneath his lovely stem, he now had two triangle eyes, a nose, and a giant toothy smile. He had a new home, a perch all to himself, high above the street. What more could anyone want? thought the pumpkins. 
They were thrilled for their friend and thrilled that they too might one day be jack-o'-lanterns. They were all happily lost in thought, imagining themselves as jack-o'-lanterns when one pumpkin realized something was very wrong. Poor little pumpkin, poor little stemless pumpkin, with just a stump, not a stem. Poor little stumpkin. Still, there was plenty to like about stumpkin. He was a handsome pumpkin, as orange as a traffic cone. He was as big as a basketball and twice as round. Stem schmem. Who knows? Some people might even prefer a stemless pumpkin. Days passed and more people came. Some pumpkins left. Some pumpkins stayed. It wasn't yet Halloween. There were still plenty of windows that needed jack-o'-lanterns. Who would be lucky enough to take home Stumpkin? As orange as an orange, as big as a basketball, round. He was very nearly the perfect pumpkin. Very nearly, truly. The next day, new people came. And the shopkeeper's cat settled on Stumpkin's smooth top. Then it happened. A brilliant baby chose Stumpkin until a bad dog ruined it and the baby changed his mind. Oh well, thought Stumpkin. It was the day of Halloween. There were still a few empty windows. Two were left on the shopkeeper's shelf. A boy came. And when the boy left, Stumpkin remained. The gourd, thought Stumpkin. I guess that's that. It was Halloween night and the shop had closed. There were no more days left. The shopkeeper scooped up poor Stumpkin and carried him off. Stumpkin wouldn't be getting a window and he wouldn't be getting a new home. He already had a home. And that made Stumpkin very, very happy. Thomas and Friends Tale of the Brave Illustrated by Tommy Stubbs Created by Britt Allcroft It was a busy and bustling day at the clay pits on the island of Sodor. Thomas was there helping out while a bridge on his branch line was being repaired. He liked working at the pits but those troublesome engines, Bill and Ben, kept playing tricks on him. There was no time for tricks that day, though. A friendly engine named Timothy warned everybody that rain might be coming, and if it starts to rain, these clay walls will get really unstable. We'd best be careful today. That afternoon, dark clouds filled the sky and cold rain started to fall. As Thomas cautiously rolled down some slippery tracks, the clay wall next to him 
began to drip and ooze. To his surprise, he saw strange marks under the sliding mud. They looked like giant footprints. But what kind of animal has feet that big? Thomas wondered. Watch out! Ben and Bill shouted. Before Thomas could get a good look at the footprints, the troublesome engines pushed him safely out of the way of a giant, gooey landslide. The next morning, Sir Topham Hatt addressed the engines at the shunting yards. Bill and Ben are best known for playing tricks on other engines, but by rescuing Thomas from yesterday's landslide, they have proven that they are really useful engines. All the engines peeped happily, then rolled off to work. But Thomas couldn't stop thinking about the footprints. Thomas returned to the clay pits, but he couldn't see the footprints. The tracks were closed and covered with mud. Later, at Brendam Docks, Thomas told Percy about the footprints. I don't know what could have made them. They were bigger than any animal on Sodor. Do you mean they are from a monster? Percy wished. Don't be silly, Percy. There's no such thing as monsters. For the rest of the day, Percy couldn't stop thinking about monsters. He didn't want to see anything scary. But later, as he came to the top of a hill, he did see a strange shape in the distance. What's that? Percy puffed. I hope it's not a monster. Percy reversed and raced backward all the way to the docks. It's the monster from the clay pits. Percy whistled as he barreled into the docks. Everyone watched as something rumbled down the rails. That be no monster. Salty puffed. That be an engine. I don't usually get mistaken for a monster, the big engine tooted. Mind you, they do call me Gator. It seems they think my long water tanks make me look like an alligator. Percy felt very silly for thinking the new engine was a monster. Everywhere Percy went that night, he thought he saw strange creatures. Old trees and haystacks became monsters with clutching claws. Fluttering laundry on a clothesline looked like ghosts. Percy was so scared, he didn't even deliver the mail. He asked Thomas to pull the mail trucks. Thomas agreed to do it for one night. The next morning, Thomas heard that the bridge on his branch line was open again. He was happy to go back to his usual work, but James was unhappy. Sir Topham Hatt had asked him to pick up a load of scrap metal. It's not fair, James puffed. Thomas gets to pull coaches, and a fine engine like myself is sent to haul junk. As James rolled off in a grumpy mood, he saw Percy. Hello, scaredy engine, he puffed. See any monsters lately? You can tease me if you want, Percy peeped. But Thomas saw giant footprints at the pits. There might be monsters on Sodor. Puff and nonsense, James remarked as he rolled to the scrapyard. James was busy thinking about monsters when he turned the corner into the scrapyard 
and came face to face with jagged teeth and crooked claws. No, James peeped. Help! Hello, mate. Reg, the scrap crane, puffed. Looks like that scrap gave you a fright. James realized it was only a pile of old gears and broken metal in front of him. I'm not afraid of some broken old machines, he puffed. Down at the docks, Percy was pleasantly surprised to find Gator waiting in a siding. What are you doing here? Percy asked. I'm heading to a new job, Gator puffed. Unfortunately, my ship has been delayed. I have to wait until a new one can be found. At least you don't have to worry about sea monsters, Percy peeped. For all I know, sea monsters would be worried about me, Gator puffed with a laugh. Wow, Percy peeped. I wish I were as brave as you. Being brave is not the same as not feeling scared, Percy. Being brave is what you do even when you feel scared. You might be braver than you think. Inspired by Gator's words, Percy decided to be brave and pull the mail trucks all by himself that night. His boiler bubbled boldly as he chugged across the countryside. Nothing scared him, not the fluttering laundry, not the old gnarled trees. Gator is right, he tooted. I can be brave. Grumpy James was not nearly as happy. He needed to haul the flying kipper, which was full of fresh fish. As he rounded a bend in the woods, he saw a large, shadowy shape. He didn't realize it was only Gator. His whistle screaming, James raced away. He was so frightened that he missed a red signal and jumped off the rails into a pond. James was very embarrassed that Rocky had to hoist him out of the pond. When the other engines saw him at Knapford Junction, they had a good laugh. You were meant to deliver the fish, Henry puffed, not throw them back in the water. James didn't like these jokes one bit. He'd show everyone that Percy was the real scaredy engine, not him. That night, as Percy was delivering the mail, he saw something unusual on the tracks. Something big. This definitely wasn't a haystack or a funny looking engine. It groaned and flashed its big teeth in the moonlight. Percy didn't want to be brave anymore. He dropped his mail trucks and raced back to the sheds as fast as his little wheels would carry him. The monster! Percy whistled as he rolled to the sheds. I really saw it! None of the other engines believed him. You probably saw another haystack, James mocked. Percy looked desperately to Thomas. Tell them, there really are monsters on Sodor. Tell them about the footprints you saw. I don't know what I saw, Thomas peeped, but I don't think it was a monster. There's no such thing as monsters, steamed Henry. Never was and never will be. Admit it, Percy. You're just a scaredy engine, James peeped. But James, you got a fright when you saw Gator, Percy puffed. No, I didn't, James steamed. I just missed a signal in the dark. He looked at the other engines. 
I wasn't scared like Percy. Early the next morning, Percy steamed away from the sheds to find his mail trucks. On the way, he saw Gator and asked him to come along. You'll know what to do if we see any monsters. Monsters? Gator puffed with a laugh. You are a funny little engine. Well, it's good to have a new friend on the island, Percy peeped. I'm glad you're not going away. But I am. My ship is here. I leave tonight. Percy couldn't believe it. Later that morning, Thomas saw James with a truck full of scraps. It was at the turn where Percy had seen the monster. James, Thomas tooted. You made a monster out of scrap metal to give Percy a fright? It was only a little joke, James replied. Not to Percy. You need to find him and tell him what you did and apologize. The two engines split up to find Percy. Thomas found Percy at Knapford Station. He tried to tell him about James's prank, but Percy wouldn't listen. I thought you were my friend, Percy peeped. When you told me about the footprints, I believed you. And when I told you about the monster, you should have believed me. Maybe I should go far away like Gator. Percy puffed off in a huff. Percy raced down to the docks and told Cranky to hoist him onto Gator's ship. Are you sure Sir Topham Hatt wants you on this ship? The big crane asked. Yes, Percy peeped. I'm going to work far away like Gator. Percy was loaded onto the deck of the ship. It wasn't long before Gator was lowered next to him. I'm going to work in a faraway land, Percy puffed. I'll show everyone how brave I can be. Gator thought for a moment. But running away from your problems is not very brave, Percy. Thomas chugged across Sodor, looking for Percy. But when he heard a distant ship blow its horn, a terrible thought flew into his funnel. Oh, no! Thomas peeped. I know where Percy is going. Gator's ship was just leaving when Thomas reached the docks. Cranky! He whistled. You have to stop that ship. It's an emergency. Cranky swung his hook and caught the ship's rail. His heavy chain rattled and strained as the great boat tried to pull away. The force was too great for Cranky. He started to tip over. Creak! Workmen on the ship tried to knock the hook loose with sledgehammers. Luckily, the captain was able to stop the ship before Cranky was pulled off the docks. Percy, come down, Thomas whistled. You can't leave. I'm sorry I didn't believe you. Gator peered over the railing of the ship. Percy's not here. Percy, Cranky groaned. I unloaded him half an hour ago. Thomas could think of only one other place where Percy might go. Night was falling as Percy quietly rolled through the clay pits. He stopped when he reached the warning signs. If 
I can find the footprints, it will prove the monster is real, he thought. Then everyone will know how brave I am. At that moment, James rolled up. He started to apologize, but Percy interrupted him. I'm braver than you'll ever be, Percy puffed. James didn't like Percy's attitude. If you're so brave, why have you stopped at the danger signs? Being brave doesn't mean not being careful, Percy peeped. That's just what I thought a scaredy engine would say, puffed James as he pushed past Percy and the signs. He rolled into the narrow gorge. The cliff walls were still drippy and loose from the landslide. Oh, monster, James called. Come out, come out, wherever you are. Suddenly, James saw something in the moonlight. It had claws and teeth. The monster, wheezed James. He tried to back up, but the walls began to rumble and tumble. It's another landslide, Percy peeped. You have to go forward, James. The little green engine raced ahead to push James out of the way. Rocks hit Percy and mud slid into his cab and the big monster landed right in front of him. That was when Percy made a discovery. It wasn't a monster. It was some sort of rock. The next day, Percy went to the steamworks for a good cleaning. He had lots of mud in his funnel and gears. While he was there, James and Thomas visited and apologized. I hope we're still friends. Thomas peeped. Of course we are, Percy replied. We all are. All three engines wished and whistled with joy. That afternoon, Thomas carried a group of scientists to the clay pits. They were amazed by what Percy had found in the mud. It's a dinosaur fossil. One scientist explained to Thomas, Fossils are what we call bones that have been in the ground for millions of years. So the monster was really a dinosaur from a long, long time ago, Thomas peeped in amazement. He couldn't wait to tell Percy. Soon the fossils were put on display in the Knapford Town Square. Excited families and curious engines came from all over the island of Sodor to see them. A perfect specimen of a Megalosaurus, the Earl of Sodor exclaimed, how marvelous. Sir Topham Hatt addressed the crowd. Today was made possible by a very special engine. Percy is not only a really useful fossil hunter, but also one of the bravest engines on Sodor. The people clapped and cheered, and the engines blew their whistles, but Percy was nowhere to be seen. Percy was at Brendam Docks saying goodbye to Gator. Gator's ship was ready to depart again. As it steamed into the distance, Thomas and James pulled up alongside Percy. I guess you have to be brave to say goodbye to someone too, Percy peeped. Did Gator say that? Thomas asked. No, but he did say something else wise, Percy puffed, and his two friends rolled in closer to hear. He said not to let James near any ponds or fish again. 
Even James thought that was a funny joke. The three friends giggled and whistled with joy. In the early 1940s, a loving father crafted a small blue wooden engine for his son, Christopher. The stories that this father, the Reverend W. Audrey, made up to company the wonderful toy were first published in 1945. Reverend Audrey continued to create new adventures and characters until 1972, when he retired from writing. Tommy Stubbs has been an illustrator for several decades. Lately, he has been illustrating the newest tales of Thomas and his engine friends, including Hero of the Rails, Misty Island Rescue, Day of the Diesels, and King of the Railway. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe so you don't miss Thomas and Friends' next adventure. The Crayon's Book of Colors From the creators of the number one best-selling The Day the Crayons Quit by Drew DeWalt and Oliver Jeffers. Can you name the colors of Duncan's crayons? This is red crayon. Red crayon has colored strawberries, hearts, apples, a fire engine, and Santa Claus. This is purple crayon. Purple crayon has colored a dragon and some grapes. This is beige crayon. Beige crayon only colors wheat. This is gray crayon. Gray crayon has colored a rhino, a hippo, and an elephant and a baby penguin. This is white crayon. Can you see him? White crayon has colored a white cat in the snow. This is black crayon. Black crayon has colored beach balls and rainbows. This is green crayon. Green crayon has colored a dinosaur, a tree, a frog, and a bug and recycling crocodiles. This is yellow crayon. Yellow crayon has colored the sun. This is orange crayon. Orange crayon has also colored the sun. This is blue crayon. Blue crayon has colored an ocean, clouds, rain, and a river. This is pink crayon. Pink crayon has colored a princess, but would like to color a monster and a dinosaur and a cowboy. This is peach crayon. Peach Crayon hasn't decided what to draw yet. Look! Duncan has colored a new picture. Can you name the colors? What color is this? Plain. What's that? You said pink? That's correct. What color is this whale? What's that? I can't hear you. What color is it? You're right, it's orange. What color is this alligator? You're right, it's blue. What color is this monkey? It's green, a green monkey. That's kind of silly. 
What color is this bus? It's blue. Great job. What color is the water? It's green. That's right. Great job. What color is this bear? It's brown. What about this dinosaur? That's right, it's pink. What about this dragon? What? A purple dragon? Now that's silly. What about this horse? Did you say red? That's right. What color is this sun? Yep, it's orange. What about this little cat? That's right. It's a white cat. What color are his eyes? Did you say yellow? Great job. What color is this rock? You're right, it's black. Great job. Can you find more colors? The Crayons Trick or Treat by Drew Daywall and Oliver Jeffers. The crayons are ready for Halloween. They can't wait to fill their bags with treats. You know what you're supposed to say on Halloween, right? Of course we do. Orange knocks on the first door. Give us your candy, lady. I'm naked. What? Okay, that was all kinds of wrong, not to mention confusing. It's a holiday, you guys. Think holiday. Now let's try that again. Okay, we got this. Yeah, no problem. Green knocks on the next door. Merry Christmas! Happy American Cheese Month! Happy birthday! I'm naked! Okay, it's Halloween and we have to be polite too. Oh, polite! Okay, we get it now. Gray knocks on the door after that. Happy Halloween, please. I'm naked, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, for crying out loud. Points for good manners, I guess. It's a scary holiday, everyone. Oh, scary, okay. I got this one. White knocks on the door. Boo! Eek! That's not quite what I meant. It was close though. Gray steps forward again. Wait! Repeat after me. Trick or treat. There we go. The crayons all knock on the door. Trick or treat. And also, boom.
Diary of a Spider. Written by Doreen Cronin. Pictures by Harry Bliss. March 1st. Today was Grandparents' Day at school, so I brought Grandpa with me. He taught us three things. One, spiders are not insects. Insects have six legs. Two, without spiders, insects could take over the world. Three, butterflies taste better with a little barbecue sauce. March 16th, Grandpa says that in his day, flies and spiders did not get along. Spiders and flies rumble in the city. Things are different now. This is awesome! March 29th. Today in gym class, we learned how to catch the wind so we could travel to faraway places. Next. When I got home, I made up flashcards so I could practice. One, climb high. Two, release silk. Three, catch wind. Fly made up her own flashcard. One, fly. I'm starting to see why Grandpa doesn't like her. April 1st, went to the park with my sister today. We tried the seesaw. It didn't work. We tried the tire swing. It didn't work. We spun a huge sticky web on the water fountain. That worked. Eek! April 12th. Today was safety day at school. We learned that vacuums eat spider webs and are very, very dangerous. If we hear a vacuum, we should stop, drop, and run. Stop what we're doing, drop from the web, run like crazy. April 13th. We had a vacuum drill today. I stopped what I was doing, forgot where I was going, and ran screaming from the room. Help! We're having another drill tomorrow. April 17th. I'm sleeping over at Worm's house tonight. I hope they don't have leaves and rotten tomatoes for dinner again. More leaves, spider? May 7th. Mom said I was getting too big for my own skin, so I molted. That is so gross. May 8th. Today was show and tell, so I brought in my old skin. My teacher called on it to lead the Pledge of Allegiance. You there, why don't you get us started? June 5th. Daddy Longlegs made fun of Fly because she eats with her feet. Now she won't come out of her tree house. I'm going to find him and give him a piece of my mind. June 6th. I found Daddy Longlegs. He's a lot bigger than I thought he was. I gave him a piece of my lunch instead. June 7th. Fly's treehouse blew away in the wind today. So did Grandpa. June 18th. I got a postcard from Grandpa today. Dear Spider, Ooh la la, I landed in Paris. French bugs are delicious. Au revoir, Grandpa. Leg of French gnat. Give it a try. June 30th. Grandpa came home today. I couldn't wait to hear about how he rode the winds all the way over the ocean. Turns out he caught a breeze to the airport and napped in first class. July 2nd. Fly came over to play today. 
She got stuck in our web and her mom had to come get her. Grandpa laughed a little too hard. From now on, we have to play at Fly's house. July 9th. Today was my birthday. Grandpa decided I was old enough to know the secret to a long, happy life. Never fall asleep in a shoe. July 16th. Things I scare. One, Fly's mom. It wasn't his fault, mom. Two, tiny bugs. Three, people using water fountains at the park. July 17th, things that scare me. One, daddy long legs. Two, vacuums. Three, people with big feet. August 1st, I wish that people wouldn't judge all the spiders based on the few spiders that bite. I know if we took the time to get to know each other, we would get along just fine, just like me and Fly. Dad made me this. Worm found this. My best friends. My first molted skin. Extended family reunion. I made this slingshot. The Dead Family Diaz by P.J. Bracegirdle. Pictures by Polly Bernatine. Morning came as the dead sun chased off the dead moon. All across the land of the dead, everyone's spirits were high. Rise and shine, sleepy skulls, Mrs. Diaz called. Breakfast is getting cold. Huevos muertos, cheered Estrellita. Yum! Angelito looked at his plate miserably. Today was the day of the dead, when his family would walk among the living, and Angelito was feeling scared. Did I tell you how the living have big red tongues and bulging eyes? His sister jabbered. And if you touch one, they feel all hot and squishy. Ew, gasped Angelito, turning whiter than ever. Mrs. Diaz hushed her daughter. The living are our friends, she said, and this is the one time each year everyone gets together to celebrate. But were they really hot and squishy? Angelito listened in horror to his sister's stories about Halloween when the living put out fiery-eyed pumpkins to scare the dead away. Except it never works, cackled Estrellita. <laughs> the day of the dead is nothing like Halloween, Angelito's father insisted. Now eat up. We don't want to be late. Angelito fed his breakfast to Dante while Estrellita chomped away. Finally, the family piled into the car. I told you we should have left earlier, Mr. Diaz grumbled. Just look at this traffic. Nearby, a large crowd was waiting for the elevator to the land of the living and the dead were getting restless. Quit pushing, numbskull. Tell it to the zombies at the back. Jostled and shoved, the Diaz family squeezed into a packed elevator. Up and up they went until, ding, the doors finally opened. Welcome to the land of the living, a booming voice shouted. 
Pushed into the bright world beyond, Angelito froze. Where were his parents? Shouting people, chiming bells, and blaring music drowned out his calls. He darted through the crowd searching, but his family was nowhere to be found. Finally, Angelito arrived at a quiet square. Spotting a friendly looking skull, he asked, you didn't see a man and a woman and a boneheaded girl wearing too much jaw gloss pass by, did you? The boy laughed but shook his head. Angelito began to slump away. I'm Pablo, by the way, the boy called. Did you happen to see any of them yet? Them? He means the living, Angelito thought. He told Pablo all about the terrible shouting he'd heard near the elevators. They must be getting ready to attack, whispered Pablo. Let's get out of here. The pair scrambled behind a fruit and vegetable stand where Angelito came up with a plan. They'd tip over boxes of cherries so their enemies would slip. And then we can finish them off with these, Pablo suggested, handing over a few tomatoes. Before long, they heard an angry mob approaching. Get ready, whispered Angelito. Aim. Wait, hold your fire, cried Pablo. It wasn't a mob at all but a parade full of banging drums and blasting trumpets. Still, Pablo warned that some of them might be hiding in it. Maybe we should keep our masks on just in case. Masks, laughed the skeleton boy. What masks? These ones, silly, said Pablo, reaching for Angelito's face. Hey! You're as cold as a popsicle, he squealed. And you've got bulging eyes, cried Angelito. Ah! You're one of them, they both shouted. Angelito took off, tearing down streets and alleyways without looking back. Out of breath, he finally stopped. Had he really been playing with a living boy the whole time? How freaky, he shuddered. How icky, how awful. But how incredibly fun, he had to admit. Except now he was alone again. Feeling glum, Angelito wandered around the deserted town until he found himself at the cemetery gates. Inside, a big party was going on. There was a loud bark. Dante! Angelito cried, rushing over to his family. Mrs. Diaz squeezed her son so tightly he thought he might crack. Angelito told them how he'd gotten lost and had been looking for them all day. We're just glad you're safe, sighed his father. Now let's get to the buffet. I'm ready to stuff my rib cage. Estreita slid up to her brother. Oh, I bet you were so scared, she whispered gleefully all alone in the land of the living. Actually, I wasn't alone, Angelito said. And then, spotting a familiar face, the dead boy discovered that he didn't need guts to be brave. Hey, Pablo, wait up, Angelito called. The living boy turned, then a big smile crossed his face. Sorry for saying you had bulging eyes, said Angelito. Sorry for calling you a popsicle, Pablo replied. So we're cool again, Angelito asked, grinning a big skeleton grin. Pablo winked, cool as your bones. 
Angelito told Pablo all the things Estrellita had said to make him scared of the living. She's okay, mostly, he admitted, but sometimes she can be a real knuckle bone. Maybe she just needs to meet a real living boy up close, Pablo said. <laughs> the dead moon had already chased off the dead sun by the time the dead family Diaz returned home. Bone tired, Angelito headed to bed where he dreamed sweet dreams. The Day of the Dead, El Dia de los Muertos, is a holiday celebrated in Mexico on November 1st, when it is believed that the spirits of the dead return to visit the living. Though it is always sad when people die, the Day of the Dead is a happy holiday, a time for people to remember and appreciate friends and relatives who have passed on. The day is full of singing, dancing, and feasting. Special displays, known as altars, are made to welcome these beloved souls into the homes of their living family, with food laid out for the spirits to enjoy when they visit. The Dot by Peter H. Reynolds Art class was over, but Vashti sat glued to her chair. Her paper was empty. Vashti's teacher leaned over the blank paper. Ah, a polar bear in a snowstorm, she said. Very funny, said Vashti. I just can't draw. Her teacher smiled. Just make a mark and see where it takes you. Vashti grabbed a marker and gave the paper a good, strong jab. There! Her teacher picked up the paper and studied it carefully. Hmm. She pushed the paper toward Vashti and quietly said, now sign it. Vashti thought for a moment, well, maybe I can't draw, but I can sign my name. The next week when Vashti walked into art class, she was surprised to see what was hanging above her teacher's desk. It was the little dot she had drawn, her dot all framed in swirly gold. Hmm, I can make a better dot than that. She opened her never before used set of watercolors and set to work. Vashti painted and painted. A red dot, a purple dot, a yellow dot, a blue dot, the blue mixed with the yellow, she discovered that she could make a green dot. Vashti kept experimenting, lots of little dots in many colors. If I can make little dots, I can make big dots too. Vashti splashed her colors with a bigger brush on bigger paper to make bigger dots. Vashti even made a dot by not painting a dot. At the school art show a few weeks later, Vashti's many dots made quite a splash. Vashti noticed a little boy gazing up at her. You're a really great artist. I wish I could draw, he said. I bet you can said Vashti. Me? No, not me. 
I can't draw a straight line with a ruler. Vashti smiled. She handed the boy a blank sheet of paper. Show me. The boy's pencil shook as he drew his line. Vashti stared at the boy's squiggle. And then she said, Sign it. Thomas and Friends, The Great Race, the movie. Illustrated by Tommy Stubbs, created by Britt Allcroft. One sunny day on the island of Sodor, Thomas the Tank Engine met Gordon's brother. They call him the Flying Scotsman, Gordon said. Gordon's brother was going to the great railway show on the mainland. That's where engines compete to see who's the fastest and strongest, he explained. Thomas really wanted to go too. Thomas asked Sir Topham Hatt about streamlining an engine from Sodor so it could compete and win at the show. Sir Topham Hatt loved the idea. We'll streamline Gordon to make him faster than ever. Gordon was not the engine Thomas had in mind. The next day, engines from all over the world arrived on Sodor. Where are you going? The dock manager asked. The Great Railway Show, puffed one engine. That'll be on the mainland, the manager replied. The engines hurried back onto the ferry. In her rush, a brightly painted engine named Ashima bumped into Thomas. Whoa! He peeped as he teetered over the water. Together, the dock workers and Ashima pulled Thomas back from danger. Ashima apologized and asked how she might get to the mainland. Thomas chugged away without answering. Why should she go to the great railway show? Thomas puffed to his carriages. She is beautifully painted. Clarabelle said. Any engine can get painted, Thomas puffed, and that gave Thomas another idea. At the steamworks, Thomas asked Victor to repaint him. I was thinking maybe lightning bolts and racing stripes, he said. When Sir Topham has stopped by to check on Gordon's streamlining, he liked the idea, but not for Thomas. Over at the Diesel Works, Diesel had an idea of his own. To disguise a few diesels as his trucks and pretend to pull them. It will look like I'm pulling a very heavy train, he said with a snicker. Sir Topham Hat will think I'm stronger than Henry. He'll take me to the Great Railway Show. Later that day, Thomas saw Ashima. She didn't understand why Thomas wanted to be repainted. You can only be you, she said. Every engine is useful and has a job to do. Ashima asked Thomas if he was good at shunting and sorting trucks. That gave Thomas his best idea yet. I'll show Sir Topham Hat what I can do best.
The next day, Thomas went to Knapford Station to practice shunting. The rails were blocked by Diesel's tricky trucks, so Thomas started to move them. Hey, you'll spoil my trick, Diesel hissed. The disguised Diesels began to chug along with Thomas. They moved quickly and easily. At a red signal, Thomas tried to stop, but the Diesels kept pushing. Crash! Thomas collided with another engine. On the day of the Great Railway Show, the Sonor engines were ready to go. Gordon had been painted and streamlined. His new nameplate said, The Shooting Star. Sir Topham Hatt had chosen Thomas for the shunting challenge, but after his accident, Thomas needed to be fixed. Percy was going in his place. Later, Victor realized that Gordon's safety valve hadn't been reinstalled after his streamlining. Without it, he could overheat. Thomas rushed the valve to the great railway show. But Gordon didn't believe him, and the race was starting. Green flags waved, and the engines took off. Gordon raced along. Suddenly, his face turned red. Steam hissed from inside his streamlining. Gordon's brother told him something was wrong, but Gordon wouldn't listen. Then his boiler burst. He sputtered to a stop in a cloud of steam. The other engines sped on. Meanwhile, over at the shunting challenge, Percy was scared. He asked Thomas to enter the race in his place. Thomas agreed. I might lose, you know, he said. But Thomas chuffed through round after round, pulling tankers and flatbeds into line. He beat big engines from many countries. In the end, only Thomas and Ashima were left. And then the final challenge began. The two engines steamed back and forth, buffering boxcars into place. Their sidings were full. It was a race to the finish. But Thomas saw an overturned truck on Ashima's track and rushed to push it aside. Ashima raced to victory. You let me win, Ashima said to Thomas. It wouldn't have been fair anyway, Thomas peeped. Your track was blocked. At the award ceremony, the judges had a surprise. We would like to declare two winners in the shunting challenge. Ashima wins for being fastest. Thomas wins for helping his competitor. The engines whistled and cheered. They were all so impressed with the engines from Sodor. Sir Topham Hatt was very proud of Thomas for being really useful and a truly good sport. He was just being Thomas, sir, Percy peeped. You can only be you, Thomas said, and winked at Ashima. There's nothing else you can possibly do. The King of Kindergarten by Derek Barnes and Vanessa Brantley Newton. The morning sun blares through your window like a million brass trumpets. It sits and shines behind your head like a crown. 
Mommy says that today you are going to be the king of kindergarten. You'll use a golden brush to clean ye royal chiclets. You'll wash your own face with a cloth bearing the family crest. You'll dress yourself neatly in hand-picked garments from the far-off villages of Osh and Kosh. Be gosh, you'll be ready to reign. My baby is heading to school, Mommy will say during breakfast. But you're not a baby. Could a baby wolf down a tower of pancakes the way you can? I don't think so. You're growing up so fast, Daddy will say, and he'll be right. I can't stay the same size forever, can I? You'll say. One day, I'll be taller than you, Daddy, and you'll be my little man. Daddy will laugh, but you won't be joking. Then a big yellow carriage will deliver you to a grand fortress. As you walk up to the towering doors, you'll remember Mommy saying, hold your head high and greet everyone with a brilliant, beaming, majestic smile, for you are the king of kindergarten. Your teacher will welcome you with a warm smile and a friendly good morning. She'll be delighted by how you recite your name with pride. Welcome to kindergarten. When you head to your royal seat, the kids at your round table will wave and say, hi like they've been waiting on you all summer. So you smile back, return the wave, and give them a cheerful, hi everybody. The truth is, you couldn't wait to meet your kindergarten kingdom either. Your teacher will go over classroom rules and you'll all discuss important matters such as shapes, the alphabet, and the never-ending mystery of numbers. She'll even read a book about trucks, trains, and tractors. Whew! It sounds like a lot, but you're the king of kindergarten. Piece of cake. You will show your bravery at recess when you go up to one of your classmates and ask, Marie, do you want to play with me? Not only will she say yes, but she'll lead the way in helping you save the kingdom by battling a fire-breathing dragon. In the cafeteria, the boy sitting next to you will be missing dessert. You'll have packed your favorite, chocolate pudding, with an extra cup, just in case. So you'll say to him, Want a pudding, Howie? He'll say thanks, and you won't mind at all, because what could be cooler than sharing with new friends? After a royal rest, you'll arise to sing and dance and bop to a rhythmic beat. The day will be one you'll never forget. At the end of it, your teacher will wish you all a magnificent evening and bid you farewell until dawn. On your way back home, you'll think of all the things you can't wait to tell your parents. I made a bunch of new friends. My teacher is nice and recess is the best thing ever. And tomorrow, it will begin again. Another day as the charming, the wonderful, 
and the kind King of Kindergarten. The Leaf Thief by Alice Hemming and Nicola Slater. What a wonderful time of year. I am snug in my nest with a belly full of hazelnuts and the sun is shining through my leafy canopy. Such lovely colors, red, gold, orange, red, Gold, orange, red, gold. Wait a minute. One of my leaves is missing. Where is it? It's not in here. It's not under here. Bird. What is the matter? Someone stole my leaf. Your leaf? Yes, one of my leaves is missing. My leaf looked a lot like that one, the one mouse has. That is not your leaf, squirrel. But how can you be sure? Mouse, mouse, did you steal my leaf? See, squirrel, it is perfectly normal to lose a leaf or two at this time of year, okay? Okay, thanks bird, see you tomorrow. The next morning, oh no, this is bad, bird! What is the matter this time? More leaves have been stolen Excuse me, woodpecker, are those my leaves? No, they are my leaves, squirrel. I spent ages collecting them. No one is taking your leaves, squirrel. This happened last year, remember? Maybe. Why don't you go back to your nest and try to relax? Okay, thanks bird. Try to relax, breathe in and out. Just relax. The following morning, this is a disaster, bird, bird. Where are you, bird? I'm here, squirrel. Wait a minute. Are you the leaf thief? No, squirrel. I am not the leaf thief. I will show you the leaf thief. Where are they? Because I've got a few things I'd like to say to them. Look around you. The leaf thief is everywhere. It shakes the trees and rustles the leaves. It even takes your hat. Do you see the leaf thief squirrel? The only thief is the wind. This happens every year in the autumn. Every year. The leaves change colors and the wind blows them away. They'll grow back again in the spring. Now, I'm going home. Please don't disturb me again. It was just the wind. The leaves change colors and the wind blows them away. Of course, no leaf thief at all. Silly me, 
I'm going to sleep well tonight. The next morning, bird! Someone has stolen the grass! Sigh. The real leaf thief. As Squirrel learned, nobody is really stealing the leaves from the trees. Bird says the only thief is the wind. But there is more to it than that. The wind can only blow the leaves away when the trees have started to shed their leaves. This happens in the autumn when the temperature drops, marking the change from summer to winter. Trees look very pretty in the autumn. Before the leaves fall, they turn from green to all sorts of different colors, red, gold, orange. When they turn brown, the leaves are ready to fall from the tree. Not all trees shed their leaves. Only deciduous trees lose their leaves. Coniferous trees, such as evergreens, keep theirs. Autumn happens at different times across the world. In the Northern Hemisphere, autumn starts in September. In the Southern Hemisphere, it starts in March. Autumn isn't just about falling leaves. Other changes happen too. The daylight hours shorten and some birds and butterflies fly to warmer climates or migrate. Other animals like bats and bears sleep through the winter or hibernate. Squirrels don't hibernate, but they do begin to sleep a lot more. They also store nuts and other food for the colder months ahead. The Littlest Witch, written by Brandy Doherty, illustrated by Jamie Pogue. Wilma was a witch. She lived with her family in the mistiest part of the spooky woods. There were many witches in Wilma's community, but Wilma was the littlest one. It was almost Halloween and Wilma couldn't wait. Last year, she was too little for the broom flying demonstration at the Halloween bash. This year, she knew she'd be ready, but practice didn't go as planned. Wilma joined broom practice day after day. She knew the routine by heart, but her little arms and legs just couldn't hold the broom to do the spins, turns, and stunts the other witches could do. At the end of another tough practice, Wilma's mother kissed her nose. Next year, you're going to dazzle us all, she said. Still, Wilma was determined to do something special for the big Halloween party. She visited her sister, Hazel. Hazel was busy crafting a scream potion for the celebration. Add those herbs to the pot, Hazel instructed. Wilma added a pinch of herbs. More, Hazel said, lots more. But the big jar slipped from Wilma's tiny hands and landed in the pot. The potion screamed so loud, it burst into a gooey green mess. Hazel wiped Wilma's eyes. Maybe Aunt Ruby needs some help, she said. Wilma hurried to Aunt Ruby's house. She was one of the best spellcasters in the spooky woods, and she was working on her biggest spell yet. Aunt Ruby consulted her book. I need the slime from one toad, she said. I can catch a toad, Wilma offered. Wilma pounced but the big toad slipped right through her small hands. 
she fell head first into the pond. Wilma marched over to the broom studio. If she couldn't fly in the demonstration, maybe she could make the new brooms. The witches showed her how to gather the twigs around the pole and secure them with string. But bundling the twigs wasn't easy. Before she knew it, Wilma had tied herself up to a broom. We don't have time for silliness, one of the witches told her. Wilma ran to her grandmother's cottage. I'm still too little, she cried. Nonsense, Nanny said. I was just finishing your new shoes for the big night. Wilma stepped into her beautiful new shoes. They were much too big. Oh dear, Nanny said. I'll need to make some adjustments. Wilma roamed through the spooky woods. She was sad. She knew there had to be one special thing she could do this Halloween, even if she was little. Wilma rounded a corner and bumped right into her friend, May the Mummy. May was sad too. There's no part for me on Halloween, Wilma whispered. May nodded. I was ready to do the mummy dance this year, but now my family is stuck home with the monster mumps. At least we can go together, Wilma said. Before long, Halloween was here. All of the spooky woods joined the party. There was dancing and magic, yummy food and music. Soon it was time for the annual broom flying demonstration. Wilma and May stood in the very front as the witches started their performance. But the witches looked confused. They all flew in different directions. The crowd got quiet. The director is missing, Wilma gulped. Wilma looked around. Then she had an idea. Quick, May, give me a boost. May helped Wilma climb onto her shoulders. Now she was very tall. Wilma got the witch's attention and began conducting the routine. The witches lined up and started again, following Wilma's directions. The broom flying performance finished with a flurry of spins and dips. Everybody laughed and gasped and clapped and cheered. The witches stole the show with their fantastic demonstration, all thanks to Wilma and May. Once again, Wilma and May proved that being little can be big fun, but it's the magic of friendship that makes it even sweeter. The Man in the Red Bandana by Honor Crowther Fagan Illustrated by John Crowther When he was only seven years old, Wells was given a bandana by his father. It was a special gift that made Wells feel strong. Wells' dad always carried a blue bandana and Wells' new bandana was just like it, only red. From the moment Wells received that bandana, he carried it with him everywhere. It had lots of uses. It was a cowboy mask, a pirate hat, a flag to signal the end of the race. As Wells grew up, he stopped using his red bandana as a toy and started to use it underneath his helmets. You see, Wells was an athlete whose favorite sports were ice hockey and lacrosse. He wore that bandana underneath his helmet 
to keep the sweat out of his eyes. Wells not only wore a helmet when he played sports, he also wore one as a volunteer firefighter. At the age of 16, Wells again followed his father's example and became a volunteer fireman. He trained with real firefighters and was taught that rescuing people who were trapped inside was their first priority. He also learned how to get safely through the burning building and put out the fires. It was this training and the red bandana that helped Wells become a hero. After college, Wells went to work on the 104th floor of the World Trade Center in New York City. Wells loved working up so high. He often called his father on rainy days to ask, is it raining where you are? When his father replied that it was, Wells would say, well, it's sunny up here. But on Tuesday morning, September 11th, 2001, it was not a rainy day. The sun was bright and there were no clouds in the blue sky. As Wells sat in his office, he heard an explosion nearby that rattled his desk and his chair. When he looked out the window to see the World Trade Center Tower One building, he could see fire spewing out of the floors right across from him. Wells wanted to help with the tragic situation unfolding in the next tower. Just minutes after the explosion in Tower One, Wells left his office. To get down to the lobby from above the 78th floor, you had to first take an elevator to the 78th floor sky lobby. From there, you took a nonstop elevator to the ground floor. Many people would be waiting in the sky lobby for their elevator. Wells knew it would take too long to wait for an elevator from the 104th floor to the sky lobby and then one to the ground. So he headed down the stairs. In a few minutes, Wells had made it all the way down near the 78th floor. That's when another explosion occurred. Only this one was much louder and stronger than the last. Wells ran right for the door of the sky lobby, but could tell by the smoke coming into the stairwell that there were fires burning inside. Wells took out his red bandana and tied it around his nose and mouth so that he did not breathe in the smoke. When Wells entered the sky lobby, it was hard to see through all the smoke. There were badly injured people who needed his help to get to safety. He found a fire extinguisher to put out the flames that continued to endanger the survivors. Wells immediately took charge and called out to anyone who might be able to hear him. I found the stairs. If you can get up and walk, get up now. If you are able to help someone else, help them. Follow me. I know the way. Many people were dazed, but one woman was in such a state of shock that she could not walk. Wells wanted to help as many survivors as possible. He picked up the shocked woman and leading a group of three others, carried her down the stairs. Wells saw the air start to clear as they made it down the stairwell. So he pulled his bandana from his face. When they made it to the 61st floor, the lights were on and Wells thought it was safe to send the people on their own. Wells told the group to continue down the stairs and out of the building. He turned around and headed back up the stairs. Wells collected another group of survivors and ushered them to the stairs. Again, he led them down to the clean air on the 61st floor and told them to continue on to safety. Once again, Wells went back up to the stairs. 
During his third trip to the sky lobby, Wells found that there were people who were alive but were trapped underneath heavy pieces of metal. He knew that in order to save them, he would need a firefighter's tool called a Jaws of Life. Wells followed the stairs down to the lobby for his third and final trip. He found the command center where the firefighters and police officers were planning the rescue effort. Wells let them know that they would need the Jaws of Life up in the sky lobby. But Wells would not make it back up there. The damage to both buildings was too severe and they soon collapsed. No one knew what had happened to Wells until his mother read a newspaper article months later. In the article, survivors recalled being saved by a man in a red bandana. She said to herself, there you are, Wells. I have finally found you. Wells was recognized through pictures by two women whom he led to safety. They will never forget the bravery and strength that Wells showed on that day. They will never forget the man who saved their lives. They will never forget the man in the red bandana. Wells Remy Crowther's three trips from the 78th floor sky lobby to the 61st floor of the World Trade Center's South Tower saved many lives. Because of his bravery and courage on 9-11-2001, Wells was posthumously named as an honorary firefighter by the Fire Department of New York, the first time in the history of the department that an individual has been honored in this way. He has been recognized all over the world for his heroic acts through numerous media outlets including ESPN's Outside the Lines. The Wells Remy Crowther Charitable Trust was established in Wells' memory to raise funds for various programs that assist young people to become exemplary adults through education, health, recreation, and character development. A portion of the proceeds from the sale of this book will be donated to the trust. The Crowther family, trustees, and advisors of the Wells Remy Crowther Charitable Trust are deeply grateful to the Fetzer Institute, Kalamazoo, Michigan, for its vision and generous support of this book and the Red Bandana Project, a curriculum program for character development. Thomas and Friends, The Monster of Sodor, from the movie Tale of the Brave, based on the railway series by the Reverend W. Audrey, illustrated by Richard Courtney. It is a sunny day on the island of Sodor. Thomas is working in the clay pits. Thomas sees giant footprints in the rock. The footprints are scary. What made them? Thomas tells Percy what he saw. Percy thinks a monster made the prints. He is scared. The next day, Percy goes back to work. He sees a dark shadow up ahead. Is it a monster? No, it is a new engine named Gator. Percy and Gator are friends now, but Percy is still scared of monsters. Gator tells Percy to be brave, even if he is scared. A big ship is leaving Sodor. Percy wants to go too. 
Gator says running away is not very brave. Thomas wants Percy to stay. He sees the ship. Pull, Cranky, pull! The boat stops just in time. But Percy is not on the boat. He has gone back to the clay pits. He wants to see the footprints. Percy chuffs up the mountain. The ground shakes. Rocks fall down. Something big falls near Percy. He is sure it is a monster. But it is not a monster. It is a dinosaur fossil. Percy has made a really useful discovery. The footprints were made a long time ago. Percy solved the monster mystery. The Little Old Lady Who Was Not Afraid of Anything by Linda Williams, illustrated by Megan Lloyd. Once upon a time, there was a little old lady who was not afraid of anything. One windy afternoon, the little old lady left her cottage and went for a walk in the forest to collect herbs and spices, nuts and seeds. She walked so long and so far that it started to get dark. There was only a sliver of moon shining through the night. The little old lady started to walk home. Suddenly, she stopped. Right in the middle of the path were two big shoes, and the shoes went clomp, clomp. Get out of my way, you two big shoes. I'm not afraid of you, said the little old lady. On she walked down the path, but behind her she could hear two shoes go clomp, clomp. A little farther on, the little old lady stumbled into a pair of pants. And the pants went, wiggle, wiggle. Get out of my way, you pair of pants. I'm not afraid of you, said the little old lady. And she walked on. But behind her, she could hear. Two shoes go clomp, clomp and one pair of pants go wiggle, wiggle. Farther still, the little old lady bumped into a shirt and the shirt went shake, shake. Get out of my way, you silly shirt. I'm not afraid of you, said the little old lady. And on she walked a little bit faster, but behind her, she could hear. Two shoes go clomp, clomp. One pair of pants go wiggle, wiggle. And one shirt go shake, shake. A little ways on, the little lady came upon two white gloves and a tall black hat. And the gloves went clap, clap. And the hat went nod, nod. Get out of my way. You two white gloves and you tall black hat. I'm not afraid of you, she said. And on she walked just a little bit faster. But behind her, she could hear. Two shoes go clomp, clomp. 
One pair of pants go, wiggle, wiggle. One shirt go, shake, shake. Two gloves go, clap, clap. And one hat go, nod, nod. By now, the little old lady was walking at quite a fast pace. She was very near her cottage when she was startled by a very huge, very orange, very scary pumpkin head. And the head went... Boo, boo. This time, the little old lady did not stop to talk. She did not stop at all. She ran, but behind her, she could hear two shoes go clomp, clomp. One pair of pants go wiggle, wiggle. One shirt go shake, shake. Two gloves go clap, clap. One hat go nod, nod and one scary pumpkin head go boo, boo. The little old lady did not look back. She ran as fast as she could and didn't stop to catch her breath until she was safe inside her cottage with the door locked. She sat in her chair by the fire and she rocked and she rocked. It was so quiet in her cottage before the knock, knock on the door. Should she answer it? Well, she was not afraid of anything. So she went to the door and opened it. What do you think she saw? Two shoes go clomp, clomp. One pair of pants go wiggle, wiggle. One shirt go shake, shake. Two gloves go clap, clap. One hat go nod, nod. And one scary pumpkin head go boo, boo. I'm not afraid of you, said the little old lady bravely. What do you want anyway? We've come to scare you. You can't scare me, said the little old lady. Then what's to become of us? The pumpkin head suddenly looked unhappy. I have an idea, said the little old lady. She whispered into the pumpkin's ear. The pumpkin head nodded and its face seemed to brighten. The little old lady said good night, closed the door and whistled on her way to bed. The next morning she woke up early. She went to her window and looked out into her garden. And what do you think she saw? Two shoes go clomp, clomp. One pair of pants go wiggle, wiggle. One shirt go shake, shake. Two gloves go clap, clap. One hat go nod, nod. And one scary pumpkin head go boo, boo. And scare all the crows away. The Poisoned Apple, A Fractured Fairy Tale by Anne Lambelay. Once there was a witch who detested a princess. This particular princess was getting a little too sweet 
for her own good. And any decent witch knows just how to deal with a princess like that. A poisoned apple. For months and months, the witch had worked tirelessly to collect countless rare ingredients. She had only enough for a single apple poisoning spell, so everything would have to go exactly according to plan. First, she mixed the ingredients in her cauldron. Next, she carefully dipped the apple into the bubbling brew. It began to transform. The spell had worked. Her secret weapon now complete. The witch waited for the princess to pass through the woods and gave her the poisoned apple. The witch's plot was in motion. Now she'd get to watch from the woods as the princess took her final bite. The princess had been on her way to the dwarf's diamond mine to bring them lunch. The witch watched impatiently as the princess handed out provisions to the hungry men. To the sixth dwarf, she gave the poisoned apple. After polishing off most of his other food, the sixth dwarf started to take a bite. When he was interrupted by a couple of hungry forest animals. Since he was already pretty full, he supposed he could share. So he gave them the poisoned apple. Happily, the animals leaned in to take a bite. When they were startled by a foraging squirrel, desperate for something to feed her babies. Their hearts went out to the hungry little ones, so they gave her the poisoned apple. The witch couldn't let the apple get away. She hadn't put all that work in for nothing. She had no choice but to climb, climb, climb right up that tree after the squirrel. She had only a little farther to go when suddenly, crack! Down, down, down the witch fell. When she came to, she couldn't remember who she was, where she was, or what she'd been doing. The squirrel was concerned and gave her a tasty looking apple. It seemed strangely familiar, but the witch was hungry. And so, Having unwittingly escaped the witch's scheme, everyone in the forest lived happily ever after. Well, almost everyone. Rulers of the Playground by Joseph Kufler. One morning, Jonah decided to become ruler of the playground. I am now king of this land, announced Jonah. 
Promise to obey me and I'll let you play in my kingdom. Jonah's kingdom had slides, so everyone Pinky promised. And just like that, Jonah became king of the playground. King Jonah was skilled. Look at me! In some ways, I order this tree to move. And generous, who's hungry? Most of the time, you can share this cracker. Everyone played in King Jonah's kingdom. Everyone except for Lennox. because she wanted to rule the playground too. This side of the playground is now mine, announced Lennox. Cross your heart and promise to follow my rules. Lennox's kingdom had swings, so they crossed their hearts and promised. And just like that, Lennox became a mighty queen. Queen Lennox was wise. Watch this. In most cases, I totally meant to do that. And patient. Take your time. Most days. Okay, enough already. Everyone played in Queen Lennox's kingdom. Everyone except for King Jonah. This playground is mine, hollered King Jonah. Is not, shouted Queen Lennox. It's all mine. And just like that, the playground was divided in two. King Jonah and Queen Lennox each made a plan to grow their kingdoms. They conquered small things. Push! said King Jonah. Harder! Spin! said Queen Lennox. Faster! Faster! And big things. Climb! shouted King Jonah. Higher! hollered Queen Lennox. They even tried to conquer Augustine's dog, Sir Hamilton Humphrey Hildebrand III. Stay, hollered King Jonah. Fetch, shouted Queen Lennox. King Jonah and Queen Lennox claimed the entire playground until there was nothing left to conquer and no friends to play with. Conquering is complicated, said King Jonah. Yeah said Queen Lennox, super complicated. So they made a new plan, Important Apology Project by Lennox and Jonah. They took down their royal flags. They gave back their kingdoms. Jonah stopped being king. Lennox stopped being queen. We're done conquering, said Jonah. We cross our hearts and promise to never be rulers again, said Lennox. And just like that, the playground was fun again. Everyone was happy, except for Augustine and Sir Hamilton Humphrey Hildebrand III. The Scarecrow, written by Beth Ferry, Illustrated by the Fan Brothers. Autumn sunshine. Haystacks rolled. 
Scarecrow guards the fields of gold. No one enters, no one dares. Scarecrow stands alone and scares the fox and deer, the mice and crows. It's all he does. It's all he knows. He never rests. He never bends. He's never had a single friend. For all the woodland creatures know not to mess with old Scarecrow. Winter whispers, velvet snow. Scarecrow has no place to go. He dreams of what the spring will bring, of buds and blooms and things that sing. Then something drops from midair. A small scared crow lying there. Broken nest, broken wing. Scarecrow does the strangest thing. He snaps his pole, bends down low, saves the tiny baby crow. He tucks him near his heart of hay. He lets him sleep. He lets him stay. He doesn't stop to wonder why. He sings the sweetest lullaby. Safe and warm, the nestling mends. These two make the oddest friends. But friends they are, right from the start. The crow will grow in Scarecrow's heart. And he will peek out at the farm. And he will perch on Scarecrow's arm. And they will laugh and wish on stars, forgetting who they really are. For crows are birds, and birds must fly. The fledgling spreads his wings to try. He dips, then soars, and caws out loud. Scarecrow cheers, pleased and proud. But as he watches, Scarecrow knows that he must stay and crow must go. Summer sunshine. Autumn chill. Snowflakes make it colder still. No one visits, no one cares. Scarecrow sags alone and stares. Broken heart, broken pole. Nothing fills the empty hole. Then something drops from midair. A large black crow standing there. Scarecrow's arms are open wide. Crow spreads his wings and swoops inside. Joyful hearts, brimming whole, a friend will mend a broken pole, and he will spruce up matted hay, and he will say, I'm here to stay. Winter's over, springtime's due. Is there room enough for two? Flowers blooming, fields of green, Five small eggs are tucked unseen. Scarecrow guards them, for he knows that soon they will be baby crows. And he will love them from the start, and they will grow up in his heart. And they will peep and perch and play and make him happy every day, and as the seasons come and go, they will love their dear scarecrow.
The Seasons of Arnold's Apple Tree by Gail Gibbons. Arnold climbs up high into the branches of the apple tree. He can see far, far away in every direction. This is Arnold's very own secret place. This is Arnold's apple tree. Arnold's tree keeps him very busy all through the year. It is spring. Arnold watches the small buds grow on his apple tree. Some of the buds develop into sweet smelling apple blossoms. Carefully and quietly, Arnold watches bees collect nectar from the blossoms to make honey. Honeybee and apple blossoms. The honeybee makes honey from nectar, the sweet juice found in flowers. Arnold makes a swing for his apple tree. He weaves an apple blossom wreath and hangs it from a branch. Arnold picks an armful of apple blossoms and brings it to his family. They make a flower arrangement together. It is summer. Arnold's apple tree has big green leaves that rustle in the wind. Arnold builds a tree house. His apple tree shades him from the hot summer sun. The green leaves shelter him during a summer shower. Arnold watches small apples begin to grow from where the blossoms used to be. They grow bigger, bigger, and bigger. With some of the big green apples, Arnold does a juggling act for his tree friend. It is fall. Arnold's apple tree now has big, red, tasty apples. The green leaves have turned golden. They drift to the ground. Arnold gathers some of the leaves and brings them up to his tree house to make a soft floor to lie on. Arnold shakes the branches and red apples fall to the ground. He puts them in a basket and takes them home. Arnold and his family make apple pies with apples from Arnold's apple tree. They put the rest of the apples into a cider press and make fresh apple cider. How an apple cider press works. Step one, eight to 10 apples are put into the hopper. When the flywheel is turned, blades inside the hopper chop the apples. So here's the hopper right here and here's the flywheel. Step two, the apple pieces fall into the tub. Apples are chopped until the tub is three fourths full. So here's the tub right here. Step three, the press plug is screwed onto the press screw. When the press screw handle is turned, the press plug squeezes the apple pieces and forces juice through the cloth filter. So here's the press plug. There's the cloth filter. And here's the press screw handle. So here's the press screw coming down here. Step four. The apple cider flows into the tray and drips into a container. So here it comes, dripping down here, right into the container. On Halloween day, Arnold decorates some of the biggest apples. They glow in the moonlight under his tree on Halloween night. It is winter, snow falls, it is quiet. 
The branches of Arnold's apple tree are bare. Arnold hangs strings of popcorn and berries on them for the winter birds to eat. He builds a snow fort around the bottom of his tree. Arnold builds a snowman to keep him and his tree company during the winter. The snow melts away. It is spring again. The Smallest Girl in the Smallest Grade Written by Justin Roberts Illustrated by Christian Robinson Hardly anyone noticed young Sally McCabe. She was the smallest girl in the smallest grade. Sure, her name could be heard in the daily roll call, and she marched with her books down the same school hall. But hardly anyone noticed young Sally McCabe, and they certainly didn't know, or at least didn't mention, that Sally was paying super extra special attention. To the abandoned kite with the tangled string, to the 27 keys on the janitor's ring, to the leaves as they turned green to gold and fall, to the time Tommy Torino was tripped in the hall. She watched as the wildflowers tipped toward the light and heard the howl of a hound dog late one night. She was there when the stray cats who normally fought conducted a meeting in the church parking lot. She saw Kevin McEwen get pushed off a slide and the oncoming tears that he wanted to hide. And she'll never forget that parent-teacher day when Billy's much larger father suddenly dragged him away. But through all the mean words and all the cold stares, no one even noticed that Sally was there. And they certainly didn't know, or at least didn't mention, that Sally was paying super extra special attention. She'd seen how a whisper could make someone cower like a bulldozer crushing through fields of wild flowers. And it kept piling up, this discarded debris, those beautiful kites tangled in trees. So, on February 3rd at 11.29, Sally stepped straight out of the lunchroom line. She said, I'm tired of seeing this terrible stuff. Stop hurting each other. This is enough. Now, a few laughed out loud or didn't care that there was some girl with her hand in the air. But then something super extra special happened that day as Howard O'Henry suddenly set down his tray. Like waves rolling in, one after another. First Molly rose up, then Michael's twin brother. It was Tyrone and Terrence, then Amanda and Paul, who pushed out their chairs and stretched their arms tall. From the friendly lunch lady with the dishes she carted, to that new third grade teacher who had only recently started. Yes, everyone there even Principal Claire 
had joined little Sally with their fingers in the air. And though hound dogs were destined to howl at night, and most stray cat meetings would end up as fights, and kites would continue to get stuck in trees, they all felt for a moment like the janitor's keys, fastened together with a heavy steel ring that held all the secrets to unlock everything. As the world returned to the way that it was, Sally noticed the difference, as she usually does. When Billy paused briefly to open the door for Mrs. O'Connell and 17 more. Or when Molly scooched over to make some space on the coral riser for Ellen and Grace. These moments that often get taken for granted. A wildflower appearing that no one had planted. The swings soon resumed their rhythm and sway, and day turned to night, and night turned to day. People remembered, and would quite often mention, that Sally had been paying super extra special attention. And how the world could transform, and a change could be made by the smallest girl in the smallest grade. The Spooky Wheels on the Bus, written by J. Elizabeth Mills, illustrated by Ben Mantle. One spooky bus goes rattle and shake, rattle and shake, rattle and shake. One spooky bus goes rattle and shake all through the town. Two white wipers go creak, 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 creak. Two white wipers go creak, 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 all through the town. Three noisy cats go meow, hiss, hiss, meow, hiss, hiss, meow, hiss, hiss. Three noisy cats go meow, hiss, hiss, all through the town. Four glowing wheels roll round and round, round and round, round and round. Four glowing wheels roll round and round, all through the town. Five big spiders spin their webs, spin their webs, spin their webs. Five big spiders spin their webs all through the town. Six singing mummies hum, 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 hum. Six singing mummies hum, hum, hum all through the town. Seven silly monsters wiggle and waggle, wiggle and waggle, wiggle and waggle. Seven silly monsters wiggle and waggle all through the town. Eight wacky witches just cackle and howl, cackle and howl, cackle and howl. Eight wacky witches cackle and howl all through the town. Nine magic brooms go swish, swoosh, swish, swish, swoosh, swish, swish, swoosh, swish. 
Nine magic brooms go swish, swoosh, swish all through the town. Ten goofy ghosts say boo, oo, oo, boo, oo, oo, boo, oo, oo. Ten goofy ghosts say boo, oo, oo, all through the town. One spooky bus goes rattle and shake, rattle and shake, rattle and shake. One spooky bus goes rattle and shake. On Halloween night. There's a Wocket in my pocket. Dr. Seuss's book of ridiculous rhymes. Did you ever have the feeling there's a zamp in the lamp? Or a nink in the sink? Or a wasit in the closet? Sometimes I am quite certain there's a jerton in the curtain. And when I hear a talk, I know as locks behind the clock. And that zelf up on that shelf, I have talked to her myself. I like the zable on the table and the gare beneath the chair. But the bofa on the sofa acts as if he doesn't care. I like the geeling on the ceiling and the zower in the shower. And the nubbards in the cupboards, I do like them a lot. But the nooth crush on my toothbrush, well, some are nice, but he is not. The yeps on the steps are always fun to have around, and so are many, many other friends that I have found. Like the teller and the neller and the geller and the deller and the beller and the weller and the zeller in the cellar. There's the yaddle in the bottle, whom I do not wish to keep. But the zillow on my pillow always helps me fall asleep. Thidwick the Big-Hearted Moose by Dr. Seuss Up at Lake Winnebango, the far northern shore, lives a huge herd of moose, about 60 or more. And they all go around in a big happy bunch, looking for nice tender moose moss to munch. Up at Lake Winnebango one day, they were lunching, just strolling along and enjoying their munching, for the moose moss that day was especially fine, when it happened that Thidwick, the last moose in line, saw a bingle bug sitting. The bug called out, Hey! It's such a long road, and it's such a hot day. Would you mind if I rode on your horns for a way? Of course not, smiled Thidwick, the big-hearted moose. I'm happy my antlers can be of some use. There's room there to spare, and I'm happy to share. Be my guest, and I hope that you're comfortable there. So the bingle bug picked out a nice easy seat, and the moose went on looking for moose moss to eat. Well, an hour or so later, 
The bug heard a squeak, and he heard the small voice of a tree spider speak. I say, said the spider, you've got a fine place. That moose seems quite friendly, has such a nice face. If I got on too, do you think he would mind? Hop aboard, laughed the bug, and I think that you'll find that the moose won't object. He's the big hearted kind. I accept, said the spider with joy and delight, and he started a web on the horn to the right. While the spider was spinning, he heard a gay song and a fresh little zinazoo bird came along. He stopped and he stared and he chirped. Well, 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 what a smart place to build. What a great place to dwell. I've been living on trees ever since I was born. But here's something new. Why not live on a horn? If there's room there for two, then there's room there for three. There's plenty of room, laughed the bug, and it's free. Fidwick stopped walking. What was all that talking? These guests had caught Thidwick the moose unawares. Hey, he called out, what goes on there upstairs? Just building a nest, sir, the Zinazoo said, and began yanking hairs out of poor Thidwick's head. And he plucked out exactly 204. Don't worry, he laughed. You can always grow more. Then he dozed off to sleep in his fine moose hair nest. This bird, murmured Thidwick, is sort of a pest. But I'm a good sport, so I'll just let him rest. For a host, above all, must be nice to his guest. Besides, now... It's getting quite late in the day, and surely tomorrow they'll all go away. But alas, the next morning, the sun's early light brought to Thidwick's sad eyes a most unwelcome sight. Meet my wife, said the bird. I was married last night, and perhaps, by the way, I should mention to you that her uncle is coming to live with us too. You're a very fine host, so I knew you'd be willing. Then the uncle, a woodpecker, started in drilling. All Thidwick's friends shouted, get rid of those pests. I would, but I can't sobbed poor Thidwick, their guests. Guests indeed, his friends answered, and all of them frowned. If those are your guests, we don't want you around. You can't stay with us, cause you're just not our sort. And they all turned their backs and walked off with a snort. Now, the big friendless moose walked alone and forlorn with four great big woodpecker holes in his horn. What holes, whispered Herman, a squirrel who spied him. What holes to hide nuts in? Hmm, mind if I try them? They're yours, called the woodpecker. Get right inside them. This big-hearted moose runs a public hotel. Bring your nuts, bring your wife, bring your children as well. So the whole squirrel family all jumped on pell-mell. And the very next thing the poor animal knew, a bobcat and turtle were living there too. Now, what was the big-hearted moose going to do? Well, 
What would you do if it happened to you? You couldn't say scat, cause that wouldn't be right. You couldn't shout scram, cause that isn't polite. A host has to put up with all kinds of pests. For a host, above all, must be nice to his guests. So you try hard to smile, and you try to look sweet, and you'd go right on looking for moose moss to eat. But now it was winter, and that wasn't easy, for moose moss gets scarce when the weather gets freezy. The food was soon gone on the cold northern shore of Lake Winnebango. There just was no more, and all Thidwick's friends swam away in a bunch to the south of the lake where there's moose moss to munch. He watched the herd leaving, and then Thidwick knew. He'd starve if he stayed here. He'd have to go too. He stepped in the water. Then, oh, what a fuss. Stop, screamed his guests. You can't do this to us. These horns are our home and you've no right to take our home to the far distant side of the lake. Be fair, Thidwick begged with a lump in his throat. We're fair, said the bug. We'll decide this by vote. All those in favor of going say aye. All those in favor of staying say nay. Aye, shouted Thidwick. But when he was done, nay, they all yelled. He lost 11 to 1. We win, screamed the guests, by a very large score. And poor starving Thidwick climbed back on the shore. Then, do you know what those pests did? They asked in some more. They asked in a fox who jumped in from the trees. They asked in some mice and they asked in some fleas. They asked a big bear in and then, if you please, came a swarm of 362 bees. Poor Thidwick sank down with a groan to his knees. And then, then came something that made his heart freeze. Bullets came zinging right past Thidwick's face. Guns were bang binging all over the place. Get that moose! Get that moose! Thidwick heard a voice call. Fire again and again and shoot straight, one and all. We must get his head for the Harvard Club wall. Thidwick took to his heels with that load on his head. With 500 pounds on his horns, the moose fled. He could have run faster without all those pests, but a host, above all, must be nice to his guests. Up canyon, off cliff, over wild rocky trail, with bullets bang bouncing around him like hail, up gully, through gulch, and down slippery sluice, with his hard-hearted guests raced the soft-hearted moose. Then finally, they had him. Because of those pests, he had run out of luck. Because of those guests on his horns, he was stuck. He gasped. He felt faint. And the whole world grew fuzzy. Thidwick was finished completely. Or was he? Finished? Not Thidwick. Decidedly not. It's true. He was in a most 
terrible spot. But now he remembered a thing he'd forgot, a wonderful something that happens each year to the horns of all moose and the horns of all deer. Today was the day Thidwig happened to know. That old horns come off so that new ones can grow. And he called to the pests on his horns as he threw them. You wanted my horns. Now you're quite welcome to them. Keep them. They're yours. As for me, I shall take myself to the far distant side of the lake. And he swam Winnebango and found his old bunch and arrived just in time for a wonderful lunch at the south of the lake where there's moose moss to munch. His old horns today are where you knew they would be. His guests are still on them, all stuffed as they should be. Thomas and the Runaway Pumpkins Illustrated by Richard Courtney Created by Britt Allcroft Autumn was a happy and busy season on the island of Sodor. It was time for the fall harvest. There were shiny red apples to pick. Farmers were busy bringing in the last sweet corn and the fields were full of bright orange pumpkins of all sizes and shapes. Thomas the Tink Engine and his friends were being really useful. They took trucks loaded with crops from farms to the docks and to bustling markets all over Sodor. Halloween was just around the corner but first, there would be something even more special. The annual pumpkin festival in Anofa. This year, there was a pumpkin growing contest. Who grew the biggest or roundest or funniest shaped pumpkin? There was a pumpkin carving contest too. There would be yummy pumpkin treats for everyone. Pies, breads, soups, puddings, cookies, and even pumpkin candies. There had been a bumper crop of really big pumpkins this year. The night before the festival, Sir Topham Hat arrived at the sheds. After you deliver tonight's mail, he said to Percy, there's a special delivery for the pumpkin festival at Anofa. He pointed to two troublesome trucks loaded with the very biggest pumpkins. Yes, sir, peeped Percy. After Percy had delivered the mail, the troublesome trucks giggled and wriggled. They were determined to cause confusion and delay. Now, called the first one, just as Percy began to climb a bumpy, hilly bit of track. The troublesome trucks uncoupled themselves from the rest of the train and rolled back down the hill. Percy steamed on with no idea that he'd left part of his delivery behind. Giggling with glee, the trucks finally came to a stop on an old siding hidden by some trees. They went happily to sleep. Percy headed toward Anofa. He puffed into the station just as the sun began to rise. Sir Topham Hat and Lady Hat were there to greet him. Percy, 
Where are all the pumpkins? cried Sir Topham Hat. Oh, no, Percy peeped. The trucks must have come loose along the way. Just then, Thomas arrived with two coaches full of festival goers and their baskets of goodies. Thomas, please go and look for my runaway pumpkins, Percy peeped. You'll have to find them soon, Sir Topham Hat said. Without the pumpkins, the festival can't go as planned. Thomas chuffed off. I'll try to think like a troublesome truck, he said to himself as he retraced Percy's route to the sheds. He tried to imagine where two trucks loaded with orange pumpkins would hide and how they could have gotten there without an engine. And just as Thomas came down that bumpy hill in the opposite direction, a thought flew into his funnel. That's it, he whistled. If those pesky, troublesome trucks uncoupled themselves on a hill, they would roll back down really fast. I'll follow this track and see where it leads. Soon enough, Thomas found the old siding in the trees, and there were the trucks, still fast asleep. Thomas whistled to wake them. Time to get up, you two, he peeped. We're off to Anofa before you can cause any more mischief. Percy was relieved and happy when Thomas returned with the pumpkins. Sir Topham Hat was pleased that the festival could start right on time. You saved the day, Thomas, Percy said to his friend. Thank you for your help. The pumpkin carving contest was the best in years, and the winning design looked just like Thomas. Thomas has been a really useful engine, Sir Topham Hat said. The other engines peeped and whistled while everyone clapped. Thomas is our hero, the children cheered. And with that great big pumpkin head, he can be the hero of Halloween too, James said with a smile. Thomas the Tank Engine the Very First Stories by the Reverend W. Audrey with the classic original illustrations by C. Reginald Dalby. Thomas and Gordon. Thomas was a tank engine who lived at a big station. He had six small wheels, a short stumpy funnel, a short stumpy boiler, and a short stumpy dome. He was a fussy little engine, always pulling coaches about. He pulled them to the station ready for the big engines to take out on long journeys. And when trains came in and the people had got out, he would pull the empty coaches away so that the big engines could go and rest. He was a cheeky little engine too. He thought no engine worked as hard as he did, so he used to play tricks on them. He liked best of all to come quietly beside a big engine dozing on a siding and make him jump. Peep, 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 peep. Wake up, lazy bones, he would whistle. Why don't you work hard like me? Then he would laugh rudely and run away to find some more coaches. One day, Gordon was resting on a siding. He was very tired. The big express he always pulled had been late and he had had to run as fast as he could to make up for lost time. He was just going to sleep 
when Thomas came up in his cheeky way. Wake up, lazy bones, he whistled. Do some hard work for a change. You can't catch me. And he ran off laughing. Instead of going to sleep again, Gordon thought how he could get Thomas back. One morning, Thomas wouldn't wake up. His driver and fireman couldn't make him start. His fire went out and there was not enough steam. It was nearly time for the express. The people were waiting, but the coaches weren't ready. At last, Thomas started. Oh dear, oh dear, he yawned. Come on, said the coaches, hurry up. Thomas gave them a rude bump and started for the station. Don't dawdle, don't dawdle, he grumbled. Where have you been? Where have you been? asked the coaches crossly. Thomas fussed into the station where Gordon was waiting. Poop, 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 hurry up you, said Gordon crossly. Peep, pip, peep, hurry yourself, said Cheeky Thomas. Yes, said Gordon, I will. And almost before the coaches had stopped moving, Gordon came out of his siding and was coupled to the train. Poop, poop, he whistled. Get in quickly, please. So the people got in quickly. The signal went down. The clock struck the hour. The guard waved his green flag and Gordon was ready to start. Thomas usually pushed behind the big trains to help them start, but he was always uncoupled first so that when the train was running nicely, he could stop and go back. This time he was late and Gordon started so quickly that they forgot to uncouple Thomas. Boop, boop, said Gordon. Peep, 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 whistled Thomas. Come on, come on, puffed Gordon to the coaches. Pull harder, pull harder, puffed Thomas to Gordon. The heavy train slowly began to move out of the station. The train went faster and faster, too fast for Thomas. He wanted to stop, but he couldn't. Peep, peep, stop, stop, he whistled. Hurry, 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 laughed Gordon in front. You can't get away, you can't get away, laughed the coaches. Poor Thomas was going faster than he had ever gone before. He was out of breath and his wheels hurt him, but he had to go on. I shall never be the same again, he thought sadly. My wheels will be quite worn out. At last, they stopped at a station. Everyone laughed to see Thomas puffing and panting behind. They uncoupled him, put him on a turntable, and then he ran on a siding out of the way. Well, little Thomas, chuckled Gordon as he passed. Now you know what hard work means, don't you? Poor Thomas couldn't answer. He had no breath. He just puffed slowly away to rest and had a long, long drink. He went home very slowly and was careful afterwards never to be cheeky to Gordon again. Thomas's Train Thomas often grumbled because he was not allowed to pull passenger trains. The other engines laughed. You're too impatient, they said. You'd be sure to leave something behind. Rubbish, said Thomas crossly. You just wait. I'll show you. One night, he and Henry were alone. Henry was ill. The men worked hard, but he didn't get better. Now, Henry usually pulled the train in the morning, and Thomas had to get his coaches ready. If Henry is ill, he thought, Perhaps I shall pull his train. Thomas ran to find the coaches. Come along, come along, he fussed. There's plenty of time, there's plenty of time, grumbled the coaches. He took them to the platform and wanted to run round in front at once, but his driver wouldn't let him. 
Don't be impatient, Thomas, he said. So Thomas waited and waited. The people got in. The guard and station master walked up and down. The porters banged the doors. And still, Henry didn't come. Thomas got more and more excited every minute. Sir Topham Hat came out of his office to see what was the matter. And the guard and the station master told him about Henry. Find another engine, he ordered. There's only Thomas, they said. You'll have to do it then, Thomas. Be quick now. So Thomas ran round to the front and backed up to the coaches, ready to start. Don't be impatient, said his driver. Wait till everything is ready. But Thomas was too excited to listen to a word he said. What happened then? No one knows. Perhaps they forgot to couple Thomas to the train. Perhaps Thomas was too impatient to wait till they were ready. Or perhaps his driver pulled the lever by mistake. Anyhow, Thomas started. People shouted and waved at him, but he didn't stop. They're waving because I'm such a splendid engine, he thought importantly. Henry says it's hard to pull trains, but I think it's easy. Hurry, 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 he puffed, pretending to be like Gordon. As he passed the first signal box, he saw the men leaning out, waving and shouting. They're pleased to see me, he thought. They've never seen me pulling a train before. It's nice of them to wave. And he whistled, peep, peep, thank you, and hurried on. But he came to a signal, danger. Bother, he thought. I must stop, and I was going so nicely too. What a nuisance signals are. And he blew an angry, peep, peep, on his whistle. One of the signalmen ran up. Hello, Thomas, he said. What are you doing here? I'm pulling a train, said Thomas proudly. Can't you see? Where are your coaches then? Thomas looked back. Why, bless me, he said, if we haven't left them behind. Yes, said the signalman. You'd better go back quickly and fetch them. Poor Thomas was so sad he nearly cried. Cheer up, said his driver. Let's go back quickly and try again. At the station, all the passengers were talking at once. They were telling Sir Topham Hat, the station master, and the guard what a bad railway it was. But when Thomas came back and they saw how sad he was, they couldn't be cross, so they coupled him to the train, and this time he really pulled it. But for a long time afterwards, the other engines laughed at Thomas and said, Look, there's Thomas, who wanted to pull a train but forgot about the coaches. Thomas and the Freight Cars Thomas used to grumble in the shed at night. I'm tired of pushing coaches. I want to see the world. The others didn't take much notice, for Thomas was a little engine who talked big. But one night, Edward came to the shed. He was a kind little engine and felt sorry for Thomas. I've got some freight cars to take home tomorrow, he told him. If you take them instead, I'll push coaches in the yard. Thank you, said Thomas. That will be nice. So they asked their drivers the next morning, and when they said yes, Thomas ran happily to find the freight cars. Now, freight cars are silly and noisy. They talk a lot and don't attend to what they are doing. They don't listen to their engine, and when he stops, they bump into each other, screaming, Oh, 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 whatever is happening. 
And I'm sorry to say, they play tricks on an engine who is not used to them. Edward knew all about freight cars. He warned Thomas to be careful, but Thomas was too excited to listen. The switchman fastened the coupling, and when the signal dropped, Thomas was ready. The guard blew his whistle. Peep, peep, answered Thomas and started off. But the freight cars weren't ready. Oh, 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 they screamed as their couplings tightened. Wait, Thomas, wait. But Thomas wouldn't wait. Come on, come on, he puffed, and the freight cars grumbled slowly out of the siding onto the main line. Thomas was happy. Come along, come along, he puffed. All right, don't fuss. All right, don't fuss, grumbled the freight cars. They clattered through the stations and rumbled over bridges. Thomas whistled, peep, peep, and they rushed through the tunnel in which Henry had been shut up. Then they came to the top of the hill where Gordon had gotten stuck. Steady now, steady, warned the driver, and he shut off steam and began to put on the brakes. We're stopping, we're stopping, called Thomas. No, 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 answered the freight cars and bumped into each other. Go on, go on. And before his driver could stop them, they had pushed Thomas down the hill and were rattling and laughing behind him. Poor Thomas tried hard to stop them from making him go too fast. Stop pushing, stop pushing, he hissed, but the freight cars would not stop. Go on, go on, they giggled in their silly way. He was glad when they got to the bottom. Then he saw the place where they had to stop. Oh dear, what shall I do? They rattled through the station, and luckily the line was clear as they swerved into the freight yard. Ooh, ooh, er, groaned Thomas as his brakes held fast and he skidded along the rails. I must stop, and he shut his eyes tight. When he opened them, he saw he had stopped just in front of the buffers, and there watching him was Sir Topham Hat. What are you doing here, Thomas? He asked sternly. I've brought Edward's freight cars, Thomas answered. Why did you come so fast? I didn't mean to. I was pushed, said Thomas sadly. Haven't you pulled freight cars before? No. Then you've a lot to learn about freight cars, little Thomas. They are silly things and must be kept in their place. After pushing them about here for a few weeks, you'll know almost as much about them as Edward. Then you'll be a really useful engine. Thomas and the Breakdown Train Every day, Sir Topham Hatt came to the station to catch his train, and he always said, Hello to Thomas. There were lots of freight cars in the yard. Different ones came in every day, and Thomas had to push and pull them into their right places. He worked hard. He knew now that he wasn't so clever as he had thought. Besides, Sir Topham Hatt had been kind to him, and he wanted to learn all about freight cars so he could be a really useful engine. But on a siding by themselves were some freight cars that Thomas was told he mustn't touch. There was a small coach, some flatbed cars, and two strange things his driver called cranes. That's the breakdown train, he said. When there's an accident, the workmen get into the coach 
and the engine takes them quickly to help the hurt people and to clear and mend the line. The cranes are for lifting heavy things like engines and coaches and freight cars. One day, Thomas was in the yard when he heard an engine whistling, help, help, and a freight train came rushing through much too fast. The engine, a new one called James, was frightened. His brake blocks were on fire and smoke and sparks streamed out on each side. They're pushing me! They're pushing me! He panted. On, 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 on! Laughed the freight cars. Help! Help! Yelled poor James as he disappeared under a bridge. I'd like to teach those freight cars a lesson, said Thomas the Tank Engine. Presently, a bell rang in the signal box, and a man came running. James is off the line, the breakdown train, quickly, he shouted. So Thomas was coupled on. The workmen jumped into their coach, and off they went. Thomas worked his hardest. Hurry, 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 he puffed. And this time he wasn't pretending to be like Gordon. He really meant it. Bother those freight cars and their tricks, he thought. I hope poor James isn't hurt. They found James and the freight cars at a bend in the line. The brake van and the last few freight cars were on the rails. But the front ones were piled in a heap. James was in a field with a cow looking at him, and his driver and fireman were feeling him all over to see if he was hurt. Never mind James, they said. It wasn't your fault. It was those wooden brakes they gave you. We always said they were no good. Thomas pushed the breakdown train alongside. Then he pulled the unhurt freight cars out of the way. Oh dear, oh dear, they groaned. Serves you right, serves you right, puffed Thomas crossly. When the men put other freight cars on the line, he pulled them away too. He was hard at work, puffing backwards and forwards all the afternoon. This'll teach you a lesson, this'll teach you a lesson, he told the freight cars, and they answered, yes, it will, yes, it will, in a sad, groany, creaky sort of voice. They left the broken freight cars and mended the line. Then, with the two cranes, they put James back on the rails. He tried to move, but he couldn't. So Thomas helped him back to the shed. Sir Topham Hatt was waiting anxiously for them. Well, Thomas, he said kindly, I've heard all about it, and I'm very pleased with you. You're a really useful engine. James shall have some proper brakes and a new coat of paint, and you shall have a branch line all to yourself. Oh, sir, said Thomas happily. Now Thomas is as happy as can be. He has a branch line all to himself and puffs proudly backwards and forwards with two coaches all day. He is never lonely because there is always some engine to talk to at the junction. Edward and Henry stop quite often and tell him the news. Gordon is always in a hurry and does not stop, but he never forgets to say, poop, poop, to little Thomas, and Thomas always whistles, peep, peep, in return.